Welcome everybody to class six of our New Earth web series with author Eckhart Tolle. We're live again tonight, and one of the things that we both look forward to every week is the uh, energy that we feel from all of you out there who've signed on from your living room couches, from your kitchen tables, your home offices and dens and family rooms. I consider this to be a sacred moment when we can all come together and in community this way and share in this work. So wherever you are right now, I thank you. Eckhart Tolle thanks you for awakening with us. One of my other favorite books is a book that Eckhart Tolle had written, um, I don't know how many years ago. The oh, a few years ago. A few years ago. And it's a little book with wonderful passages in it. And it's called Stillness Speaks. It really speaks to, uh, just on a different level, what we've been talking about in New Earth. And I wanted to begin tonight's class uh, before we began our moments of silence here, reading from the beginning of Stillness Speaks by Eckhart Tolle. And it says, stillness is your essential nature. What is stillness? The inner space or awareness in which the words on this page are being perceived and become thoughts. Without that awareness, there would be no perception, no thoughts, no world. You are that awareness disguised as a person. I just love that, that you are the awareness. That's what we've been saying week after week here, is that you're not your thoughts, you are the awareness of your thoughts. Yes. Disguised as a person. Yes. yes. And you're not your sense perceptions, you are the awareness that makes all sense perception possible. You're not your emotions, you're the awareness that makes all these emotions possible. So that's the, and th that's the dimension where you are timeless. Everything mm -hmm. else is time. So when you lose touch with your inner stillness, you lose touch with yourself. When you lose touch with yourself, you lose yourself in the world. Your innermost sense of self of who you are is inseparable from stillness. This is the I am that is deeper than name and form. You are the awareness disguised as a person. Yes. So I think we should have our moments of silence leading into that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I suggest uh, to use again the, what I sometimes call the anchor of the inner body mm -hmm. so that we can put our attention into the inner body and fully inhabit the body, be mm -hmm. in the body and feel the aliveness that pervades the entire body and that's where our attention is and that is our anchor for stillness so let's do that now attention moves away from thinking into the aliveness of the inner body All right. All right. That is beautiful. So, everybody, tonight we're discussing Chapter 6, Breaking Free. Let's start with an overview of what this chapter is really about. In Chapter 5, as you all know, we met the pain body, and that's, uh, we all know what that is, that part of us that's addicted to negativity and unhappiness. And Eckhart says that the beginning of freedom from the pain body lies, first of all, in the realization that we all have a pain body. That was chapter five. We did that last week. Now in chapter six, we're going to explore what triggers the pain body in our everyday lives and whether it's a situation or certain things other people do or say. Eckhart shows us how that we can uh, actually use those triggers to enter a more heightened state of awareness and also this chapter is about breaking free of the pain body so you don't have to continually carry the past and everything that happened in the past and what people did to you, your story. Um, you can release that. Tonight is about breaking free. At the beginning of the chapter on page 162, you say that 
when you disidentify with the pain body, the energy that was trapped in the pain body, you say, then changes itself, its vibrational frequency, and is transmuted into presence. In this way, the pain body becomes fuel for consciousness. This is why many of the wisest, most enlightened men and women on our planet once had a heavy pain body, you say. So what I wanted to ask is that so many people today uh, medicate themselves. Mm -hmm. um, any uncomfortable feelings that you have, you go to a psychiatrist or counselor, remember, the first thing they do is prescribe medication for you. Does medication get in the way of um, using the pain body as fuel for enlightenment? Uh, to a large extent, it does. There may be certain extreme cases when medication is necessary. And for people who already are on medication, it's certainly not advisable to go off medication without the advice right. of a doctor. Right. So if you feel that it's time for you to get off, talk to a doctor who is relatively conscious and can help you gradually to uh, get off the medication. So it's really a question of... Uh, not giving in to this culturally conditioned behavior that says whenever you feel some discomfort inside yourself or emotional disturbance, immediately to seek some external help in the form of a substance that you ask your doctor to give you. Rather, learn to be with inner discomfort that arises, learn to be with emotional pain that arises, rather than wanting to eliminate it uh, learn to accept it. Acceptance is one of the main uh, focal points of this teaching. Teach, to learn to accept whatever emotion arises in you rather than run away from it or wanting to eliminate it. But why? This is the thing, Eckhart. Why would I want to accept it? That's why people are medicating themselves. Yes. That's why people eat, they gamble, they overwork themselves, they are, live in denial they become unconscious because yeah. they don't want to deal with the pain. That's what we're all trying to get away from, Yes, the pain. Yes, now if you medicate it, it doesn't actually go away. It dulls the pain so that you are not conscious of it anymore. It's still there in the background. It's the same thing for many illnesses. The, uh, for example, I had a heavy cold uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. I didn't take anything, but some people take things to, so that the symptoms are suppressed of the right. cold. It doesn't suppress the cold, it, the cold is still there. So why accept it? It's because it is here at this moment. So it's part of bringing this inner yes to whatever arises in the present moment. It is part of becoming friendly with the present moment even if on the surface the present moment doesn't look that great. Mm. So we are bringing, and this is where the awareness begins to come into the emotion. If we bring acceptance to whatever we feel at this moment, rather than not wanting to feel it, the equivalent of that would be an external situation that arises, and then I resist it because I don't want this situation to be as it is, but it already is. And then you just cause stress. When, and that's what you say in this book and also in The Power of Now. Wanting something to be different than it is is what causes stress. And creates further negative emotion. If there's some emotion in you that is not pleasant and then you don't want to be feeling what you feel, creates on top of the emotion that's already there another negative emotion that wants to deny what's there. So the best thing to do is to feel it, accept it, allow the feeling to do whatever it's going to do to you, make you feel sad or yes. angry or upset or whatever, and then choose to do something about that. Yes. Or, or first, not. Yes. Realize first that you are the awareness for that emotion. You are the space for it. You are the awareness disguised as a person. You are not the emotion. You are not the, the awareness. Emotion. Okay. Uh, so then already a shift has happened because if you completely identify with the emotion, then the emotion will very quickly rise into your mind and it will control your thinking. So... And you will think it's you. Yes. Yeah, you will think it's so you. So you will be identified with the emotion. Let's yeah. say it's anger that arises. Yes. A slight trigger triggers enormous anger. And immediately you start to think angry thoughts. Correct. Or if it's sadness or depression, you immediately start to think thoughts that reflect the emotion. 
And the pain body loves that because the pain body will feed on the energy of your thinking. That's right. And once you're trapped in the vicious circle between emotion and emotional thinking, when all the self-talk in your head, that is everybody experiences most of the time, the self-talk in the head then becomes the voice of the pain body that mm -hmm. is talking in your head. And then all your interpretations of other people, of events, will be totally distorted and very negative. Because you say at the bottom of page 162, when you realize that pain bodies unconsciously seek more pain, that is to say, they want something bad to happen, you will understand that many traffic accidents are caused by drivers whose pain bodies are active at the time. <clears throat> when two drivers with active pain bodies arrive at an intersection at the same time, the likelihood of an accident is many times greater than under normal circumstances. So is it always the pain body that attracts accidents and other bad things? No, no. no. That's no. just one factor that is often there, but there are many other factors that could attract an accident. Uh, many people are not, not fully present when they drive. Uh, I remember there was a sad story some years ago of a famous actor who got thrown off his horse mm -hmm. uh, and then had a spinal injury. I forgot right, Christopher name. Reeve. Yes, and he passed away, I think, mm. a couple of years ago. And I remember seeing the interview with him when he talked about that incident. He loved riding, and so he was horse riding. And he said, for one moment, he, he, lost, he lost the present moment while he was riding his horse. And at that moment, he got thrown off the horse. Wow. And he said that was the one moment of unawareness, and it happened. But then he actually grew tremendously inside after the accident because he brought complete acceptance mm -hmm. to what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And so there was an enormous awakening that happened in him before he passed away. Even though he was paralyzed? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Well, Dave is Skyping us from his home office in Madison, Wisconsin. Dave, thank you for joining us. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Ecker. Hi, hello. Your question is? Um, first off, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to both of you. You are welcome, welcome, uh -huh. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, when my wife and I have a disagreement, um, she comes back hours or days later um, wanting to rehash that disagreement, and um, she always feels there has to be a wrong or a right to it. Um, how can I get her to live in the present and get the ego out of the way. Were you watching last week when he told the story of the two monks? Yep. You know, and yep. the monk said to the other monk, you're still carrying that girl. I put her down hours ago. Was I your want us to become you... the two ducks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to become the two ducks. Okay, good. Now, uh, you need to see what is your role when you have disagreements at home. Uh, I assume that your wife has a pain body that becomes active at that time. And when you have disagreements, uh, is your pain body also a contributing factor at home? Or do you feel that it is just your wife's pain body? How, in other words, do, how do you feed into... The, how, well, what is your part in the disagreement and in the energy field there? Yeah, how are you playing into the drama of it, Dave? I, I don't play into the drama of it, and that seems to initially increase it more on her behalf. <laughs> and then, but lately, after going through the book, um, I find that I look for a, a single thing, um, her eyes are beautiful, and I just think of those, and I take to a different place inside myself. And it seems that it kind of, it just diminishes on her behalf then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when you disagree or you have an argument, uh, that means to some extent uh, you must be identified with a mental position. And because if you don't have a mental position that you identify with, there is no argument. Correct. Uh, so That's why I said, hmm, today. This, yes, so yes. this is why Oprah was a little bit... Uh, Skeptical. Skeptical, yes. When you were talking. So it's perhaps uh, before we talk about your wife, maybe there's something that you can do so that you let go of identification with mental positions when you discuss things.
You can still discuss the practicality of certain things that you need to talk about, but don't become identified with a mental position of rightness that makes you right. And because that is what the ego thrives on, and that is what feeds the pain body. Whenever you it, it, identify with anything, it be, it's the ego. Yes, That's whatever what you identify with becomes ego. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps bring more vigilance into, especially sit, when you see a situation is developing that is going, going to become an argument. Or you can see that the, the pain body in your wife is becoming active again. And then it's a, it's a time of being particularly alert and vigilant inside yourself so that you do not get drawn into opposing her in any way. And even, Dave, uh, you know, the reason why I said, hmm, and was skeptical because of what Eckhart just said, if I may reiterate, if you are, if there's no drama at, involved at all with you, if you just become peace, then the argument has to dissolve. Like the woman, the story that he tells in the book of the woman who came and was so upset and carrying all the papers and the bills and so forth. And as he sat there just listening, taking it in, she finally said, this doesn't really matter, does it? And left and went home. You remember that? Yeah. From a couple classes ago. And I understand what you're talking about because often um, when you start reading this material and you start, you know, to awaken yourself, we become a little self-righteous about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Perhaps maybe there's a little bit of that still remaining with you where you want to say, I am so, because I know this happened with Stedman and myself. We're in a, in a discussion, and I'm feeling, well, I am very awakened. I'm a very evolved person. So what you're saying is, is not going to upset me, but that attitude, the energy of that, my ego and my self-righteousness is what con <clears throat> contributed to the drama. You see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your, your need to be right or your need to feel yeah. like, you know, I'm a little bit more superior because I'm not engaging in this and you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's then uh, alertness and vigilance is very important on your part. I think what you just said here is so important for every one of us who's, uh, who's trying to continue to wake into this process that whenever there's an argument or disagreement, the thing is, is to not, to, and, and it's a, not to ever make it about the other person, even though it seems to be. Mm -hmm. The question is not, what can I do for my wife, for my partner, for my boss, mm -hmm. for my coworker, mm -hmm. but it is, what can I do in the situation? Yes. Right. That's, that's, that's all. What is my contribution to it? That's right. That's yeah. primary. And then uh, your wife, I don't know whether she uh, has any interest in, uh, spiritual teaching or the pain body? Have you ever mentioned to her the pain body? Not while there's a pain body attack happening, but when the pain because body you is... you said nobody hears you when you no, say No, because it, when you, you cannot talk to the pain body about the pain body. Yeah. Uh, the, the, that was actually dangerous because the pain body will throw something at you. <laughs> 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 so the... Um, is Hello, your... You does your wife... <laughs> uh, what? I love it when you get tickled. Go ahead. I know pain bodies. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> so the, is, is your wife sometimes relatively more open to this than at other times? Or is she always not open to this in your view? She's not open to it to this point. Um, but it, it, when I was running off the sheets uh, for this week's class, she picked him up out of the printer and she read him over and she said, hmm, you're talking about me. <laughs> so maybe that opens the book. Yes, yes, yes. It opens the door. Dave, thanks so much for your question. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, many acts of violence, you say on page 163, are committed by normal people who temporarily turn into maniacs. Does this mean that you think people are not responsible for what they do when possessed by the pain body? No, that's what I say. They are not responsible. As we mentioned last time, Jesus on the cross, when he said, they know not what they do, mm -hmm. meaning they are so unconscious, they are in the grip of an energy field mm -hmm. at which they cannot control. They don't even know that they are in the grip of this energy field because it has taken complete possession of them. So in that sense, I say they are not responsible, which does not mean 
that they do not suffer the consequences of their actions. Mm -hmm. So it almost looks like a little bit of a paradox. Yes, no, they are not responsible. Nevertheless, karmically, they will suffer the consequences of their unconsciousness because uh -huh. human beings are... Our purpose is to evolve into conscious beings. So if we are not evolving into conscious beings, then we suffer. Right. The less... Clo the more closed we are to this evolutionary impulse of evolving into conscious being, of fl the flowering of consciousness, right. the more closed we are to this, the more we suffer. And so these people who inflict violence on others, who make others suffer, also make themselves suffer. And they suffer the consequences karmically, and sometimes the karmic consequences come in the form of the legal system. So they... The pol That's right. They are put away, and so that represents for them at that time karma. And then there's always the possibility when they are in deep suffering because of something that they did in a state of complete unconsciousness, when they then are in deep suffering, perhaps in prison, whatever they may be, there's always the possibility then of awakening through the suffering that they inflicted on themselves, on others right. also. Because you say on page 164, when you can't stand the endless cycle of suffering anymore, you begin to awaken. So the pain body too has its necessary place yes. in the larger picture. But yes. There are a lot of people who never awaken. They just, you know, the pain body just, they die with it. Yes, that is true. Uh, then... The, there's always a chance that the unawakened consciousness awakens in some other form, in some uh -huh. other situation. So, but the entire universe is going in that direction of awakening. awakening. So it is, the more we are open to this... Because and we have to, are we, we going to die? To, yes, as the human species now, uh, the, the impulse, the awakening impulse has been there for a million years longer. But for us now, we have arrived at this critical point where humanity, if humanity does not embrace this new state of consciousness, the awakened state, then humanity is not going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, on a cosmic scale, even that doesn't matter. And whatever gain there has been achieved in the awakening of consciousness on this planet is not going to be lost. There's only one consciousness throughout the entire universe, and that one consciousness is awakening in millions and billions of lives. And so if we don't survive as a human species? That's not the greatest strategy either. In Relatively speaking, it is tragic, but in absolute terms, that's fine too. Yeah, and it's really, it's our decision. Yes, yes. The, uh, the fact that we are here at this very moment engaged in this work this is a very good yeah. sign it's a sign it, it, because here at least we know that at right now here the awakening is happening yeah for the hundreds of thousands of people who are joining us around the world yes danielle who's joining us now from ireland and skyping us from dublin hi danielle hi oprah hi Akash. hi what time is it in dublin right now um i think it's about half two in the morning okay <laughs> well you're Definitely. you're up late thank you for joining us no, 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 I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. And um, my question is about ego, and I'm just going to read it out. Um, I've been practicing trying to stay in the present moment for over th three years now, but I've come to some sort of block because my ego keeps on telling me, if you get rid of your ego, you will lose the world as you know it. You will lose your relationships with the friends you've built, built up for years, and you want to give up your career you've worked so hard for, and you'll be isolated from the rest of society because they are all living in ego. How can I overcome this? Thank you. Excellent Good. question. <laughs> now, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, these are thoughts that uh, arise in your mind. Uh, these thoughts that arise in your mind are telling you something. Now, uh, what these thoughts are saying may be very far from the truth. What the thoughts that if you awaken, if you become really present, you're going to lose your friends. Mm -hmm. Life is not going to be fun anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to see, is that the truth or are these just thoughts that my egoic mind is producing in order to stop me from being present? Do I believe in those thoughts or do I believe in 
first-hand evidence that I have, because if you've been practicing being present, then you realize it's actually quite joyful to be fully open to the present moment. It doesn't take away from the fun of being alive. It actually makes you more intensely alive when you are fully present in the now, rather than always looking to some next moment that's going to be better than this one. This is how most of the world lives. So you, I'm sure you've already had glimpses, or more than glimpses, of how the quality of your life actually becomes enhanced through being fully present to life now, because life is now. So, and your mind is, is please, a question? Oh, no, I definitely have, um, but I think it's just the ego keeps on sweeping in or else you'll be in a situation where your friends expect you to act the same way that you've always acted, like in ego. Like your, your friendship, a lot of friendships are kind of, uh, are bound through ego. Yes. And, you know, it's your personality and, you know, you'll try and be in the present moment and then they'll be like, come on, come on, you know, let's go and do something, you know, which is obviously trying to escape from the present moment. But isn't it true, Danielle, when you become to awaken, um, when you come to the state where you feel more alive and awakened and willing to be more present with yourself, that that means you might have to let go of some of the things that used to bring you uh, a false sense of happiness. That maybe the same people you used to hang around with and do things with who are not, you know, ready to follow your path or not willing to be a part of some of the things that you now recognize that matter, mm-hmm. maybe it means letting some of those friends go. That's, that's the whole point. Maybe just a comment on yes. this. Um, uh, usually what happens when people become more present, uh, some of their friends are actually drawn into that also it, because it, whatever state you're in will affect the people around you right. or your back. <laughs> Uh, so usually it happens that some of your friends will actually join you and also grow in presence and awaken, and others may drop away who are not ready yet. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. That is usually the case. So, the, um, and the, your career does actually can only improve because the quality of anything that you do in full presence is so much greater and right. there's so much power available to you that is not there when you're always looking to some when other... you're scattered. You, yes. When you're scattered. You remember a couple of weeks ago I quoted the Zen master who was observing competitors at an archery competition, and the Zen master was observing one competitor, and he said uh, his need to win drains him of power. Power. And, of course, this need to win, which m- most people in the old consciousness have, is the need to arrive at some future point and it takes energy away from what you're doing now, and that drains you of power. So whatever you do becomes actually more powerful when you're present rather than... So it can... I remember when I first started uh, doing this talk show 22 years ago, uh, I used to get asked a lot of questions about other talk shows and other people, and I always used to say, we're running our own race here, and the energy that it takes to look back and see where the other guy is in the race... And there have been a lot of guys uh, and female guys and, and, and guys uh, with shows who were in competition. I go, the energy that it takes to look at what somebody else is doing takes energy away from what you're doing. Yes. I mean, if you're, if you're on track, I used to run track, and if you just take the moment to look back and see where the other guy is, that energy is so draining yes. and causes you to lose your own footing. Yes. And lo- lose your own concentration and focus. Yes. So that's what you're saying. Yes. And that's also put the, this, in, uh, this sense that you're competing against others is part of the ego energy. That's right. And that also takes power away. That's right. Instead of just run the race. Yes. Run your own race. Yes. Now, what's the best way for us to sense the pain body? It's very... E- Thank you so much, Danielle, joining us from I Dublin. The technical problem. Thanks. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. Thank you. Um, it's very easy for all of us to spot the pain body in other people. And I've yes. actually heard the word come up many times this week. Ooh, that was his pain body. <laughs> that was his pain body. So uh, thanks for introducing it to our culture. Um, so it's easy to see it in other people. What's the best way, number one, to spot it in yourself? And how do you stop ourselves from acting out when we're in its grip? Are there simple you know, exercises mm. or something yeah. we can do to break the grip when you 
feel yourself go in there? Yes. So the important thing is to catch it as it first arises in the first, because before it takes over your mind, mm -hmm. when it's there as an emotion. And usually it's the pain body when the emotional reaction is out of proportion to the triggering event. So a relatively minor thing triggers an enormous amount of unhappiness in yeah. whatever form. That's right. A small thing happens and you flare up. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so then, uh, and after a while, you realize the kind of situation that triggers your pain body. And then you can be actually more vigilant when such a situation happens. So, and you can see a uh, very important thing is to be able to, to have some attention inside your body that is connected with the exercise we did at the beginning today. Mm -hmm. uh, which is bringing consciousness into the body. Because if you're able to bring consciousness into the body, you can more easily feel an arising emotion inside you, whether it's uh, a, deep, a very heavy emotion of sad, deep sadness, or whether it's a, a fiery emotion of anger, or whatever it is, or the emotion of intense fear, that contraction, the, then you can, there's so many people these days who are completely out of touch with their emotions because they li live only in the, in the head. head. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, like it's, uh, so being able to feel an emotion as it arises and then recognizing it as the beginning of the pain body, my pain body. Mm -hmm. And as long as you know this is the pain body, you are not identified with it because the knowing is the awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you, if you can catch it early on, and then it may still grow, you should, suddenly the, the fear, fear may become very intense, or the anger, or whatever form the pain body takes, but you will be there as the awareness in the background while it happens. And one thing that then doesn't happen is that the pain body cannot control your thinking because you're shining the light of consciousness on it. It cannot then creep into your mind and suddenly make your mind think, what it wants to think. Mm -hmm. So remain there as the awareness for it and say, oh, there's the pain body. Then it cannot renew itself and it also cannot control your behavior, your actions. All it is that you have contained it, not through holding it down, but you have contained it there through your presence. Okay. And then it can't renew itself through in that situation. So it suddenly it comes up but it cannot renew itself, and then it will subside again. Um, no, but the pain body being very clever, it will then wait for a more suitable opportunity when you are less conscious than at that moment, and then it will come It will try again. again. And for example... So it's like you're always being tested. Yes. The yeah. pain body is like a little, little wild animal or something. It's always it's there in the background saying, okay, what situation, can I, am I going to come out now, or is it... The situation is not, not right. He's too conscious. Is the pain body also your ego, Eckhart? The, the pain body is an as the emotional aspect of ego. Mm -hmm. So but when you identify with the pain body, it becomes part of the ego because okay. whatever you identify with becomes part of the ego. When you don't identify with it, it's no longer a part of the ego. All right, because what you identify with is the ego. Yes. I like this question from Lorraine from Vancouver, British Columbia who writes, I attract negativity. It seems that my whole world is one big fight. I just want people to stop instigating fights with me. I don't deliberately go out and begin uh, conflict, but it comes to me. I hate it. I just want peace. What's the problem? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Isn't that interesting? Yes. 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 No, this is uh, whatever you experience uh, repeatedly and frequently externally is a reflection of your inner state. Hmm. So you attract certain things into your life that reflect your state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So for uh, Lorraine, it's, it's very important to become much more aware of whatever state she is in at any given moment. Become more aware of what emotion she is feeling at any given moment. Because Lorraine could not be attracting fights and That's, conflict yeah. unless she was emanating that energy. Y yes. And you say on 162, every human being emanates an energy field that corresponds to his or her inner state. Most people can sense it, although they may feel someone else's energy emanation only subliminally. That is to say, they don't know that they sense it, yet it determines to a large extent how they feel about and react to that person. Yes. Yeah. And so there are two aspects to the 
your inner state, there's the emotional aspect to your inner state, what is the energy of the emotion that you feel, and there's the mental aspect, what kinds of thoughts are you, is your mind producing at this moment? Is your mind producing negative thoughts? What, what kind of thoughts? So you need to be there as the awareness, become aware of what, what it is that I feel right now? What is my state at this moment? That's a good question to ask yourself. What's my inner state at this moment? At the moment that somebody uh, instigates a fight with her? <clears throat> no. No. Normal moments when you're not being challenged. Okay. Because all these accumulate, your normal state of consciousness eventually produces some external event. Mm -hmm. So at any, as much as possible in any, in any situation, it's always more important what your inner state of conscience is than the external situation. Got it. Uh, the external situation is always secondary. Uh, so what's, what am I feeling now and what am I thinking now? These are the important questions. So become an alertness then arises. And you become suddenly realize what's my mind saying? Mm -hmm. what's, what's most of the day? What kind of thoughts is my mind producing? How many negative thoughts do I have every hour, every minute? You become aware particularly of, because the ego loves negative thinking. And so what that, those, you, what you're saying then, it would be impossible for Lorraine to be a peaceful person, to say, she says here, I just want peace, what's the problem? It would be impossible to just be a peaceful person, minding your own business, having peaceful, loving thoughts, and people want to pick a fight with you all the time. Yes, that's not, would not be possible. So it's... Uh, there's something in her that she needs to become aware of. Mm -hmm. And that's not her true self. It's a form of conditioning. Her right. true self is the awareness, which is already perfect. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with who mm -hmm. she is in her essence. So <coughs> look, be vigilant as much as possible. Have maybe put little, little signs at home, little... little uh, um, remind us so that you remember to be conscious of what's going on inside me. Yeah. What's going on inside me? Very important question. What's going on inside me? What thoughts is my mind thinking? Yes. What is it that I'm feeling right now? I wanted to go back to page 162 again, uh, where you say every human being emanates an energy field that corresponds to his or her inner state. And most people can sense it, although they may feel somebody else's energy emanation only subliminally. That is to say, they don't know that they sense it, yet it determines to a large extent how they feel about and react to that person. I had an encounter with somebody recently where their energy thing was so strong, I walked into the room and felt it so strong, I had to remove myself from the room. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, some people are most clearly aware of it when they first meet someone even before any words are exchanged. That's what had happened there. A little later, however, I love this part. A little later, however, words take over the relationship and with words come the roles that most people play. Attention then moves to the realm of mind and the ability to sense the other person's energy field becomes greatly diminished. Yes. Nevertheless, it is still felt on an unconscious level. And that's why Kids can sense it. Little kids can sense it because they don't have the words or the language. Yes. Isn't that true? Yes. And animals can sense it. And too. animals can sense it too. Yes. Very acutely because they, they don't have the conceptual mental realm. So they can feel much more, more acutely a, a human energy field. That's right. And after they're introduced to you, your title means nothing to them. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so your title or your position or your label. The role that you're playing means no. nothing to them. No. So once they sniff you and they don't like you, <laughs> they don't like you. We have uh, Mubina on the phone from uh, Dubai. Hi, Mubina. We hear you have a question Hi, about... Hi, Oprah. Hi. Good morning. Hello. I hear Dubai is so great. It's beautiful. Please come visit. Yeah, I think I might be coming. And yeah, I am. Have a, you have a oh, question great. about relationships? Go ahead. Yes. Um, my question is about the nature of love. Eckhart says that uh, love has no wanting and that true love really is about not expecting anything in return. Um, my, my question is related to a little personal dilemma. Um, I met somebody five years ago and I really, really like him, but I noticed that he has um, a dense pain body. My question is, should I 
continue to be present for this person. I have been doing so for five years, uh, giving him my present time and um, really being there for him. And um, is it worth waiting? Because I really do want to get married and I would have a family someday. Is it worth waiting for someone, um, you know, with a dense pain body, but I still feel I want to be present for this person. Mm. And I know Eckhart says that we shouldn't go around changing people. Well, you're not going to change him, first of all. Right. Okay. Are you hoping that you're going to change him? Um, I'm hoping that he's going to let go of his past at some point and, and realize that I'm the one for him. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think you need a little more awakening. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but I'll let Eckhart answer. Go ahead. Uh, so you f do you feel that you love that person? Yes, very dearly. Um, well, what, let's see what it means to love someone. What, um, when, you, when you truly love another human being, uh, there's something that you recognize in them that has nothing to do with the form of that person. There is the recognition of the essence of that person and your own essence, your own being, your own consciousness recognizes that in the other. And that essence is the divine in each human being. So when you love another person, you really love God in the other person. Mm. You don't love the person. If you love the person, it's the ego, because then you love the form. And if you love the person and not the formless within the person, the, the, the divine, when, if you don't love God in the other person, then the lo love is of the ego. And the ego love is very different from true love. The ego love is mm -hmm. needy, and the ego love says, you love me back, and if you don't, uh, I'm going to get very angry. So, or upset okay. with you or, or impatient with you <clears throat> because you haven't loved me the way I wish to be loved. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, there, there's no need to deny what you feel for this person. It's actually... Yes, it, and I've, yes, I've never really expected anything back from him, but what I hear from friends is always, what are you waiting for? And, you know, he's not giving you anything back, so what are you waiting for? No, the, and the, I'm, I can, I don't mind waiting another five years. It's just that I've just been, you know, getting bombarded with questions from friends who just think, you know, go out with other people. No, the, the love in you actually is fine. The love that you feel does not need anything. But you as a person, yes. you as a person may have certain needs and preferences in this situation. I don't believe that she's making this phone call for her friends, personally. No. I believe that you are making this phone call for yourself, Ms. Mubina, and that it's not Absolutely, your... Absolutely, I am. Yeah, that it's not your friends who are saying, why doesn't he do something? I think, you know, what you expressed to us at the beginning of this phone call is that you think it's been five years and it's time that he should do something. But he has a pretty heavy sure. pain body, right? Okay, so you, sure. want, yep. you want him to make a move, and you want that move to be marriage? Um, well, it could lead to that, sure. I mean, I'm, I, I'm in no hurry. What do you want? Um, but I'm just... What do you want? Well, I want, I want him to realize that he, um, I don't know, that I, I, I just, I just love him. That's all. Mm, no. You know, and I, I just, I just want him to see that. And I think he, he's just, um being blocked or not buying that pain body is so dense no i think and what I you said to us earlier is what you really want you said i want him to realize that i'm the one for him sure definitely okay. i'm not gonna lie about that okay yes. yeah yes. you already said it go ahead yes so what do you want to say about that eckhart well it may be time for you to talk to him and say i love you and what i feel for you is not going to change but i have certain uh, needs and preferences i would like to I would like you to decide and make a commitment whether or not you want to be with me. Right. Okay. Old. Old. <laughs> Old, <laughs> Okay. And, and then he uh, says, no, well, I'm not ready for that. No, if he says, I'm not ready, and you get angry or extremely upset, then it, wa it was ego love. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. If, if he says, I mean, he, said, he said that to me a lot of times before that he's not ready. Nice, it's fine. It's okay. okay. Did and you hear what Eckhart just myself. said? Hello, Mabina. Did you hear? Yes. If you get upset, then that's ego love. Ego, yes. Okay. And if yes. you don't get upset and you're patient and you're, as you said, you can wait five more years or yep. however it chooses to be, then perhaps maybe it is the real thing. Yes. Unless you're, okay. you're just waiting for him to make the move and discover that you're the one. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, um, yeah, that's that's what I've been doing, and I just wanted to confirm that. So that's fine. That's confirmed. That's great. The extent to which you can love another human being depends on the extent to which you are conne connected with your own essence, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you can recognize. Sometimes it's easier to recognize God in one particular form, for, uh, but. You can recognize God in another human being. So the love is in you, and when you, the love does not come from the outside. The love is the recognition of oneness, that ultimately you and the other share the one consciousness. That's what all, all connects and makes all humans one. And what you say in the book, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing now, because this was, I think, last week that you really addressed this in, in the pain body, is that many times people. Uh, mistake what they believe to be love for their own neediness yes. and their their ego identification with you know this person validates me or yes 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 yeah yes so true especially love is... in our society in, in the American society where it's all about romance yes yes that's encouraged by the culture <laughs> yes on what you see in films the role-playing associated right. with that uh, so uh, it's really damaged us a lot hasn't it yes Yes, mm -hmm. but uh, we are waking up out of that. Mm -hmm. um, n not, there are not so many films now that end in the happy marriage or something like that because it's people are beginning to recognize that's not how that it is. That it's not happily ever after. No, no. Thank you, Mubina. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Last week, uh, we uh, aired an interview on the Oprah show with Thomas, who was a transgendered man. Mm -hmm. you heard about this man who became pregnant? No. Okay, transgendered man who was pregnant and his wife, Nancy. We also spoke to Thomas and Nancy's neighbors, George and Victoria, uh, who gave us their reaction. And I found out during a commercial break that George and Victoria are students of a new earth. And here's a clip of our conversation after the Oprah show went off the air. Mm -hmm. They just told me after, uh, during commercial break, that you're reading A New Earth. Are you taking the class? Absolutely. <laughs> I love it, Oprah. It's, it's been fantastic. I actually read the book first. Yeah. And I couldn't put it down. I had to read the whole book because uh -huh. I said to George, oh, at last, I'm so excited. This book is really captivating, you know. So then um, I encouraged George to, to take the class with me. So we've been watching it together and um, studying together. And that's what's helped us be um, more understanding and open-minded, non-judgmental. As Eckhart says, no labels, um, trying to get judgment out of our heads and stay in the moment and just really embrace our devoted neighbors as the human beings that are, are with us sharing this earth. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we moved the bend and right across right. the street from us We've uh, encountered Nancy and, uh, and Thomas and, and this situation yeah. because I think, in a way, there's a design to this and it was an opportunity for us to grow. And this is why we're kind of honored, really, to share this experience because yeah. it's really helped us become, you know, more enlightened people. It's, it's, it's given us the opportunity to actually manifest what, what the, um, uh, the seminars are, are, are all about. So that's Victoria and George join us now from Skype from their home office in Bend, Oregon. Uh, since uh, Nancy and Tom were on the show, did, has your, have all the press been in your neighborhood looking for them or looking for you? Yes, they were. Um, oddly enough, they kind of dissipated uh, after, uh, after your show, and uh, it's been relatively peaceful now. Oh, good. Well, I remember yeah. you, you had a question for Eckhart, and I said I, I was going to let you ask that question yourself that was related to the suffering of Christ, 
On page 144, Eckhart writes, Why is the suffering body of Christ, his face distorted in <coughs> agony, and his body bleeding from countless wounds, such a significant image in the collective consciousness of humanity? Millions of people, particularly in medieval times, would not have related to it as deeply as they did if something within themselves had not resonated with it, if they had not unconsciously recognized it as an outer representation of their own inner reality, the pain body. They were not yet conscious enough to recognize it directly within themselves, but it was the beginning of their becoming aware of it. Christ can be seen as the archetypal, archetypical um, human embodying both the pain and the possibility of transcendence. Mm -hmm. And you had a question regarding some of this. Go ahead, George. Yes, thank you, Oprah, for having us on the show. Um, Eckhart, you mention uh, the Christian doctrine a lot in your book, and this is a question to help me reconcile Christian doctrine with your teachings. If it's true that the ego loves suffering, as you mentioned in your book, and if it's true, as the New Testament says, that God sent his only begotten son to suffer and die for humanity's sins, was the passion of Christ an ego trip? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, I would not say that the ego loves suffering, the pain body loves suffering. The ego is actually very often tries very hard uh, to avoid suffering, it, the ego produces suffering inevitably sooner or later because the way it goes about its business is dysfunctional. The ego is a very limited view of who you are. And if you act from such a limited view of who you are, you cannot see where you fit into the totality of other human beings and your environment, then eventually your actions will produce suffering. So the ego produces suffering, although it wants something else. Uh, this is why we have the proverb, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The mm -hmm. ego wants the best for you, but it produces the, often the worst. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would not say that the uh, suffering of Christ is an ego trip. It's not that. I'd like to share with you something. I had an insight some years ago. Um, I was walking uh, in England into a village church. It was all very quiet. Uh, I was the only person in that 600-year-old church. And I saw the cross, the altar, and uh, Jesus on the cross. And this is an image that we are so used to, but we don't question it. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, I saw it as if I had just arrived on this planet and had never seen it before. And I was struck by the strangeness of that symbol. And I looked, there's a suffering human being in agony on this cross. And at the same time, there was another cross without uh, Jesus on it. And I saw this golden cross was the same cross. That cross that is the torture instrument is at the same time a symbol for the divine. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I saw a very deep significance in that, that can be appreciated and recognized, I believe, by anybody, even if they are not Christians. Jesus on the cross stands for humanity. Jesus represents every human being that has ever lived or will ever live. Jesus represents something that is part of the human condition and this, what he experienced at that moment, I saw in the, when I was looking at the cross in the church, I saw that what this represents is a human being who experiences an extreme form of uh, limitation. He's totally unfree, totally limited, in deep suffering, and at the same time, the words I suddenly remembered from what is said on the cross, not my will, but thy will be done. And that was the act of complete acceptance of suffering. Mm. He went to the depths of suffering and then totally accepted suffering. And through this total acceptance of suffering, a sudden transmutation happened and the very torture instrument 
the cross that had produced the suffering was transformed and became a symbol for the divine. And that explained the paradox that I had seen when I went into that church as if I'd never been to a church before. And I saw how can the torture instrument at the same time be a symbol of the divine. <laughs> and so in every human being's life, every human being in, will experience some form of uh, suffering, sometimes very intense. Sometimes some every human being, as you said last week, will have their own cross, cross to bear. Yes. Will have their every own human cross being has their own cross to bear, and every human being needs to learn the lesson that is there when we look at Jesus on the cross. He has to come to the point where he, the human being, instead, instead of wanting to avoid suffering, says, This is what is, and bring a complete yes to whatever is at this moment. Not as Complete, I will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. Complete alignment, and that I call conscious suffering, where suddenly the inner resistance is not there anymore. And when you go into conscious suffering and say, I'm, this is fine, I say yes to, to this. Even the most unacceptable situation, if there's nothing I can do about it, I bring a yes to it. Not as I will, thy will be done. Yes. And at so, that moment, the ego dies. And in that moment, the divine comes through. Mm. And the very thing that was the worst thing that could ever happen to you, when you bring surrender to it, becomes an opening into the divine. And that's the, that's the miracle and the transformative value of the cross. Boy, I think that's powerful, George and Victoria, don't you? The moment I got that, I just got that. I had a big old epiphany. Yeah. The very wow. moment, the worst thing that can happen to you, if you surrender to it, there is an opening that allows the energy of the divine to come through. Yes. At the moment of surrender. Yes. And, and that is the grace. I that... got that, George. Didn't you get that? Yes, I did. Thank yeah. you. So, so it was a lesson for us, in other words. It's a lesson. Yes. Yeah. Behind every form of suffering, there's grace hiding, concealed. It does not reveal itself until, until you s surrender, until you suffer consciously, until you no longer deny what is. So there's the grace that's hiding behind every form of suffering. Wow. So if, if, um, if the ego doesn't love suffering but produces suffering, what is that voice in our head that you refer to in the book the voice that denigrates our self-esteem that says you weren't any good, you were never any good, you're never going to be any good. That's also what in the uh, the Bible also is described as the voice of Satan. Is is the ego in that sense a force of evil in us? You know, you have the good and, and the bad, the duality. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. yes. Ego, I would define as compl compl ego is complete identification with form, mm -hmm. total identification with form, the form of me as this body, the psychological form of me, total identification with every thought that arises. So you're, you cannot step out, you're trapped in form completely, and that is evil. So going beyond form, Beyond identification with form is when the other dimension opens. Yeah, up. and didn't in some cultures in the past, I saw this on Guy Ritchie's documentary on the ego, that yes. uh, they used to refer to the ego as Satan. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. yes. In That's some cultures, right. yes. it was referred to as Satan. Yes. Thank you, George and Victoria. Victoria, you're still enjoying the book, or you, you're done now, right? Have you done? Oh, re I, finished, you're, you're... I finished the book, um, Oprah. Um, I actually have a quick question, if it's possible. Go ahead. Um, I was curious because, um, you know, uh, you spoke of children um, and the trauma that young children um, experience when their parents are fighting. Yeah. Well, uh, Eckhart, do you think that it's possible that um, a pregnant mother passes her pain body onto her unborn child and, and perhaps even generations that has happened uh, with the grandmother, uh, great-grandmother? passing that on to their own unborn baby. So we end up with this big old backpack of uh, somebody else's um, pain body. And, and can we uh, free ourselves from that as simply as being aware, like you said? Mm -hmm. Great questions, guys. Yes, Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right. The pain body 
is passed on from generation to generation. And certainly whatever a mother experiences in pregnancy affects already the child that is inside her. Whatever emotions she experiences they will affect and leave remnants in the child. And I believe that, uh, although no scientists have discovered it yet, I believe that even in the human DNA, there's already programming that is the pain body. Oh. And so we inherit it. It's only partly personal. In other words, partly, partly it, arise, it arises as a result of things that happened to us in childhood and so on. But it goes far, back much further than that. It's old. It's very old. And, uh, and as you know, I mentioned in the book, Another aspect of the pain body is it's also it's collective. There is the co there, you also inherit the pain body of your, sometimes of your entire nation mm -hmm. is part of your this pain This is what body. we were talking about last week, the pain body of, you know, slavery in this country that so many people are in denial about, yes. the pain body of what's happened to the Native Americans in this yes. country. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, so what you said is absolutely true. So the mother will often already pass on her pain body to the unborn child. So isn't that harder to get yourself free? We're going to talk about, before this class is over tonight, breaking free of the pain body. But yes. if you inherited it, if it's like genetically DNA encoded, isn't that harder to get rid of? Well, that's how it is. But it's, it comes from the past. It is the living past in you. The living past in Now, you. the past has no power against the present. present. Moment. Present moment, because all power arises out of the present moment, because it is life itself. Mm. So, and this is why you don't need years or generations to become free of the pain body. It has taken many generations for the pain body to build up, but it takes only one conscious human and one conscious moment now to disidentify from it and recognize it. You're not totally free yet, no, but you recognize it for what it is. It takes only one moment of awareness now to see it for what it is. And when this person then has broken the unconsciousness of generations, and that's what we are engaged in. We are, we are breaking the unconsciousness that goes back thousands and thousands of years. That's pretty powerful. George and Victoria, thank you again from Bend, Oregon. Thank you. Thanks, well, guys. Thank you, because you folks are doing this on a global electronic basis. So thank you for letting us be a part of that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the second time. Thank you. Well, uh, on page 170, you talk about children, and you say suppressed pain bodies are extremely toxic, even more so than openly active ones, and that psychic toxic toxicity is absorbed by the children and contributes to the development of their own pain bodies. So people who are, I think about this all the time, we were just doing somebody on the show, we're always doing somebody on the show who's arguing in their families. When you argue in front of your children, I remember this the other day, the little girl said, when my mommy and daddy argue, I go and, I go and hide under the covers. When you argue in front of your children, yes. you are creating and reinforcing their pain bodies. Yes. I did that as a child. I was always trying to hide from my parents' pain body, which was there a lot of the time, active. So that's one way is when there's an active confrontation, and the parents having a confrontation with their mutual pain yeah, bodies. You shocked us last week when you said you started thinking of killing yourself yes. when you were at a very young age, yes. nine or ten, yes. because of your parents. Uh, yes, that was the general um, environment that I was in. I, re I, I perceived it as... Uh, um, extremely unpleasant. There was the environment of my parents, and there was not that they were not loving parents, but they both had heavy pain bodies. Mm -hmm. I loved them, but I, they, I didn't know at the time why that was continuous conflict. I mm -hmm. just knew it was dreadful to be around them. And of course, I was also unhappy at school because I never liked the, having to study things that I didn't wasn't interested in, and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't done in an interesting way. So, mm -hmm. um, so. Yes, so the the children then absorb, in one way they absorb the pain body from their parents is when there's open conflict between the parents' pain bodies. 
But another way is also when parents, some parents say we mustn't fight in front of the children. And nevertheless, right. there, there's an intense emotional negativity. They may not be saying anything, but there's an emanation of intense negativity in the parents. That's right. I know a couple stayed together 24 years in, in order until the, all the, the last child was grown and had gone to college. All the children are completely messed up, yeah. you know, from one problem after another problem, drugs and drinking and all kinds of problems because the children stayed in that house and absorbed all the energy yes. that was in that house. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it's the case if the parents repress that right. because they don't want to fight in front of the children or they may have an image of themselves as religious and they uh -huh. mustn't. That's right. And so they, they are not even, they're not even admitting to themselves perhaps that there's intense right. negativity. And then the children grow up in that and sometimes it's then the children who are forced to act it out in the world. That's right. <clears throat> and the, the interesting about that when you try to repress it, when you're not... Uh, fully realizing the truth of who you are and you say the truth of who you are will set you free when you allow the repressed bad energy to go on in the household the energy is still there it goes back to what I was saying on page 162 yes. the, em the energy is always there yes and children more so than even adults who don't children who don't have the language for it pick up on the energy yes yes that's and true. often blame themselves because they don't have the language to explain yes Okay, okay. Um, you also say on, um, well, first of all, we'll do this. We'll go to a caller on this topic from uh, Melbourne, Australia. Hello. She has a 10-year-old daughter. Her name is Wendy. Wendy, hi. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. 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 Thank you for having me on the, on the webcast today. Well, great to talk to um, you. I have a question. Eckhart, on page 178, you state that someone who in childhood was neglected or abandoned by one or both parents will likely develop a pain body that becomes triggered in any situation that resonates even remotely with their primordial pain of abandonment. So I see this pain in my 10-year-old daughter whose father no longer sees her and hasn't really had much of a relationship with her. And my question is, how do I help her through her feelings of abandonment? And how do I guide her through people-pleasing behavior? Because I notice she has a strong ten tendency to people-please just to be accepted or liked. I would really love some help on this one, as I'm often at a loss on, help, on how to help her through it. Can you give, a, can you give an example of how this, uh, what you see as uh, a sense of abandonment, how it manifests in her now? And what could, uh, uh, can, can you give a situation where this happens? Uh, how does she behave in such a situation? Well, often uh, there's been occasions when they have little parties at school and, and children get invited. And if she's one of the kids that's excluded, because obviously not everyone gets invited to everyone's birthday party, she's so traumatized by it. And she cries and she doesn't understand and she comes and she says they don't like her or they don't love her. And then she'll try to often buy their friendship. She'll take things to them, you know, take gifts or take. Easter eggs lately and things like that, and I just think, oh, how do I, how do I get her through this? You know, she wants to be liked all the time, and she wants approval. Oh. So your but child, often it's, a, it's a case of intense tears and trauma. She is now ten years old. Ten years old, yes. Yes, perhaps you can gradually over the next few years explain to her that. Uh, she cannot be liked by everybody. Nobody is liked by everybody. And you cannot expect, uh, I think if you explain it gently, she will begin to understand that some, uh, it is impossible in this world to be liked and accepted by everybody. And it is not necessary to be liked and accepted by everybody. And especially um, if you do things that are of any significance in this world as when she grows up, uh, the more significant things you do in this world, the more you will find there are certain people who don't like what you do. Correct. And even Oprah uh, hmm. has people who, who don't like what she does. I don't know why, but... <laughs> the... I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and the more successful you become, the more people you have who don't like what you do. So you have a... And I used to be... Listen, as you're describing your daughter, I used to be this little 10-year-old girl 
who had such a desire to please, I was always taking all of my notebook paper and giving it to everybody else, whatever I had. Even in college, nobody liked me, so I would, you know, spend all my money because uh, I was working in TV from the time I was a sophomore in college, and everybody else was jealous of me uh, for having a job and, you know, and having a job on TV. And so I would take my money and buy pizzas for everybody and try to make everybody like me. And, uh, you know, listen, I hope you... I was 40-something before I figured it out, so I hope your daughter gets it before then. I think some gentle explanation, uh, just a little bit here and there. Now she's 10, and then over the next few years, the behavior will continue for a while. You cannot just undo old conditioning in another person. Yeah, the pain body is I was not wanted by my father. That's what the 10-year-old is yes. feeling. I was not wanted yes. by my father. Yes, yes. Yes. And the pain body, if, if your daughter gets taken over by intense negative feelings that are out of proportion to the triggering event, which is a sign that this is the pain body, if this happens and when this happens, after, I describe it in, the, in a new earth, after a pain body episode is over, the next day, for example, you talk to what your daughter felt at the, that time. Yesterday, when you behaved in such a way, when you did this, when you said that, what did it feel like? Ask her questions about, so that she begins to put attention on her own emotions and she, she mm -hmm. can detect them. Ask questions about, after a pain body episode in your daughter, ask her what it feels like so that the awareness grows in her of this. And next time, when it happens again, say, oh, there's the that old thing has come back. She may even she may, you may even encourage her to give it a name, the pain body. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then she can identify it when it happens again. So gradually the child can be, instead of at the mercy of these arising emotions, the child can already learn at an early age to be there as the awareness of the emotion rather than to be taken over by the emotion. Actually, I think children can learn this a lot easier yes. than adults can, because we're so overly conditioned. Yes, and that should be the, one of the main things that children learn at school, but so far that's not happening. Right. And also, Wendy, yes, I, I might suggest this. You know, I think one of the things that would have helped me a lot, and I found this with my girls in uh, Africa, uh, who come from really disadvantaged backgrounds. They are disadvantaged, and one of the things I want to teach them is a life of service, you always feel better about your life when you can be of service to someone else's. And so if your mm -hmm. daughter, even at 10, is exposed to children who are less fortunate than she is, children who are orphaned or abandoned or, you know, in poverty, I don't know what the situation is in, in Melbourne, but children who have less than she does, and she is able to see that her situation really isn't so bad and allowed to feel a sense of gratitude for who she is and where she is and what she has, and yet also empathy and compassion for people who have less than she does, I think that that will also, even at 10 years old, begin to offer some perspective for her. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So tonight's chapter, Breaking Free, how do we do it? You say... How long does it take to become free of the, the pain body on page 183? Tell us how long. <laughs> uh, the important question, as I say, is not um, how long it takes to become free of the pain body, but how long does it take for me to stop identifying with the pain body? That's because it's more important to stop identifying with it because in one sense, you're already free. The pain body may still be there in you for a while. Mm -hmm. But when you stop identifying with it, that's freedom already. You say the answer is, of course, that it depends both on the density of an individual's pain body. Some are more dense than others. Yes. As well as the degree or intensity of that individual's arising presence. Yes. So the more you're able to bring that sense of awareness, or as I said in the beginning, that that you, you who is disguised right. as awareness, that awareness is you disguised as a person, yes. the more you can be present with that, yes. the more it dissipates. Yes. It and doesn't happen instantly. No, but every time you 
disidentify. Every time you are there as the awareness, the energy of the pain body already diminishes. So every time there's a little bit less of it. And it, the, what happens to the energy, it's all, energy is all one. There's only one energy, oh. but it appears in different frequencies. And the pain body energy has a certain frequency. It's contained, it's rigid, it's tight, and it becomes freed, and it contributes to the arising awareness. And you say, but it's not the pain body, but identification with it that causes the suffering. That's right. The pain body itself is only... There's no power over no. it. No. It's not suffering anymore when you don't identify with it. Then it's only an unpleasant feeling inside you. You can hardly call it suffering. But it's suffering when you become it or it becomes you. That's suffering. It's not the pain body, but identification with the pain body that forces you to relive the past again and again and again and keeps you in a state of unconsciousness. I'm on page 183, everybody. So a more important question to ask would be, how long does it take to become free of identification? Yes, that's yeah. the key. And, that, and the answer to that, of course, is it doesn't really take any time because all it requires you is to be aware this moment as it arises. In the moment it arises, to see it and recognize it. Be the awareness for it. Be the space for it is another word, another expression we can use. Are you able to be the awareness for the pain body, to be the space for the pain body and say, ah, oh, there it is. That means you've broken the identification. All it requires is for you to be present in the now as the awareness. And to remember that the past, no matter what it is, no matter how awful it was, how horrifying, how much suffering, the past has no power has no over power the present moment. Because what arises out of the present moment is the your the dimension of consciousness that we call presence or awareness right. it's a dimension that was already there in you always but had been covered up by density of emotion and density of conditioned mind structures thinking and the way you get to that is to bring yourself back to the present moment get yes. still yes get still get still and then that arises that dimension that then arises is, we could call it, goes beyond who you are as a person. It is transpersonal. It is a transpersonal dimension in you. And it's the, that's the only thing that can free you from the purely personal realm, which is, has its place but is very limited. And it's the only thing that can free you from the past and the heaviness of the past. And the past cannot prevail against it. It is impossible because there is, it is the only power there is. So it is also the timeless dimension in you. When we talk of presence or awareness, there is no past and future in presence or awareness. I got that. When you say on the uh, page 184, when you feel the pain body, don't fall into the era of thinking there's something wrong with you, making yourself into a problem. Yes. Because the ego loves that. Yes. Okay, the knowing needs to be followed by accepting. We talked about that a lot tonight. Anything else will obscure it, obscure it. Accepting means you allow yourself to feel whatever it is you're feeling at that moment. You can't argue with what is. Well, you can, but if you do, you suffer. That's how we suffer. Through allowing, you become what you are, vast and spacious. You become whole. You're not a fragment anymore, which is how the ego perceives itself. Your true nature emerges, which is one with the nature of God. And then you say, Jesus points to this when he says, be ye whole even as your Father in heaven is whole. The New Testament's be ye perfect is a mistranslation of the original Greek word, which means whole. This is to say you don't need to become whole, but be what you already are, with or without the pain body. Yes, yes. You already that. Now, this brings us to the question that Denise in Michigan asks on our, our web you, she says, is Eckhart perfect? Eckhart, you seem to be almost perfect, although I know nobody is. Do you ever yell? Do you ever get angry or feel sad? I'm not perfect because the form cannot be perfect. Every form, by the very fact that it has form, is one thing but not the other. So whole, yes, I'm, I feel that I'm aligned with something far greater than the little person. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is 
where I rest, and that is where inspiration comes from, where the teaching arises. This is presence, uh -huh. and it is it is not. It goes far beyond this little person. This little person is insignificant. It doesn't matter very much to me. <laughs> so this, I don't look for perfection. <laughs> I don't look for perfection in myself because that would be a terrible frustration. Mm -hmm. I do things that people perhaps would regard as not perfect. I, I, um, I'm waiting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 okay, I, I have a glass of wine. I drink. I like my glass of wine occasionally. I drink coffee at Starbucks almost every day. And sometimes people come up to me and say, you are drinking coffee, you shouldn't be drinking coffee. What do you need coffee for? <laughs> I said, why not? I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy all kinds of things. I don't have m many negative emotions. I can't think the last time I even had a negative emotion, but it's possible. I uh, perhaps uh, I remember maybe some years ago, yes, I was watching <laughs> and <laughs> people were mistreating an animal and I yeah. suddenly felt anger. Uh -huh. So it can happen. And what did you do when you felt the anger? I just did a show on puppy mills. It made me very angry, too. So what did you do with that anger? Did you say, oh, I'm feeling anger? You noticed the anger? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the situation, somebody else interfered at that very moment. Otherwise, I had already taken steps uh -huh. towards stopping it. And so uh, the anger was there. I felt it. And it was in my system for a couple of minutes as a vibrational intense vibration in the body and then it dissipated I let it go like the so duck. you don't just like like little things don't upset you ever oh no no I've let go of, I had so much of that in the past so much suffering with all kinds of little things uh, it's it's not worth it yeah I never understand this because I'm not you know I don't get triggered by uh, you know automobiles or driving or stuff I no. never understand the people the road rage that's no, pain I body right yes and and the continuous I never understand why not getting in a not being led in a line or being cut off why that would cause you to be so no, crazy I don't understand it either but for many people that is something they personalize the traffic so it's an egoic uh, phenomenon so when, when somebody does something, they regard it as a personal insult to them, to their dignity or whatever. Really? Uh, so, and of course, if, if it they were... They personalize the traffic. <laughs> That's interesting. That's good. They, they wouldn't perhaps do it with the weather. If some hail, rains, if hail yeah. or rain hits your windscreen, then you would, perhaps you wouldn't get angry. But if a driver cuts across, then you suddenly get angry. But it's the same thing. It's just a, an energy field cutting, cutting across. Why personalize it? Mm -hmm. And I, you're amazed that people suffer so much stress in traffic because if you don't react, then there's no stress. If you don't personalize other drivers right. as if they were, had some personal uh, uh, disagreement with you, it's nothing to do with you. They don't even know you. Right. If you don't personalize things, it's actually quite stress-free. Or you get stuck in traffic and you get and people get so frustrated getting yes. stuck in traffic. Yes. <laughs> I know. And that can be a wonderful meditation. You yeah. can't move. Why not be in the body, feel the intense alive, aliveness in your energy field and be yeah. there. Enjoy. And everybody who's listening has ever been stuck in traffic. You now, after reading the book, you know how ridiculous it is to be upset that you're stuck in traffic because there's nothing you can do to change it. Yeah, so just be with it. Wonderful opportunity for acceptance and surrender. And a wonderful opportunity for learning dysfunction. If you observe you are not accepting and surrendering, then you can observe how dysfunction arises. I love the way you answered that question from Denise in Michigan. You say you're not perfect, but you're whole. Yes. So sometimes people on the spiritual path, they look for some kind of perfection. They have an image of how a perfect, mm -hmm. evolved, spiritual human being behaves. And then they try to conform that to that image. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it really accept your own limitations, accept your imperfections. Do you have no attachment to, I mean, the way you even described your body. I love last week. Uh, at, toward the end of the uh, of our webcast, I asked you if you had any fear of dying, and I said this later to some friends. I've never talked to anybody to whom I've asked that question, to whom I've asked that question, and there was such um, definitive resoluteness about it. How you were just like you. I really believed you when you said you had no fear. <laughs> I really believed you when you had no fear of death. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you you have no attachment to anything? Like, do you live in a nice house? Do you like nice things? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like nice things. Now, for many years, I lived on a minimum because for many years, I didn't have a regular job. I was mm -hmm. just doing some occasional counseling mm -hmm. and occasional little workshops. So for many years, I lived on very, very little. And uh, I enjoyed that. I, later on, I realized, oh, I must have lived for all those years below the poverty level. But I didn't feel that at the time. I didn't regard myself as poor. I enjoyed every moment of it. And then now I have relative wealth, especially mm -hmm. compared to that time. Mm -hmm. I'm relatively well, and I'm actually enjoying that too. I buy some nice furniture sometimes and mm -hmm. enjoy it. Uh, you like nice sheets? I like nice sheets. Or do yes. you care? Well, I can sleep in any, but <laughs> I like nice things. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you're not attached to them. Not, no, no, I'm not not attached. It's, I enjoy um, having space around so that you don't have to listen to the neighbor's noise. Okay. That is quite nice. Um, I, perhaps the greatest thing that money can buy is space around you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have it, and if, if you have to live with neighbor's noise, it's a great opportunity for surrendering or for telling them to shut up. But <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, I wanted to have you uh, tell everyone about an upcoming... Well, I want to tell you about an upcoming Oprah show. Do you want to summarize? I guess you just basically did. Yes. Break free of it, lose the identification. Yes, that's it. Yes. I'm really excited about the next chapter because the next chapter is finding who you truly are. And I would say, bring a friend <clears throat> to the webcast next week. Bring, come and bring a friend because even if you haven't read the rest of the book, you can start really on page 185 with finding who you truly are yeah. and then work your way backwards. It's going to be yes. so exciting. I yes, mean, I love it, too. I love it. Yeah. Oh, I love it when you love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's going to be so exciting. And also, everybody, listen, I want to tell you about an upcoming Oprah show we're doing this Wednesday, an entire hour on a new earth that's going to air on uh, our show, my show, this Wednesday, April 9th, in the United States and in Canada and the rest of the world as soon as we can get it to our international affiliates. For those of you, uh, Rubina in Dubai, we'll be talking to people who've had a big and little transformation in their lives. It's a powerful hour and something I think you'll want to see. If you've been trying to talk to your friends about this or people in your home about this, that's the show that they should watch. I want to uh, encourage you to have them watch that and bring a friend to next week's uh, webcast to find out who you truly are. Again, Eckhart and I thank you all for joining us around the world. The sixth class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our classes, you can do that also tomorrow at Oprah.com and iTunes. It's free. Thanks to Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins, it's free. <laughs> and also tomorrow we'll have special bonus materials for you on Oprah.com and iTunes. Audio meditations read by Eckhart's partner, Kim Ng. You can listen to them on your computer or download them and take them to go. Don't forget to update your workbook. Get ready for next week's class, finding out who you truly are. If you're not who you think you are, uh, well, then who are you? We're going to talk about that. It's yes. going to be so exciting <laughs> next week. Again, I thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. See you in class next week. Good night. Good night. Lovely. Less than that. Well, hi. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to class seven of our New Earth web series with author Eckhart Tolle. Uh, I want to thank our students from every corner of the world who are joining us live on this journey of discovery. I truly believe that as uh, each one of us becomes more awake and aware in our own lives, so will our families and everyone we en encounter, our communities and our, and our countries and eventually our world. And so Eckhart uh, Tolly and I welcome you once again to ch to another yet another lesson, chapter seven, my favorite chapter thus far. Before we get started, we're going to have a moment of silence, and you're going to lead us into that moment of silence. Yes. Yes. The uh, we're already getting used to having moments of silence to yes. start with, and, and I'll introduce the moment of silence today with a short meditation passage taken from the Power of Now. Mm -hmm. And as I read this short passage, 
our viewers should already be able to become still as they listen. Mm -hmm. And after I've read it, we'll be still just for half a minute or so. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Mm -hmm. It's all about entering the present moment fully. Mm -hmm. And that begins with using your senses mm -hmm. fully. Mm -hmm. Be where you are. Mm -hmm. Look around. Just look. Don't interpret. Be aware of the silent presence of each thing. Be aware of the space that allows everything to be. Listen to the sounds. Don't judge them. Listen to the silence underneath the sounds. Touch something, anything, and feel and acknowledge its being. Observe the rhythm of your breathing. Feel the air flowing in and out. Feel the life energy inside your body. Allow everything to be within and without. Allow the isness of all things. Move deeply into the now. That's great. Yes. That's great. All right, everybody. Um, tonight, we're discussing Chapter 7, Finding Who You Truly Are, which I know is the reason why so many of you picked up this book in the first place, because when I first announced it, I was um, reading the subtitle that the book is A New Earth Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. And I've gone on the message boards, and so many people were saying, I hope this book helps me discover my purpose. I hope this book allows me to find who I am. Well, if you're ready... Tonight's your night. Let's start with an overview of what this chapter um, is really about. You say that it is about, um, you begin with know thyself. Chapter 7 starts with those two words that you say are inscribed above the entrance of uh, a famous Greek temple. You say on page 186, what those words imply is this. Before you ask any other questions, first ask the most fundamental question of your life. Who am I? And then you say on page 189 that you are not the ego. So when you become aware of the ego in you, it doesn't mean you know who you are. It means you know who you are not. But it is through knowing who you are not that the greatest obstacle to truly knowing yourself is removed. So let's start off with these two questions. Who aren't I? And who am I? And, of course, the best starting point is the first question. Who aren't I? Because what is left when you realize... And it's usually a process for most people, realizing who you are not letting go of identification with things and so on. When you realize who you are not, then suddenly who you are becomes revealed to you. And who you are cannot easily be put into words, because if it could, then... It could be answered in one simple sentence, and then everybody could repeat that answer and believe that they know who they are. That's right. So we start with knowing who you are not, and that begins for people sometimes with loss, uh, where they lose something valuable that they had identified with, or death comes into their lives, some kind of breakdown or disaster happens. Sometimes those people suddenly 
awaken. Awaken. Something has been taken away from them that they had identified with for many years that had become part of their sense of self. Mm -hmm. And if something very fundamental that has been part of your sense of self is removed, death, loss, uh, Even collapse, if it's a person, a human being it who, could be who, somebody, who you loved. Yes, it could yeah. be somebody close to you who dies. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, at first it leads to enormous suffering and you feel as if part of you had died also. Mm -hmm. And for some people that happens even if they lose possessions. Mm -hmm because they were so identified with their possessions mm -hmm. that when their possessions are removed, they feel there's nothing left of me. Mm -hmm. Another uh, related to possessions is social position. Mm -hmm. If people fall from high, some high social position, there's right. a scandal, it happens all the time in the news. Yes. <laughs> Not mentioning any names. Yes, don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> and uh, then these people, can be extremely painful if they had become totally identified with either their possessions or their social position and they are mm -hmm. suddenly faced with a kind of huge emptiness in their lives mm -hmm. and then the question arises, I'm nobody anymore and this is the point, a decisive point is reached there where they can either continue to resist and suffer, resist what has happened internally, mm -hmm. complain about it tell themselves story about it, how it's all collapsed, or they can suddenly come to a point of acceptance of what happened and acceptance of the present moment. So the thing that, is, that, had dis that was so important in their lives actually left behind, I sometimes compare it to, if you look at a person's life, it's a tapestry, consists mm -hmm. of all kinds of things that one identifies with. Right. And when a great loss happens, it's almost as if uh, suddenly there's a huge hole in that tapestry of my life. Correct. And that is painful when you identify with the tapestry, but behind the tapestry there's a light that shines through, because without the light there wouldn't be anything at all. That's why you can even see your life. Without the light of consciousness, nothing would be. Behind the tapestry there's a light. I'm using a kind of analogy. Mm -hmm. So when you don't resist, this hole that has suddenly appeared in this tapestry of your life, mm -hmm. then there's a light that shines through then, and I'm using it as an analogy, mm -hmm. there's suddenly a peace that comes when the emptiness that is left behind by the form that has dissolved mm -hmm. is not resisted internally. Mm -hmm. And then through that empty space there comes what the Bible calls the peace that passes all understanding. Mm. Because you can't explain suddenly, and people have reported that this has happened to them. They lost, sometimes in some cases, everything. They suffered at first, and then suddenly an inner shift happened. They accept it. And this also happens when you are grieving somebody that you loved. Isn't it true? Because yes. when you come to understand fully who you are, it doesn't mean that you will no longer be saddened when you lose loved ones. No. But you will also, when you become more, con when you become conscious, you then understand that they have just moved from form to formless and that the formless can have an easier way to come through, come through now even more strongly yes. than it did in the form yes. if you allow yourself to be with it and to see it and to experience it. Yes, this, what you just said, uh, I, an example, I was talking to a woman who lost her son Mm -hmm. He had an illness, he was about 28, I believe, and she was sitting next to him at his deathbed, and the, then the moment he, just a few minutes before he died, and just after he died, she could sense an enormous peace descending upon the room, and filling mm -hmm. the whole room, and she could feel that there was a sacred presence in the room in the moment of death. Mm -hmm. So she had totally surrendered to that. And it's very painful. For, it's even more painful for a parent to have to witness a, a child. child's death mm -hmm. than the other way around. And so they, she came, that was the most sacred moment in her life. And that lasted for about 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, her mind came in and suddenly she started crying and protesting. Mm -hmm. 
But that because was... the mind wants the situation to be different. <clears throat> yes. The mind wants you alive again in the physical body. Or the mind wants the thing back that I have lost. Yes. The job, the position, the whatever. I think it's harder, though, when it comes to loved ones because there is a connection there. And yes. there is... You know, nobody knows what happens, yes. except maybe you, uh, yeah. when we die. Yeah. And so there's this feeling that, you know, I have lost someone. Yes. Is that feeling selfishness? No, it's a normal feeling because there was, even if you lo truly love somebody, of course, what you love in the other person is deeper than the form, the, right. the external form of that person. Nevertheless, there's always a little bit, even in true love, there's always a little bit of attachment to the form also mm -hmm. because, because the, the light comes through the form. The light comes through the form. Yes. All right. Let's go here to, to uh, page 186, everybody. This is one of my favorite things. Um, a second. I, I have a cold, so if I look like I'm sucking on a cough drop. <laughs> Unconscious people, and many remain unconscious, trapped in their egos throughout their lives, will quickly tell you who they are, their name, their occupation, their personal history, the shape or state of their body, and whatever they identify with. Others may appear to be more evolved because they think of themselves as an immortal soul or divine spirit. But do they really know themselves? Or have they just added some spiritual sounding uh, concepts to the content of their mind? Knowing yourself goes far deeper than the adoption of a set of ideas or beliefs. Spiritual ideas and beliefs may at best be helpful pointers, but in themselves, they rarely have the power to dislodge the more firmly established core concepts of who you think you are, which are part of the conditioning of the human mind. This is my favorite co in, in this chapter, one of my favorites. I have three stars, then another star when I read it the second time, and another star. Knowing yourself deeply has nothing to do with whatever ideas are floating around in your mind. Knowing yourself is to be rooted in being instead of lost in your mind. Yes. yes. That was beautifully written. Yes. And so the, I mentioned that because some people are identified, many people are identified with external things. You mentioned, I believe, a week or two ago, you, somebody mentioned to you that they suddenly realized that they are not their car. They're not their car. <laughs> That's yes. the beginning, yes. <laughs> early stage of disidentification, mm -hmm. but it's good. But we do think we are, and that's why you wrote the whole chapter. We do think we are our roles. Yes, you know, our roles. Because a lot of people have important roles. Roles as parents and yes. roles in important positions that affect yes. a lot of people's lives. Yes. And people think that they are their roles and they identify with their status in the world and that's what right. they have achieved. That's right. And, of course, it's a question of finding a balance of honoring the role, that, of honoring the function that you have in this world, so that's fine. You have to do whatever you're doing. You, you fulfill your function as mother, as father, or in some other capacity, some pu public function, business function, whatever it is. So to honor the function without becoming totally identified with the function. So that always there's still a human being there, not yes. just a function. So knowing yourself deeply has nothing to do with whatever ideas are floating around in your mind, meaning Knowing yourself deeply has nothing to do with me being on television every day, speaking to people, no. and even maybe doing a good job at it, actually doing a good job at it, yeah. and all the great jobs that everybody else is doing who's listening. Those are identifications, identifications. with form. Yes. And also, what I meant, what you just read, is people sometimes have certain ideas in their mind of who they are and mm -hmm. they may be spiritual ideas mm -hmm. I'm eternal spirit that's of course wonderful and basically it is true but do you truly know that because to, in order to truly know that you are m more you are much deeper than this form it goes far beyond holding certain concepts in your mind yeah it goes, this kind of knowing is a knowing that it goes beyond conceptual Because if knowing. you really knew that, you would have a certain way of being or living in the world yes. that would manifest that in the world. Exactly. And that uh, would manifest your being in the world. That's right. And, but, and particularly when situations happened, your reaction to a situation 
always tells you where you are at as far as your level of consciousness. That is why a lot of people become annoyed with people who claim to be so spiritual or so religious, yes. who are intolerant of other people, yes. intolerant of other ideas, self-righteous, imposing their ideas on other people, because if you truly were what you say you are. Yes. So yes. moving on to who you think you are. This is one of my th this is beautiful statements here. On page 187, everybody, if small things have the power to disturb you, then who you think you are is exactly that small. That will be your unconscious belief. What are the small things? Ultimately, all things are small things because all things are transient. And you say your sense of who you are determines what you perceive or, or as your needs and what matters to you in life. And whatever matters to you will have the power to upset and disturb you. So people all the time say, you know, I'm a peaceful person. I'm a loving person. Yes. I'm a kind person. I'm a generous person. I'm a good person. Yes. And then the slightest thing goes wrong. And suddenly something else comes up, which is total opposite of the good person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is not the deep knowing of who you are. The deep knowing really is, uh, we use the word know here in a somewhat differently from the conventional way of using the word know. Usually knowing is conceptual knowing. Right. So the analogy one could have, which is sometimes given, is with honey. Mm -hmm. you, can ex you can examine the chemical makeup of honey. You can examine the molecular structure of honey. I, you you can, I can tell you it's sweet. You can write a PhD about honey, or you can write poems about honey. But if you have never tasted honey, in other words, if honey has not merged with you, mm -hmm. then you don't really know honey. But the moment you taste honey, then you know honey. And all the other stuff beforehand, even your PhD about honey, if you wrote one, is not knowing, not true knowing. knowing. Yes. It's only conceptual. Okay. So to be rooted in being instead of lost in your mind. And what does that mean, to be rooted in being? And again, we are using words here to describe something that really is beyond words. It's not describable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but just a little hint is... We always come back, of course, here in, uh, in this teaching to the present moment. Absolutely. So when, you, when your attention moves fully into the present moment, at that moment you go deeper into, into being. Mm -hmm. You could say that life has two dimensions. There's the horizontal dimension of life, past, future, where mm. everything happens. And most people, their whole existence is on that horizontal surface dimension. And they think life. that's their life. They think that's all there is. Mm -hmm. And of course, then life is quite a threatening place because... You've all never, that is transient. It changes. Very transient. Yeah. And you've, so you've never encountered the deeper dimension. This, by the way, is a few people have interpreted the Christian cross, which we mentioned also mm -hmm. last time in a sl slightly different context. The Christian cross as being showing the horizontal dimension of life and suddenly the inter it intersects with the vertical dimension. Mm. It's also the dimension of the sacred. Yes. And so the, you enter the vertical dimension by being, becoming present, by bringing your attention into the now. So then, because then past and future disappear from your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And at this, at this moment, there's only the now. And suddenly, a depth opens up within you. And so what you've been saying throughout this book is that if you are living your life in the horizontal, the past and the future then you're not really living. You are making enemies of this present moment. Yes. And you're not truly living. Yes. And that when you say, what I interpret what you say, knowing yourself is to be rooted in being instead of lost in your mind, is to, in every encounter, and I've been doing this more and more, um, bringing, coming back to your breath. Yes. Coming back to the present moment in such a way that you are aware and conscious of everything that's going on around you and recognizing that you, you, you are that awareness. That's who you are. You are yes. the observer of all these things that are going on in the horizontal plane of your life. Exactly. So the, with the vertical comes the, the witnessing presence, the that's observer. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's, and so on, that's the liberation. You, that's, <clears throat> you know, sometimes this word liberation is used in spiritual context. Mm -hmm. That's the liberation from 
the horizontal dimension, which Jesus calls the world. Yes. You know, may I should just share this? I know we have uh, Debbie from the Netherlands on, on Skype, but maybe this will uh, help illustrate this for you. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote this in, in my magazine for one of the What I Know For Sure. I was walking with my friend Bob Green um, on New Year's Day two years ago on a mountain in Hawaii, and it was late evening. Um, the sun had set while we were walking, and the moon had come up. And the clouds had come in and come down to the ground where we were. And all of a sudden, we're walking, and we were surrounded by the clouds. We were, surround we were in the clouds on this mountain. And you could only see a sliver of the moon up ahead, just a sliver of it. Um, and I think Bob made a comment, like, it looks like the DreamWorks logo, the moon. It looks like you can go and sit up there with a fishing pole. And we were walking along, and all of a sudden he turned around and he said, can you hear that? And I stopped. And it was completely, utterly still. It was so still. It makes me want to weep thinking about it. It was so still that it felt like all of time and no time. It felt like the earth had stopped, that everything had stopped. So much so that my very breath was so loud I began to hold my breath because the, my breath was making too much noise in the stillness. And in that moment, I understood what you had written in Stillness Speaks, that that is always there. That stillness, there's not a bird or a cricket or a frog or a car horn or anything. That is always there. Yes. And that's also an inner dimension. And that is the same as, as I. Yes. I am that. Yes. I am that stillness. Yes. It was a it was a powerful spiritual experience for me. I ne I've never forgotten. I got chills now th even yes. thinking about it. It's wonderful. Because you recognize that is always there. When all the noise and the, yes. you know, fireworks and all the things that go on on this mountain, that is always there. Yes. Consciousness. Mm -hmm. we, want, we could call it, although its labels are always limiting, but right. we could say that is pure consciousness, mm -hmm. before we, consciousness becomes something, mm -hmm. before it's born into a form, it's there in its pristine, formless, timeless yeah. state. And in all things, that's why you were asking us to look around the room, there is the stillness of all things. It's easier to, to determine in nature, though. Yes. It's harder with a table. Yes, <laughs> it's harder, and yeah. even harder with human beings, because yes. there's so much mind there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But so nature, but even in so-called inanimate objects that you perhaps never even look at, haven't looked at for years, they've been around you. Sometimes it's wonderful to pick up an object and just be aware of its its silent presence, mm -hmm. no matter what it is, because whatever it is, ultimately nothing is inanimate. And physicists would agree, because if you go deep into any <coughs> so-called inanimate object, you realize it's intensely alive. Mm -hmm. The it's essence. easy to do with trees, as I said earlier. Oh, time. yes. And so mm. the essence is uh, what, we, what we're trying to get here is that that is who we are, that stillness. Yes, the, that's the essence of our being. That's, that's who we are at the deepest level. This is the timeless dimension within and us. And when you're saying that even when you pass on, when you transition to another, to the formless, that stillness, that consciousness, that spirit, whatever name you choose to give it, still there. Yes, that awareness is timeless. It's not subject to birth and death. As I have said somewhere, the opposite of the opposite of life has no opposite. Usually people think in terms of life and, and death, death. Yes. But really death is the opposite of birth. It's not the opposite of life. Hmm. Life in its essence has no opposite. It's hmm. eternal. Debbie's from the Netherlands and lives in the city of Harlem. She's Skyping us from her family room there. I understand you have a question about, <coughs> quote on page 187, about small things disturbing you. I love this quote. Go ahead, Deb. Hi. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. Uh, my question is about high sensitivity. I always considered myself as a sensitive person, and uh, that means I'm easily overwhelmed by day-to-day -day life things uh, that might be considered small. Um, I've been practicing staying in the moment with challenging moments, uh, but I think I need some more advice. Is high sensitivity uh, just an, an, a narrow egoic state? 
and do you have some tools that might help me to stop feeling so overwhelmed by all these small things? It does sound like a label you've given yourself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know. I'm a highly <laughs> sensitive individual. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is true. So that's uh, that also we need to address. Uh, can you give two, uh, perhaps two or three examples of what kind of things you are very sensitive to? What? Um, well, a lot of things, but usually um, when I go into a shop and there's loud music there, I just uh, want to run away. I have a hard time dealing with uh, noise and chaos. Yes, or being in a big city, traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, I suggest that you uh, experiment a little bit when these situations arise and you feel the same thing happening again. Uh, and if you bring a very alert attention to the situation, you realize that really there are three levels to this situation. Level one is whatever it is that disturbs you, the external noise, the chaos, the traffic, whatever it may be. So there is the, the thing that disturbs you, level one. Level two, there is your reaction to that thing that disturbs you, which could come as a, it could, could be an almost physical reaction, as perhaps a contraction in your body. It could be also an emotional reaction mm -hmm. of uh, frustration, irritation, anger, I assume, something like that, right? And also, in addition, the reaction could be certain thoughts in your head about the situation. It says, I can't stand being here any longer. It's dreadful, dreadful, right? This is level two. Mm -hmm. Now, be aware mm -hmm. of that these two are, first of all, separate. There is the triggering event or situation. And then there is your physical, emotional, mental reaction to that. And now what is level three? <coughs> that is usually overlooked. But level three is where ultimately freedom lies. Level three is your awareness of both these levels. Mm. You are aware that there is the, the situation, the event, the, there is my reaction, physical, emotional, mental, mm. and there is myself being the aware space for those two. Mm. And if you can bring your attention more to that deepest level, then you realize changes will happen on the other two levels. If you re recognize yourself not as the reacting entity that happens in you, but that's not who you are. Got it but you recognize yourself as the awareness that is aware of the thing that's happening out there, of the thing that's reacting inside so also. So actually, like, Debbie, you're observing your own behavior. You're observing your, your ego's behavior to it. Yes. You're observing your ego's behavior. With no judgment, just no judgment. as pure observation, pure awareness. Like, oh, isn't that interesting? I'm getting so upset over... Yes, this guy pulling just, in front of just me. being there as the awareness. Mm -hmm. So, and that's that's already the beginning of freedom, and yes. then uh, increasingly you realize that you are that you are not the entity that is reacting. And then, as Oprah said, then you can let go of thinking of yourself, of having this concept of yourself as a highly sensitive person that perhaps <laughs> you might, it's not natural, nothing personal in this, you may have become attached to because you've lived with this concept of who you are for many years. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's where freedom lies. But, but in addition to, to Debbie's question, let's say, and for her, you know, she labels herself or defines herself as a highly sensitive person. But let's say a person gets upset about someone putting a dent in his or her car, or you spill coffee on your blouse right before an important meeting, or your child gets sick, or you get sick. Or are you saying that if we get upset about these things, these kinds of things, that we don't know who we truly are? Um, if the dimension of 
presence or awareness is missing, then you are lost in the reaction. Mm -hmm. You think and, you are the reaction. Yes, then you become the reaction. And when you become the reaction, you don't know who you are. It's a misperception of who you are. You got that, right, Debbie? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, I got it, That's too. you a lot. Isn't it good when you get it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got it, too. I got it, too. And just detaching yourself, it doesn't, that doesn't change the situation. It doesn't no. immediately change the situation, but you do find that as you practice this, changes suddenly appear, changes uh, sometimes first appear in the force that is behind your reaction mm -hmm. that lessens. You react, still react, but less, not as strongly. And miraculously, you sometimes even find that if, you, if you're totally because really the awareness level is also part of the acceptance. Mm -hmm. You completely accept that at this moment, this is what I feel, and this is what the external situation is. With complete acceptance, even changes often happen miraculously in the external situation. Yeah, I think acceptance of the situation, uh, which you talk about in Power of Now, and also um, repeatedly in A New Earth, acceptance, non-resistance to the moment, is one of the most important things we can learn. Yes. And that is whether or not you are facing a crisis, whether you're facing someone you've lost, a loved one, or whether you're, you know, in traffic and are a highly sensitive person, non-accepting what is in that moment. Yes. Is the most important. Yes. And you can practice with little things because little things happen throughout the day that people feel irritated about, angry about, are protesting against, and so on or with little things, um, you will have many opportunities to practice. Um, uh, so it's a wonderful spiritual practice. You, so you <laughs> use what you before you wanted to get rid of, you use it as part of your spiritual practice. And then as a byproduct, you also eventually get rid of it. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks so much. OK, thank you. From the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody says they want peace, inner peace and peace on Earth. On page 188, you say peace is really what you want then you will choose peace. And if peace um, mattered to you more than anything else, and if you truly knew yourself to be a spirit rather than a little me, <laughs> you would remain non-reactive and absolutely alert when confronted with challenging people or situations. Yes. Yes. That's the, so there's, you can either be reactive, um, act according to your, the way you've reacted for many year, years, your past mm -hmm. conditioning, or you can become more alert when a challenging situation happens so that you don't internally separate yourself from the situation so that when you completely open yourself to the situation that you bring an alertness to it an alertness of presence so you're facing the situation totally with that state of alert presence mm -hmm. you're not reactive anymore and if something needs to be said or done in the situation the words will suddenly come from that level of consciousness, mm -hmm. from that alert stillness. If you need to do something, then you, the right thing, the right doing will happen. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, instinctively, or, or instinctively is not the right word, intuitively, the right thing, you will do the right thing. So, Because it will be born out of a sense of presence. Out of presence. Or a sense of being, which is another word that we're using. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. And so any... What, whenever you are upset about any situation, there's a, a line in the Course in Miracles that mm -hmm. says, I am never upset That's for the, the reason, reason I, I think. think. Yes. So because when you're upset, you have lost yourself on the external level, what we call the horizontal. But aren't there some things worth upsetting you? I mean, there are injustices in the world and there are horrible things happening all the time in the world that we should be upset about. I wouldn't say that we should be upset about it. Would, it is normal for people to be upset about this, but it is not the most effective way of bringing about change. I got it. You can be upset all day long and nothing, nothing changes. happens. Because people have been upset for years and things don't yes. change. Yes, mm -hmm. people are upset about violence, they're upset about war, continuous war between nations and so mm -hmm. on. It continues to happen. And you cannot, you cannot fight against... Yeah, somebody emailed me today. They said they were upset about 13-year-old girls having to marry so-called ministers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Upset about it, but being upset about it changes nothing. No. So it's more powerful to face a situation 
and see this is how it is and then see if action is possible what is it that can be done got it and then there's no negativity in the action mm -hmm. but if you are resisting if you're complaining about a situation already whatever you do uh, negativity flows into what you do yeah I just got something early, and the reason I'm thinking about this because a friend of mine had lost his brother and was saying that you know he was having such a hard time letting go, and I, what I just had in this moment something clicked for me is that when people do finally are allowed to move on from their grief, it's because they have come to the point of acceptance yes. that their loved one is gone. Yes. And what you're saying is, in any situation, whether it's the loss of a loved one or loss of a position or loss of whatever. Um, that you're faced with acceptance of the situation yes. and beginning to deal with what is going on now, now instead of wondering or worrying about what could have been should have been might have been yes. changes the changes the, the situation and the way you feel about it yes and that your pain and suffering is called cause and stress is caused because you refuse to accept the now yes you're not one with the now got it so tonight we are Skyping with a new study group in West Hollywood, uh, along with Borders, uh, where we've been Skyping in, in Borders in Chicago. Now we've moved to Hollywood. Very good. At the famed Bodhi Tree. Oh, I love that bookstore. I, I was love that there some years. I gave a talk there. Don't you love that bookstore? Yes. I do too. The Bodhi Tree is considered by many to have one of the best book selections in Los Angeles for the mind, body, and spirit. So, hi everybody at Bodhi. Hi. hi. <laughs> God, everybody looks so California-like. <laughs> uh, we can tell we're not in Chicago. Everybody's all bundled up. Uh, I Skyped Tanisha at the Bodhi Tree earlier today on the Oprah Show, and she's back tonight with a question. Hi, Tanisha. Hi, Oprah. How are you? Good to see you. And your question? Yes, my question has to do with reactivity. On um, page 208, uh, uh, totally says, the more reactive, becoming, a, okay, what is reactivity? Becoming addicted to reaction. The more reactive you are, the more entangled you become with form. The more I identify with form, the stronger the ego. My question has to do with, I've always related being reactive to being sensitive. Um, and being sensitive allows me to be very passionate about things, allows me to connect with other people, and be emotionally available to my friends and family. So my question is, how, how can I retain sensitivity and be passionate about things and keep that <laughs> but not um, allow my ego to get stronger? Great, great question, Tunisia. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, reaction may appear to be, to be a sign of sensitivity, but actually reaction is not sensitive. Uh, reaction is a conditioned way of responding to a situation. And you're not, when you, all reaction really comes from the past because it's part of the way in which you have been conditioned uh, and because it, it comes from the past, it is never totally adequate to the present moment. So sensitivity is actually lost when you're reactive. And true sensitivity comes when you are absolutely present in the situation and see th this is how it is. And you totally face the situation as it is. And with that comes enormous sensitivity. And you can, with that comes also intuition. It's only when you internally don't resist a situation, then the intuitive faculties ar arise within you. As long as you internally resist a situation, and reactivity is always some form of resistance, mm -hmm. as long as you internally resist, then the intuitive faculties cannot really come in because you're acting out old conditioning. Intuition comes out of presence, out of the present moment. So bringing presence to a situation, then that means you become absolutely sensitive. And that's also a deeper aliveness and a deeper power than what looks like power and aliveness when you observe somebody reacting. Sometimes it might look very passionate, but really they are acting out their past conditioning. The ego is acting out. That's not true passion. It's the ego wanting this or that from the situation, wanting to manipulate the situation, wanting to get something out of the situation, whatever, but not being truly present. So it's only through presence that the true sensitivity is there. Thank you, Tunisia.
And Thank all you. you. And all you Bodhi people. <laughs> Thank you so much. The Bodhi tree. Love that. Yes. Really, that's great. Um, continuing on with who we are, because I, I know so many people have this as a, as a prominent question for themselves. You say on page 189, nobody can tell you who you are. It would just be another concept, so it would not change you. Who you are requires no belief. In fact, every belief is an obstacle. What does that mean? It means who you are has nothing to do with any thought that you might have about yourself. So does who you are have nothing to do with what you've done? So you've spent your life here doing all this work and working, 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 making money, taking care of your family, doing all the things that people do, and that has nothing to do with you. And then you, at your funeral, they read your, you know, words about you and say, this is who you are? Well, and then there's the gravestone, mm -hmm. and on the gravestone there is the date of birth, and there is a one or two inch dash. Yes. And th then there's the date of your death. And the dash is really all your ambitions and your fears and your drama and your problems. That's what's left on that level. So I'm not saying not to honor the level of form because that's what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do in this life, this horizontal level where we do things, where we have our, our functions and play roles, you honor that level, but realizing there is something more vital, there is something deeper than just that. Okay. Bridget says, Dear Oprah and Eckhart, can you explain the quote on page 192, but nothing you can find out about yourself is you. Nothing you can know about you is you. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm making a difference here between knowing yourself and knowing about yourself. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm mentioned as an example, if you go to a, a conventional psychoanalyst, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, you will spend some years examining uh, the makeup of your conditioning, of your past, your childhood, and so on. You, exa you find out more and more about yourself, things that perhaps you hadn't seen clearly, mm -hmm. about your emotions, about the makeup of your right. thoughts, and so on. And all that is knowing about, it's to do with content. Right. The content of my life and the content of my mind, ultimately, because my life is, I know it only as the content of my mind. So that is knowing about yourself, and you can know thousands of facts about yourself and your history mm -hmm. and still not know who you are, because that knowing has nothing to do with conceptual knowing, with bits of information. It's the deeper knowing. I gave the analogy earlier of the honey. The honey. You can know about the honey. Yes. Or you can taste the honey, because when you taste the honey, the honey becomes you. It merges with that's you. That's right. That's right. In that sense, knowing who you are in a non-conceptual way is being fully who you are, is being in touch with that deeper level of being where that you can only access in the present moment, the vertical dimension. Can I ask, uh, well, if you are reading this book and suddenly become to understand or not reading this book and understand, as you say, many people say, well, I'm a spiritual being, you know, I'm on my spiritual path. Yes. As many people have said, you know, as they're reading all, as I'm reading all of the um, message boards, which I love, by the way, keep them coming. They say, well, I've been on the spiritual path for many years, or I'm a spiritual person. Aren't you just a little step closer thinking you're a spiritual person, or is that another form of your ego, saying, I'm a spiritual person? Well, you have Because to... I've said for years, I recognize I'm spirit. Yes, that is... Come from, come the, come from the greater spirit. So yes. I can use the word, I am consciousness, mm -hmm. come out of the greater consciousness that I call God. Yes. Or spirit that come out of the greater consciousness, spirit that I call God. Yes. So I, I recognize that. I know that intellectually. Yes. So in that sense, you can say intellectually, that is a true statement. Yeah, but I also but the, feel it deeply. The question is whether, and this is, I know that you do, but mm -hmm. any, the question is whether you truly feel that as a reality and a way of finding out how deeply you tr truly know this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. when, how you, you react to situations in your life and how you react to other people in your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's there that you find out whether your belief that you are spirit, 
whether you truly know that or whether it's no more, as I put it, than an idea floating mm -hmm. around in your mind. Mm -hmm. Do you know it in the depths of your being? Mm -hmm. Because then the way in which you deal with situations and people is very different. Correct. I've always believed that I really was God's child, yeah. that I was, you know, come from, and as I've gotten older and could articulate it better, you know, I use other ways of describing it, but I believe that I came from that which is God. Yes and was born of that yes. and so therefore really have no real fears in the world i've always believed everything would be okay yes and no matter what i'm going to be okay yes. because and, of that and you can and that's more than a belief actually. more than a belief you can sense that yeah in some way that it's hard to describe right but you can sense that ultimately there isn't you and god there is a deep place where you and god merge there's mm -hmm. the oneness that. Well, I've just gotten that later in life. Yes. I used to think God was out there. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Eleanor lives in Boston, Massachusetts, <clears throat> and is Skyping us from a friend's house. Hi, Eleanor. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Mr. Tole. Hello. This is such a great experience. I really thank you so much for it. Well, thank you. Your question is? My question is, on page 192, mm -hmm. you say, you may not want to know yourself because you are afraid of what you may find out. Mm hmm and my question is about letting go of your insecurities or what you would call your ego. For many years now, I've been handling, um, so to say, an eating disorder. And it's pretty much been, it's consumed a great part of my identity. That's how I identify myself. And I feel like that causes a great lacking in me. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I do want to let go, but then a great part of me just wants to hold on to this identification of myself. And I guess my question is, what is this next step from awakening to the fact that I should move on and acting upon that? Mm -hmm. That's the deriving your sense of who you are mm -hmm. <clears throat> from certain thoughts or m mental images that you have about yourself. And that's the normal... Uh, identity that people have. They derive their sense of self from certain mental images or thoughts they have about themselves, which they repeat to themselves, which they talk to others about. Yes, this is what Debbie was saying to us earlier from the Netherlands. I'm yes. a very sensitive person, so yes. therefore lots of things overwhelm me. Yes. Yes. And that's already, that's, on one level, that is true, but if you become too identified with a label like that, then that becomes a hindrance in going beyond it. Mm -hmm. That's why you immediately said when she said that, ah, there we have a, a label. label. Mm -hmm. And so there's a similar thing uh, perhaps that happens to you. So it's really finding within yourself something that is more powerful, more genuine, more truly who you are than any image that you have in your mind. And we have to come back here to really the, the essence of this teaching, which is present moment. You have to invite the present moment into your life as frequently as you can. You have to make room for the present moment, because it's only when you make room for the present moment that these images and mental concepts about who you are do not operate. So when you become present, and I've already given hints about how to, little things you can do to become present. At the beginning of our session today, we had this little meditation where we said, be aware of your sense perceptions, touch things, look at things, listen to things without judging, without mm -hmm. labeling. Mm -hmm. Then the alertness rises. The key is here, another word for presence is the alertness. And so you become alert also within. You feel the aliveness of your inner body. Rather than having a mental concept of who you are, you feel the entire energy field, that, that which animates the physical form. And yes. you are in touch with that. Yeah, and Eleanor, uh, what I would say, add to that is, is that you haven't done that enough because once you start to do that, when you get in touch with um, the inner body, when you begin to feel the inner space, 
when you begin to feel the presence and being that is really you, you realize you're bigger than your little self with an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. When you start, and the reason why you're still attached to this idea of having an e eating disorder, because that's as big as you know yourself to be right now. And when you know yourself to be something more, you will choose to be the something more and not this little me that has an eating disorder. That's, that's how I see yes, it. Yes, that's it. That's how I see it. Yes. And that's why you're clinging to it, because you don't know who yeah. you are. Because you don't know who you are. It's very difficult to move beyond that. I mean, I may in my, my mind understand that intellectually that I'm greater than this issue, yeah. but yeah. it's, it's not gonna. The, you're not gonna help yourself through your mind. Right. That's what Eckhart is saying in this whole book, that real healing, real everything, creativity, real joy, real presence and being comes from that space, the inner space of consciousness or presence and being and the reason why you're attached to the idea because that works for you that works for you right now very easy yeah think. that works for you because you like playing small right now and so maybe you're not ready but what he just described for you is exact and it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't mean that no. you know tomorrow you're going to wake up and, and and not have an issue it's slowly bringing more and more consciousness into your daily way of being that allows it's you It's a to... lot of effort, that's for sure. <laughs> and, and I would Thank say you. this, Eleanor, I would say you're worth it. Thank you. I Thank you say... so much for this opportunity. I would say you're worth the effort. Yes. I would say you're Thank worth you. the effort. Thank you. Thank you. I want to move on to abundance. And there was a question I had earlier that you had on, on here about abundance. I love that question. But... Um, there's a lot in chapter seven about abundance mm -hmm. and that we are not the little me that we think we are. You say on page 190, whatever you think the world is withholding from you, you are withholding from the world and you're withholding it because deep down you think you're small and that you have nothing to give. Mm -hmm. um, try this for a couple of weeks and see how it changes your reality. Whatever you think people are withholding from you, um, praise, appreciation, assistance, loving, care, and so on, give it to them. So is abundance, I was looking, do you have that question to put back here, the abundance question that somebody had asked, an email? Um, what's so great about this, I think, is that it's something people can do every day right now, mm -hmm. is to start to give that which you say you most want. Yes. And it starts with recognizing <clears throat> external abundance. That if the act of recognition that there is external abundance, and what that is, we'll see in a second, mm -hmm. is the act of recognition of external abundance already brings out the abundance that is an essential part of your very being. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize abundance without, and what I'm suggesting there is to, is to, to look at, you're walking past a store, but there's a display of fruit, apples, oranges, and you see the abundance and the aliveness that is there. Mm -hmm. You acknowledge it there. Mm -hmm. Abundance doesn't mean that you need to buy many things. You can buy or not buy. Mm -hmm. But it's to, you see the abundance of water, rain falling from the sky. There's an abundance of water. There's mm -hmm. an abundance of aliveness. There's an abundance of joy in the dog that's going past you there. And so to recognize, to see the abundance that surrounds you, even if you're very poor in the eyes of the world, the abundance is always there around you, but you need to recognize it, acknowledge it. And another word for that is gratitude. I know. I was going to say, I, that's why I've kept a gratitude journal for years. Yes. If you keep a gratitude journal, let's say I do this thing, just five things in the day that made you most grateful. What you start to notice is, is that you, there are more things added to your list yes. and you don't even have time to write them all. Yes. And when you start to pay attention to the things, okay? And you also say acknowledging the good that is already in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Yes. And again, many people make that mistake because they believe that there is nothing good in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's absurd. It means they are not present. They are trapped in certain stories in their head which tell them continuously that there is nothing good in my life. And if they only opened their eyes and looked around... And if they smelled the air, saw the sunlight, the, the most abundant thing you can see is the sun. Well, I think the most abundant thing you can have is your breath. 
The breath. Come back to your breath. Beautiful. Yes, yes. Come back to the breath. Of the, so you can be with that and... When you can't think of anything to be grateful for, go to your breath. Breath or yes. the aliveness in your hands mm -hmm. and in your arms to feel that. Well, the email question from uh, Rosanita in Georgia was to ask you to please explain what you mean by abundance comes only to those who already have. Yes. Now, abundance, you need to recognize that as coming from within you. Abundance is not something that external things come to you that make you abundant. Abundant is, is the energy that, that flows out of you, out of the being of who you are, into this world. Mm -hmm. so, so the beginning of, to, you initiate this process by recognizing the abundance it's all around you externally. Outflow determines inflow. And then it suddenly the recognition already draws it out. You I see? was going to say, isn't, the, isn't gratitude uh, in itself an energy field that draws more to you? Isn't yes. it its own vibrational frequency that's right. that draws more to you? Yes. And that, that's what I interpreted you saying. That's it. Is that gratitude is its own energy field. Yes. And that when you acknowledge and are grateful for whatever you have, when yes. you can see and feel the gratitude, experience the gratitude in whatever you have, that changes your vibrational frequency, literally, yes. and allows more to be drawn to you. Yes, it changes your entire reality. It changes the way in which you experience life. Yes, it does. Uh, it changes your world. And so it's if, if that's the only thing people remember, there are many things in this book, but just if they want to change their lives, they're not happy with their lives, bring gratitude into it, which is, of course, connected also to the present moment because it's only here in this moment. What is it in this moment that I can be grateful, be grateful for? for? And then you suddenly say, oh, it's all that. It, there's always, it's miraculous if you truly look around and sense and feel. It's miraculous. The entire universe is miraculous. Yes. And when you are so trapped in your thoughts, that you don't see this anymore, then the entire universe becomes dead to you and there's nothing new that ever arises. You know, I was practicing this this weekend. I was saying uh, to Eckhart before we started that I was under the weather and had an obligation in New Orleans and wasn't able to fulfill that commitment and normally I would have just been beating myself up about it because I've never had to cancel anything before. But I decided to be with the fact that I was sick and I had that one of the happiest days of my life, being sick in bed, because I accepted it and was not fighting the fact that I wasn't well. I thought, I'm going to be with feeling badly, and I'm going to appreciate everything about the day. So every cup of tea that Stedman brought me, I was happy. And uh, happy that I was, you know, I had clean sheets. I mean, and happy that I could open the curtains and there was sun coming through the window. Just, and I just had the most happy time yeah. being sick in bed. Yes. Yeah, so that's what you're talking about. Yes. Being able to be grateful from where you are. Yes, very, yeah. very powerful. Yeah, if I hadn't so, read this book, I might not have been able to do that. <laughs> so it's been, been very helpful to me. Uh, and you and, say, and, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you can even be grateful for things that on the surface don't look so good. Mm -hmm. When you accept what is, you're grateful for whatever, whatever situation arises. Let's say uh, your car breaks down mm -hmm. and you have to change the tire in the middle of the night. And even there, you can say, Okay, um, you, we come to this later in the yes. book. It begins sometimes a so-called negative situation. It begins with uh, not resisting it. Yes. And so... Don't you say in the power of now... I, I just interrupted a thought. Yeah. But don't you say in the power of now that all stress comes from resisting the present moment? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't come from the situation. It yeah. comes from your thoughts about the situation. Because the tire being needing to be changed by itself could not cause you to be stressed. No, there's no. It just is as it is. It is as it is. And if you can see that, then suddenly you move into that, and even there comes gratitude. Yes. <laughs> so your stress is about wanting the moment to be different than what it is. Yes. And that's whether it's a tire, losing your job, losing a loved one. Yes. Okay. And you sum this up, this abundance, by using a quote from Jesus saying, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. That is the truth, so help me. That is just the truth. Yes, it's an amazing, amazing statement. And uh, also somewhere else, Jesus talks about... Uh, 
You must like Jesus. You talk about him a lot. Oh, yes. There, there was a time when I, I was brought up as a Catholic, and then I, for many years I wasn't interested anymore. Mm -hmm. And then after I went through this inner shift, a uh, couple of years afterwards, I happened to pick up the New Testament and I happened to read the Gospels, and mm -hmm. I suddenly saw how deep all this is, these statements. That's right. And it the, became more than doctrine. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so Jesus somewhere else says, I, I want you to have life in its fullness. I want you to have the fullness of life. Mm. And that's, the, that's a beautiful statement. And people sometimes don't realize what he means by the fullness of life because in our civilization particularly, the fullness of life means having as many things as possible. Yes. And of course, I'm, I'm convinced that Jesus was not talking about shopping malls. No. Nope. Because if he was talking about shopping malls, then the kingdom of heaven has already arrived and it's in the shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> so he was not talking about many, many things. That... Eckhart made a joke, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Eckhart made a funny. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about something that is within you. The fullness of life is a dimension within you. And he said, I want you to be in touch with that dimension yeah. within you. And you are absolutely right. If you get nothing else from this book, if you can get that, then your life will change. Yes. Your life will change. Yes. That abundance comes only to those who already have it, page 192. It sounds almost unfair, but of course it isn't. It's a universal law. Both abundance and scarcity are interstates and manifest as your reality. Jesus puts it like this, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he's not talking about things. No. He's talking about your inner state yes. of gratitude yes. for what you already have. Yes. And your life will change. Laura from Baltimore is on the line, has a question for us. Laura? Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for this opportunity. You've both been great spiritual teachers for me, and I'm just so grateful. Thank you. My question is, before reading this book, I was someone who usually suppressed my emotions. And on page 208, you talk about bringing an inner yes to whatever form that the now takes. So now, when I have the emotion of sadness arise, I try to apply this principle. In the past, I would have said no to the emotion and suppressed it. But now I worry that by saying yes to this emotion, it's just the ego tricking me into feeding the pain body. How can I be sure that emoting is not actually strengthening my ego? Right, good question. Mm -hmm. So when you fully allow an emotion, it implies that you are there as the awareness, the witnessing presence, because it's only from that space that you can say, that this is what I feel, and here it is. It's part of the isness of this moment. And if you do that, the emotion cannot rise up into your mind and control your thinking. In other words, it does not become part of ego. It's only if the emotion rises up into your mind and then your mind starts to think along the lines of that particular emotion and thereby feeding more energy to the very same emotion. That means you are strengthening that emotion and it's becoming part of ego. But if you can just look at the emotion and allow it to be, then the emotion is not going to feed on your thoughts anymore. So it's, and then you will actually find when you allow an emotion to be, it subsides fairly quickly. Yes. And it's not part of ego. This practice is going beyond emotion without, without repressing them. You got that, Laura? Yes, thank you so All much. Right. I love that, I love that. Um, you tell, tell us the story of the Zen master on 199, the one who said, is that so? I mean, I think you, you, you have to be a Zen master practically to have that kind of reaction to everything in life. Yes. You know, because when somebody attacks you, you know, that's a thing I still have to work on because I live in a world where people write things that are not true all the time. Yes. Somebody's working on a biography of me now, unauthorized. Is that, so I know it's going to be lots of things in there that are, that are not true. And so... I've gotten better at it, and I know everybody experiences it on one level or another. For me, it's people saying things about me that are not true. Yes. It caused me to, to 
show myself as a small person. The little me comes out. And I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> um, and so this, this Zen master who's able to say when he's being <clears throat> accused of, you know, doing something horrible to this girl, is that so? Who, who can do that? It's a very extreme form of uh, being one with the present moment. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, should I tell the story? Yes, please do. Um, so there was a Zen master. He had, was highly regarded and he was a, a spiritual teacher, had a very good reputation. And one day, uh, neighbors of his came to him and uh, said, our daughter is pregnant and you remember she came to see you about some advice some time ago and she has now confessed to us that you are the father of this baby that's going to be born out to our 17 year old daughter and of course they didn't tell him, t tell him this in the way as i'm telling it to you they were very angry is so this a got, true story i believe it is okay uh, mm -hmm. so there was an enormous anger in mm -hmm. this situation, you can imagine, and the Zen master was listening to them as they were telling them that he had fathered this child. Uh, he was listening in that, that Zen state of uh, open, alert attention like this. Mm -hmm. And then when they had finished their story, you are the father of this child, and uh, he, he said, is that so? Yes, he said, and then we are going to, when the child is born, you are going to look after the baby because you are responsible. Is that so? And so when the baby was born, they brought the child over to him and said, no, you look after the baby, it's not ours, you are responsible. And he accepted the baby and the word got round that he had fathered a child by a 17-year-old girl. He lost his reputation, nobody right. came to see him anymore. Right. It, he was totally indifferent to this because he was only responding to the needs of the present moment so he started looking after the baby <laughs> and so she spent about a year looking after the baby and in the meantime the the mother of the baby grew up a little bit more and uh, suddenly she confessed to her parents that the zen master was not the father she just didn't want to tell them that it was the the, the no. boy who works in the butchers who was the father and of course the parents got extremely upset and they came running to the Zen master and said, she has just told us that you are not the father. He said, is that so? Yes, said, and so can you, we would like our baby back, please. And so he handed the baby over. <laughs> there was always, it's, it's the story it's that- must be in the Zendam kingdom or something. Co continuous, it's the story that shows an extreme example of absolute non-resistance and the good that comes because the baby was being looked after with loving care for a whole year by this Zen master. But why wouldn't a Zen master, okay, because he's a Zen master, <clears throat> is that the level that you are saying that we should be striving? Well, I know no. you're not saying we should do anything. We no. should do whatever we want to do. It's, it is not necessary. That is only to exemplify. Because I uh, would be, it is not true. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or you can say, no, I'm not the father. It's not true. I'm not the father. So you can say it in one way that is very reactive and mm -hmm. uh, that would be the normal way. Yes. To, or you can say it in a way that is free of reaction and nevertheless states the truth. So right. you're still surrendered inside. Yes. You're still accepting that these parents, this is where they are at, this is what they believe. Mm -hmm. And simply you say, this is not the case, I'm not the father. Bottom line is you're saying don't get pulled into the drama. Yes. Don't get pulled into the drama. Yes. State your case, state the facts, without allowing your ego to be pulled into the drama of it. Yes. And then be able to move on. That's right. That's what you're saying. That's it. Okay, we've got uh, Fa is it Fatima on the line from Kuwait. Hello, Fatima? Hello. Hello. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Hi Eckhart. Hi. Nice to see you, or hear you. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go, go ahead with your question. Okay, great. Since we are used to identifying ourselves with what we have and what we do, I would like to ask you, Oprah and Eckhart, to identify yourselves without names or any form of identification so other people can get a better understanding of who they are and what, uh, what you mentioned on page 186. Okay, Eckhart, go right oh, ahead and do that. The sound wasn't so good. I she didn't... was saying, since we're so used, accustomed, 
to identifying ourselves through labels and what yes. we do, yes. she would like for you and I, I would like for you, to uh, <laughs> ident identify yourself without using um, those labels of identification so that, we, so that everybody listening can get a better idea then of how then do you describe yourself. Yes, so we are talking about um, being with another person. When you identify yourself, you identify yes. yourself to another person. Yes. So there's a situation where you meet somebody, perhaps mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. you don't know yet. Yes. And so you can be there as uh, an ego entity, in which case you would immediately explain your achievements or you would immediately explain your sufferings or your diseases that you identify with mm -hmm. or the, the whatever... Sometimes people do it this way, which annoys me. They'll say, what school did you go to? Yes. That's immediately to say whether or not you're in the category. That's that right. I, yeah, what yes. school did you so go to? So people, they, they want to, as the mind, that's what the human mind does, <coughs> they want to be able to classify you. They want to be able to find out where, uh, where they can put you in there. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so they're asking questions about that but you don't need to be drawn into that and realize that as you and this is a very very okay so let's thing. say we 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 didn't know you and you're at a um, gathering where people don't know you yes and I come up and I introduce myself and I say hello I'm Oprah yes and uh, I'm here with uh, a convention and I'm yes um, you know I sold so many pharmaceuticals and I did so this is other I've got three kids I live in Oregon whatever how would you then describe yourself? Well, perhaps I would not use that many words, but m some words might be there. I wouldn't say I am formless spirit and, or anything like that. You wouldn't do that? No. <laughs> Hello, it's, I am <clears throat> formless spirit, I once, I once asked somebody, I, I met somebody at a... I met somebody uh, at a <laughs> reunion, and, yeah. and they knew that I had already written The Power of Now, so uh -huh. I was a spiritual teacher. And so I asked, I asked uh, for some reason, we had a conversation, and I asked, um, how old are you? And he said, I was never born. <laughs> 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 he really wanted to teach me a lesson. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> no, so you can be quite normal in your interaction but more important is on a sensing level you are there as a field of aware presence and in an interaction with another human being what matters is not so much the words that are being said there's a deeper le level of the awareness that arises the field I call it the mm -hmm. field of awareness that arises between two human beings mm -hmm. the field of presence that arises when those two human beings or even just one of them is not totally identified with their thinking mind and the ego. Mm. Then I can be there as a conscious presence. Right now, as I sit here, I can. I'm here as a conscious presence. So not you wouldn't say I'm 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 Eckhart, formless spirit. You would no. just say I'm Eckhart. Eckhart. I'm Eckhart. Yes. And if they say, well, hey, what do, what do you do? Yes. Then I give a conventional answer. I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And then they ask, what do you write about? Uh, and then depending on, I, I kind of sense where they are at, mm -hmm. whether it's a genuine question and they truly want to know, or whether it's a question when I come, when I, when I come into the States from Canada every week, they ask me, what do you do? And then I say, I'm a writer. And then they ask, what do you write about? And then I'm not going to give a deep answer because they don't want a deep answer. Right. I'm so They're not really interested. No. 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 Yeah. So I give conventional answers. Mm -hmm. And yet, in every human interaction, even such an interaction as this, uh, um, when the immigration, always what is, can, you need to be able to sense that there is a presence underneath whatever you're saying. That's right. Feel your own presence underneath it. And that's what we're going to be talking about next week is to be able to bring, that is our role in this lifetime, yes. is to bring that sense of presence, who you really are, not the small little self that is, a, you know, yeah. has eating disorders or shops too much or all the other things that we define as in our horizontal lives yes. as ourselves. But to bring that presence into your active life. That's right. Yes. yes. That is our goal. Yes. 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 All right. Let's talk about the joy of being. 
Unhappiness or negativity is a disease on our planet. What pollution is on the outer level is negativity. Page 213, everybody. What pollution is on the outer level is negativity on the inner. It is everywhere, not in just places where people don't have enough. I love this. But even more so where they have more than enough. The affluent world is even more deeply identified with form, more lost in content, more trapped in ego. Yes. I thought that was interesting. Yes. Uh, sometimes you see, you know, when you visit certain places where people have relatively little, often you see <clears throat> more happy faces and radiant That's faces right. than uh, in our rich society. Mm -hmm. So uh, the passage is about negativity, mm -hmm. and uh, there's an enormous amount of negativity in the collective energy field of our planet, but it is generated by individuals. So it's everybody's task to be alert so that when negativity arises within them, they recognize it mm -hmm. and then ask themselves whether that is what they choose. Mm. When you recognize it, you can be there as the presence and you have a choice. Is, re is negativity ever the optimum way of dealing with any situation? And if you look closely, you'll see it never is mm -hmm. a good way of dealing with any situation. Okay, you say on page 214, the joy of being, which is the only true happiness, cannot come to you through any form, possession, achievement, person, or event. And that means people who think that I'm with you and I love you and you're going to bring me joy cannot. Mm -hmm. Yes, you either are joy or you're not. Yes. Okay, through anything that happens, that joy cannot come to you ever. It emanates from the formless dimension within you, from consciousness itself, and thus is one with who you are. Yes, it comes from within and not from without. People conventionally expect it to come to them from without, and then it usually doesn't, because it's, you need to discover it in yourself first. And this is why when you try to manifest things in your life, uh, which is a fine thing to do. Mm -hmm. But the vital question is, have you, first of all, already come to that place of fullness and joy within yourself mm -hmm. right now? Have you found the right relationship with the present moment? Mm -hmm. If you haven't, because that's where it resides. It's only by having a right relationship with the present moment that the joy can arise from within you. You talk about that on 210 when you say to awaken within the dream is our purpose now. When we are awake within the dream, the ego-created earth drama comes to an end and a more benign and wondrous dream arises, this new earth. Also, let's go to page 215, everybody. Um, the top of 215, um, you talk about a powerful spiritual practice is consciously to allow the diminishment of ego because what we've been learning through A New Earth is that most of us have, until reading this book, believed we were our egos, believed we were, as Eckhart has said earlier in tonight, we believe we were our horizontal life without the vertical. We believe we were our past. We believe we are what we're going to do and what we have done. And the, <clears throat> the now was always just a sort of means to an end. Yes. Okay. So you say a powerful spiritual practice is consciously to allow the diminishment of ego when it happens without attempting to restore the ego. I recommend that you experiment with this from time to time. For example, when someone criticizes you, blames you, or calls you names, I got to tell you, it's hard to say, is that so? <laughs> uh, instead, <laughs> instead of immediately retaliating or defending yourself, do nothing. Allow the self-image to remain diminished and become alert to what that feels like deep inside <clears throat> you. So what's that supposed to do for us? Now, <laughs> it's not, uh, I'm not saying in each case you should do that. I experiment with this from time to time, mm -hmm. when, particularly when nothing depends on that situation. So you don't have to explain right. something so that a, a situation can be put right mm -hmm. or whatever. Somebody just calls you... Um, we talked about it the other day. Somebody cut you <coughs> off in traffic? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so that would be a good practice, but it's totally pointless to retaliate. Yes. It makes no sense whatsoever. 
So, but the retaliation when somebody calls you names in traffic or whatever... Or does something to upset you. Yes. Uh, Try doing nothing. Yes. The retaliation is automatic and unconscious because mm -hmm. it comes from the ego. Because when somebody calls you stupid, for example, right. or somebody calls you idiot, it, the, it injures the ego. It hurts the ego tremendously. And it's the ego that's being injured, not you. Not you. It's nothing because deep down you know that it's not you. It's just the ego image of who I think I am. Deep down you, well, deep down you know it's not you, but if you are a person who lives unconsciously, then you if you live out of your ego, you think it's you. Yes. Yes. And immediately the ego will go into what I call instant self-repair mechanism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this instant self-repair mechanism, which is totally unconscious... Says, I am not stupid. Well, it, no, it will call the other person something worse than stupid. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and by that, the ego believes that it has repaired itself. And on that level, it has. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So th this person has taken something away from you, this, the imaginary ego, and yes. then you take something away from that other person. This is how the egos work. And then, of course, it's probably not the end, because the other person is going to retaliate again. Right. And now <laughs> and you're in it. The whole madness now starts. You're in the drama. Yes. So, so this is a good example where you can practice being non-reactive. So when somebody calls you something, remain totally... And you say when that happens, just do it for a few seconds. It may feel uncomfortable, as it will, just yes. to keep your mouth shut. I've had that this week, just to keep your mouth shut. Yes. It's hard. Uh, it feels like you've shrunk in size for it momentarily. Then you may sense an inner spaciousness that feels intensely alive. You haven't been diminished at all. In fact, you have expanded. What do you mean by that? Yes. So somebody, you are not, what you are not defending is your, your egoic identity, the image identity. And that re suddenly, that has become diminished by somebody call, by calling you stupid, for example. <laughs> this entity has become diminished. You don't resist the diminishment, so it has become smaller, so to speak. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And therefore, suddenly, something that is deeper than that can suddenly come through the, because the, the ego has shrunk, shrunk in size. I got it. No, the ego doesn't like that. That's but right. It's a wonderful experiment when you allow the ego to shrink, and then suddenly you feel there is a power underneath that that's far greater than the ego. And it shrinks every time you become aware of yes, it. Yes, yes. Even when you don't do what you're supposed to do? Yes. Okay. Yes. I like this question from uh, Suhad in uh, Clifton, New Jersey. How can we use the high quality no that you talk about on page 216 in our lives? Can you please provide us with some real life examples? 216, high quality no. <clears throat> what did you mean by high quality no? Uh, in some cases, um, sometimes people misunderstand when I say, say yes to the present moment. Mm -hmm. They believe then. Whenever somebody asks you something, You're supposed to you say have to yes say or... yes. Yeah. No, when I say say yes to the present moment, it's to do with an inner, an inner state of consciousness yes. where it is open to what is, that Got does it. not resist what is. It does not necessarily mean that every time somebody asks you something, mm -hmm. you say yes. So let's say a person comes to you, you've uh, known him, you've already lent him money five times, He's never returned it. Or two. Two's enough. Two is enough. <laughs> and so he says, I need another $500 now. And then you perhaps, this may be a good opportunity and occasion where you can use a high-quality no, no that is not reactive and does not make that person wrong and say, so becomes angry and or shouts at him and so you, you are dishonest, you haven't returned my money and I'm not giving you a penny more. Well, this is a low-quality no. <laughs> Low quality. <laughs> a high quality no is to say... Who do you think you are? All that all kind that of stuff. stories in order to stories. make wrong. Yes, I've given you money so many times before. Yes, and then you make yourself into a victim. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. It's all part of... Or make of... yourself into the great person who's yes. been so benevolent. Yes, yes, whatever the egoic game is. Mm -hmm. So the high quality no is to, to simply state, well, I've already given you that money twice and you haven't returned it yet, so... I won't give you any more. You have to return my money first. I'm mm -hmm. not going to give you... Can you sense that there's no negativity? You simply state clearly, this is what I'm going to do or not do. I won't give you any more because you haven't returned that. Yeah. And yeah. That happened to me recently. Somebody was asking me money and just said, no, I won't do that. Yeah. And no emotion attached to it at all. Yeah. All right. I just want to say here that um, the... 
I, I love this on 220. What you see, hear, feel, touch, or think about is only one half of reality, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It is form. In the teaching of Jesus, it's simply called the world, and the other dimension is the kingdom of heaven or eternal life. Then toward the bottom of the page, <clears throat> second to last, pa last paragraph, you say, the collective disease of humanity is that people are so engrossed in what happens, so hypnotized by the world of fluctuating forms, so absorbed in the content of their lives, they have forgotten the essence, that which is beyond content, beyond form, beyond thought. They're so consumed by time that they have forgotten eternity, which is their origin, their home, their destiny. Eternity is the living reality of who you are. And that's what I felt on that mountain that day. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And you can actually sense that, although that's the wonderful thing when you can be surrounded by the stillness. Yeah. But the amazing thing is you can actually sense that even in the midst of chaos, mm -hmm. even in the midst of noise, I have felt also what you describe, I've also all very often felt that in nature. Mm -hmm. But I have also felt that extreme peace in situations where one wouldn't expect it. I felt it in the middle of London, in busy streets walking around, especially after I went through this shift. Uh, before before I, I went through the shift, I was always anxious and fearful, and I couldn't stand the, the traffic and the noise. And suddenly I was able to just walk along Piccadilly Circus and be totally at peace as if I were on a mountaintop inside. Mm -hmm. So when you... Mountaintop inside. Inside, yeah. And that's what presence is, is it not? Yes. Presence is being on the mountaintop inside. Yes, yes. Yeah. You have, that stillness is always there in you as the essence of who you are. And when we call it stillness, we are already limited because it's so vast, you cannot describe it with one word. Right. So whatever word you use is already a limitation. But words are limited, of course, because words refer to tangible things, mm -hmm. but not to the inner reality. Mm -hmm. So before we say goodbye, let's sum up what we've covered in this class. Knowing who you really are means knowing. Yes, knowing at a level beyond the level of concepts. Knowing yourself ultimately is being yourself fully. Being in touch with being, the being that you are to sense the I am that is the essence of your identity when you remove all the identifications that usually you say after you say I am you say what you are mm -hmm. but if you say I am and add nothing to it that is a good practice it can get you in touch with the essence I am not this I am not that I am as a simple meditation Mm -hmm. Repeat the words, I am, to yourself. It's so powerful. And, I, I started to do that. It is so yes. powerful when and, you do And that. don't fill in the blank after yeah. the words. Yeah. Very powerful. Another similar one is, who am I? It's a question, but don't look to the mind for an answer. In fact, don't look for any answer, especially not on the level of mind. Who am I? And then allow the stillness to be there after the question. Don't look for an answer. And in not looking for an answer, there's the answer, but it's not, not a mental concept, mm. as of sensing, wow. feeling. I am. Yes, I am. And just be with that. Yes. Yes. And so for whether it's an addiction or an eating disorder or, or nothing, you think you have a really wonderful life, but you are connected to all the things in your life, to the content of your life, yes. just being able to sit with yourself and to say those words to yourself, I am. It's wonderfully liberating. And to recognize them, yes. to know them. Yes. Like honey. Yes. To know them. That's like right. Honey. Thank and you again. Thank you. I want to thank you all for joining us. The seventh class will be available on demand tomorrow, finding uh, who you truly are, uh, for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our classes, of course, you know this by now. You can do that tomorrow at Oprah.com and at iTunes. It's free because of the generous support of uh, people like Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins. This week, update your workbook and get ready for our next class on Chapter 8. It's the discovery of inner space. I love this. It's my next favorite chapter. I think 7, 8, and 9 are really the essence of the, of the book. Inner space is about allowing the inner space of your life to connect to the outer purpose of your life. 
the inner and outer purposes of your life. Right? That's right. Love it. Again, we thank you. This was a long chapter, lots to cover. I would say to everybody, I mean, I was sick in bed this weekend and read it again for the third time. Every time I read it, I go a little deeper and um, awaken a little more. So this is one you need to be with for a while, over and and over. And after you've read it once, you don't need to read uh, long pages. Just read sometimes half a page is enough. Yes. One page. What I do is I go back and read. This is what I would do. Uh, As you're using your highlighters, just go back and read what you've highlighted and just Mm -hmm. be with that. Because the things that you highlight highlight are usually things that resonate with you more deeply. It's it's a good way of, of reviewing it. And every time you come back to it, you know, two weeks from now, you'll get something that you didn't get the first oh, yes, time. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eckhart. Thanks, everybody. everybody, welcome to class number eight of our New Earth web series with author Eckhart Tolle. Eight means we only have two more to go. Tell all your friends. I'm going to miss it. Me too. Yeah, I'm going to miss it. As we head into these final chapters, it's uh, really gratifying to hear from so many of you who feel that your commitment to this work is making a difference in your lives. I know I feel that way, and I'd like to, again, thank all of the students from around the world who are watching, who are willing to awaken to the deeper meaning of your lives. Um, Last week, one of the things uh, that Eckhart said that really struck me, uh, you said that the opposite of death is not life. The opposite of death is birth. Life has no opposite. So I think that's a good place to begin our moment of silence. Can we go into silence? Life has no opposite. Life has no opposite. And perhaps uh, as we go into the silence to feel yourself to be life rather than a person. A person uh, is here only for a few years, but you are basically life experiencing itself temporarily as this person. As this person, this personality, this ego. But underlying it, you are life that is eternal. And so when you go into stillness, it's easy to sense that underneath the personality, there is an aliveness, there is a presence, there is a consciousness that is timeless and that's the life beyond the form of life that you are so and that's why it has no opposite that's right because it's forever yes and all the opposites only exist in the world of form in the world of form i get that yeah Mm -hmm. so as we go into the silence into the stillness let's see if we can just feel that in the background you are live or rather to say, I am life. I am life. Eternal, timeless. So we go into the stillness now and get in touch with that. Eternal life. How wonderful, how wonderful to be able to get into touch with that. That's the inner space that you're talking about in uh, chapter eight, which is all about the discovery of inner space. That's what we're discussing tonight. Let's start with an overview of what this chapter is about. What is inner space, what you just described? Uh, I don't remember when this term first came to me. It must have been during a talk. I never, I don't believe I used the term in the power of now. Mm -hmm. I realized that most people, uh, most people's uh, mind is full of stuff, full of one thought after another, full of continuously arising thoughts, mm-hmm. emotions, and the external life is full of 
things that need doing, mm -hmm. one thing after another, one thing after another. So uh, I observe that in many people's lives, there seems to be no space. There's only one thing after another, one thought after another, one thing to do after another, one thing to be worried about after another. Mm -hmm. So the, I noticed this absence of space in human beings. And really, that inner space or spaciousness is what we could also call the stillness. But mm -hmm. uh, I use different terms because uh, any one term limits it. When we talk about stillness, yes, it is stillness, but it's much vaster than just stillness. Right. And vaster than being still. Yes. 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 So it's realizing that within you, there's not only objects in your consciousness that continuously arise in your consciousness as sense perceptions. You experience mm -hmm. things, sense mm -hmm. perceptions arise continuously and each sense perception becomes an object in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then thoughts arise continuously and every thought becomes also an object that arises in your consciousness. Now, and this is what most people's lives consist of, continuously objects arising in consciousness and I call that object consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that is what most people know, and they also know themselves as an object in their consciousness. They have an image of who they are. They have right. certain opinions mm -hmm. about who they are. And so you become an object to yourself, and that is the ego. So most, a mental object, you make yourself into a mental object, and then you have a relationship with yourself as a mental object. It's a little bit insane, right? but it's normal. <laughs> so. Uh, now, the, the incredible realization, and this is where the spiritual dimension starts, there is no spiritual dimension in object consciousness. consciousness. You can have all kinds of interesting sounding or even religious sounding doctrines. Mm -hmm. If there is no space in you, spaciousness, where suddenly a gap arises in between thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's no spaciousness, then you haven't touched yet the spiritual dimension. And this book, I believe, is helping many people to find that space within. You say on page 227, object consciousness needs to be balanced by space consciousness for sanity to return to our planet and for humanity to fulfill its destiny. The arising of space consciousness is the next stage in the evolution of humanity. Space consciousness, consciousness means that in addition to being conscious of things, which always comes down to sense perceptions, thoughts and emotions, there is an understand, undercurrent of awareness. Awareness implies that you are not only conscious of things, but you're also conscious of being conscious. Yes. That's what you're talking about. Yes, and that's an amazing thing at first, if you just listen to, to being conscious, being conscious, the mind says, what does that mean? You can only, you have to experience what that is to know what it means. Mm -hmm. So to be conscious of being conscious for example, you can do it by looking at something, just if people who haven't had a taste of this yet. Yes. Uh, for example, you look at a flower mm -hmm. and you f you, uh, you're conscious of the, the image, the, what you see, the sense perception. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, can you also be conscious of yourself as the perceiving presence, without which there would be no perception? Correct. And so, and that is the consciousness. So while you look at a flower, I'm saying flower because mm -hmm. natural things can get, in, get you in touch with that dimension more easily. Mm -hmm. While you look at a flower, can you sense yourself as the presence that is looking, that is making the perception possible? And then you have two dimensions. You are conscious of being conscious mm -hmm. and you are conscious of what you are looking at. You live in two worlds at the same time. And that brings in, that means in the background of your life, there is suddenly a vast but intensely alive peace. You're very, because being conscious of being conscious is very peaceful. That's where the true inner peace arises. So, and that if you don't have that in your life, if you're not able to find that space between the thinking and the perception, 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 you're not. Then, then you lose yourself in, in things. In things, and you in the lose world. yourself in the world, yeah. and you lose yourself in your own mind. 
You mm -hmm. continuously get drawn into every thought that arises. Yeah, well, one of the things that you, you, I know you met uh, Dr. Jill Boat Taylor today. Yes. And uh, I interviewed her on uh, my radio show, The Soul Series, on XM Radio. And for those of you who have been enjoying um, our webcast with Eckhart Tolle, the Monday following our final webcast, I will have an interview with her uh, on the web. Dr. Jill Boat Taylor is a brain scientist who had had a stroke. Uh, several years ago and during the process of having the stroke in the middle of having the stroke she uh, lost her left uh, the left hemisphere of the brain which was language and the ego and all of that but the right hemisphere remained conscious yes. and she was aware that she had lost the ego and this sense of losing your mind that you have been talking to us about happened to her was thrust upon her through the stroke yes yeah so I believe what happened to her was mm -hmm. what we are talking about she became conscious of consciousness she herself. became conscious of consciousness yeah through the stroke yes and really that's uh, when we say that but we express it in language and language always brings in a kind of duality when mm -hmm. when I say I become I'm conscious of consciousness it sounds as if I were separate from consciousness right this is because of the structure of language. In reality, what's happening is that consciousness, is, which is what I am, it, everyone is conscious in That's essence. Right. Consciousness is becoming conscious of itself. And you don't know that until, uh, and that's why that tape is going around the web of Dr. Jill Bo Taylor. You don't know that until you can quiet the mind enough to know that you are not all of these thoughts that you have in your head. You are not your thoughts, but you are life itself. Yes. That is what she also says yes. in, 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 in her book and, and in her lectures. Yes. Yes. That's a wonderful realization just when it comes to a person for the first time. It's just, whoa. Whoa. That's, uh, and that frees you from a lot of things that before were so heavy. Such a, the world can become such a burden to people and your own mind can become such a burden. It creates so much suffering in people's lives. The, um, if people had to live with somebody who inflicts all that negativity on them that, that they inflict on themselves through their own mind, mm -hmm. they would have left that person a long time ago. But you can't leave your mind. You can only go beyond it. And so being able to be conscious of your consciousness or aware of yourself as a perceiving entity or perceiving presence is really what the true awakening is about. Yes. 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 Yes, that's the awakening to who you are beyond the external appearance. And that is what we, we're doing when we're angry and you, you see your ego flare up and all of that is to be able to step back and perceive yourself as the consciousness observing yourself as the angry person. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's a, in the background. The space in between that. That's right. And so this, the inner space you're talking about is the space between I am angry, I'm, you know, saying all of these things, and then there is, a, there is the other self that is observing that. Yes. Uh, now, if you're angry and if the, the, the presence can be there in the background, right. that, that means there's already, you're already very present because it's not easy to remain present when there's anger because anger has an enormous power. Right. So, but if you're observing it, then you can say, I'm out of control. You know, yes, people have done that. Yes. You can say to yourself, I'm out of control. I need to calm down. Yes. yes. But if you know that you're out of control, you're not completely out of control. That's right. That's right. And, That's right. Uh, so, and if, so if you know that you are, be, have been taken over by anger, you haven't been completely taken over because there's a knowing in the background. Yeah. And I think a lot of parents have experienced this, you know, when your kids do something and it's so upsetting to you and you know in that moment I should not try to discipline them because I'm too angry to discipline yes. them. Yes. That part of you that knows that you're too angry to discipline them is the space that you're talking yes. about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got that. And so and that's uh, if you don't have that space then you're completely controlled then, by the anger, you that's become right. the anger. That's right. That thing that allows you to step back is what you're talking about. I got it. 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 That part of you that says I can step back and see I'm acting a fool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you if you know that you are acting a fool, then it's not. There is a sanity there that's observing yeah. the insanity. Uh huh. And if you know that you are. But sometimes people know they're acting a fool, and they just keep on acting a fool. 
Yes, that's yeah. possible too. Yeah. For a while, it can happen that the old, certain old behavior patterns. But generally, if you still... know, you can pull yourself back. Yes, yes. Um, and that which knows is the inner space that you're talking about. Yes. There was a film, The a Beautiful Mind, some years ago yes, yes, yes. about the scientist. With Russell Crowe. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, he became delusional, uh, this scientist, uh, completely absorbed by his mind and had all kinds of delusions. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the middle of the film, he suddenly realizes that these are delusions and he realizes that he's insane. Mm -hmm. And also the viewer at that moment realizes it's so well done because until that point, even the viewer doesn't know He's not that. quite sure, yes. And, and at that moment, the healing begins because with the realization that I am insane, the sanity has arisen. The observing presence is there. The observing presence. And after that, he could function again. Is observing presence and inner space the same thing? Yes, but observing should not be confused with judging. I got it. So there's no judgment. It's a, it's a clear, it's like a mirror. It's That's like right. a mirror showing you what's there. Mm -hmm. So there are literally two dimensions. There is the personality acting out of, you know, form yes. and perceptions and all of that. And then there is the observer of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the observer is not judging what is being observed. If the observer begins is. to judge, then it's the mind that has come back in. Okay. It just is. Mm -hmm. And the observer is timeless, and whatever the observer is observing, the behavior, mm -hmm. the thinking, is conditioned by the past. Mm. So you're bringing a, the timeless dimension into this world of mm -hmm. time. Yes. And uh, those of you who are <clears throat> reading uh, Jill Bo, Dr. Jill Bo Taylor's uh, book, uh, stroke of insight where she she she, she said to me today because she's been following our classes and she was saying you know what Eckhart calls consciousness I call right brain yes yeah right brain versus left yes. left brain yes. left brain is gone the right brain is the higher consciousness yes yes That's right. so as I've said before I love the message boards on uh, Oprah.com and I saw a posting that I wanted to share with everyone it's from someone who calls themselves student 99 it said, I've seen many, many posts by concerned Christians. Uh, is student 99 here? I thought we had him. I, I heard he was on Skype. Well, I don't mean here, here, Dean. I know he's not in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Bring up student 99. Um, so student 99, is that you? Yeah. Hi, on Skype. I love this email. I love the I love the fact that you have a face and a body and everything. Because you just were an entity on the web to me. Posted by Student99 that says, I have seen many posts by concerned Christians wondering whether this book is a threat to their faith. Uh, and you said, as a Christian, you don't think it is, and here is why. You want to tell us why? Because I, I thought this was such a beautiful email, and you know I've gotten some flack from um, some Christians. Uh, I've even been called the Antichrist, which <laughs> I'm kind of amused by that, uh, for introducing this book to the world. So I was interested in hearing what you had to say. Student 99, whose name is really Alan from Eugene, Oregon. Hi, Alan. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hello. Hi. You well, said, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, you go ahead. So someone let you tell me what you said in the email. Well, basically, um, you know, I observed some people that were posting that were in a lot of distress and because they felt that the book uh, was an attack on their faith. Uh, many of them had not read the book. Yeah, and I so that. I wanted to just provide a little bit of perspective on that. Uh, from my perspective, I felt like Eckhart's book allowed me to, uh, to do more than just quote what Jesus said and to actually understand the depth of what he was teaching and be able to practice what he taught rather than just quote what he taught. Well, let me read so, what you said specifically, because I thought you said it so beautifully here. Most Christians understand the concepts from the Bible of surrendering their lives to God and living a loving life and living in the peace that passes understanding. Christians can quote Jesus as saying, such as, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, or judge not that you be not judged, or you must die to live, or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Unfortunately, not all Christians have succeeded in following up the talk with the walk. This is because these quotes point to an internal transformation, which some Christians have not yet fully experienced. 
That is why I strongly recommend this book you said, Alan. It provides for very powerful tools for being able to successfully follow Jesus' teachings rather than just quoting them. The book doesn't ask anyone to change their religion of choice, but does help tremendously in successfully applying faith. In a nutshell, you say, Alan, the book shows how to apply forgiveness to every person and every situation. It shows how to shine the light of awareness on our unconscious hatred of this moment and thereby overcome the cares of this world. If you want to go deeper than knowing about God at the level of thoughts and experience God at the level of knowing, I welcome you to join us in reading A New Earth. Blessings from Student 99. Isn't that yes. well said, Eckhart? Oh, yes, wonderful. Thank you. Let's Alan, thank you for that. Sure. And, and, you know, I had left the church, and I ended up being able to return to church because of uh, understanding how to apply the concepts in this book. Really? Well, that's good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I don't read all the negative stuff, though, because it doesn't help me. So I'm only, no, I, I'm only, you know, I'm only interested in speaking to people who want to hear what we have to say. And if you don't agree with what I'm saying, that's really okay. I bless everybody in their path, whatever that is. Yes. Yeah. And I've had letters from some priests who found and nuns and Buddhist monks, and they all they found the book very helpful. They mm -hmm. went more deeply into their own tradition, mm -hmm. because when you go deep enough into your own tradition. Eventually, every, all traditions, eventually you end up in the same place, the same realization. Mm -hmm. On the surface, the traditions are different. Yeah. There's only one God at the center. Right. Mm -hmm. There is only one God. I believe that. The source of all things, all creation. Yes. So Peter is Skyping us from his dining room in Phoenix, Arizona. I love to see where people are. Is that a green dining? Is that green? Yes, it is. That's my favorite color. My gosh, that's oh. such a lovely color. Hi. Uh, Peter uh, we're, is Skyping us from his dining room in Phoenix, where he and a group of friends gather every Monday night to watch our live webcasts. I think that's so great. I hear you adopted a dog and named it Oprah. Is that true? <laughs> Come on, Oprah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see her. Uh, she came to us the first night of the webcast. Um, you know, the, the system went down, so it crashed. So we had all the people gathered. Uh -huh. And she came into my life that night. Wow. Oh, and, uh, oh what a beauty pie. <laughs> I, she's holding up so the she's name. A, she's my That's so great. That's really great. You, you say you were addicted to smoking for 30 years, but quit 11 weeks ago after reading A New Earth. How, 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 this ties into your question, correct? Exactly. Um, we started our group four weeks before the um, actual web class, and we were reading the chapter on, on number eight. So I applied the techniques to quitting smoking, and with about five minutes of work and about, you know, about three hours' time, I had completely stopped. No urges, no more cravings, nothing. No willpower, anything like that. It was so easy. It was amazing. What, did, what is it that you applied? Um, becoming conscious of the feelings. Uh -huh. uh, I had run out of the cigarettes, and I thought I had to go to the store. But when the craving came, I said, okay, let's be with the craving. Let's feel it. What does it actually feel like? Usually we just react. And I actually sat there and closed my eyes and felt it, and it started to dissolve, and it went away. And about two or three hours later, another craving came, and I did the same thing, and this time the, the feeling went away even faster. And then finally, when it came back about a third time, when I put my mind to it, it just completely disappeared. Wow. Gone. never came back. So were you also doing, I think Eckhart suggests in the addiction uh, section, take, taking deep breaths sometimes when you feel like you need the craving for whether it's cigarettes or food or whatever, to, to take the three deep breaths and see what happens if, it, if the feeling dissipates? Did you do that? Yes, I did. I took the breaths to basically uh, create stillness, to become calm. So I took long deep breaths and just sort of calmed down and then just started to feel the feelings and watch, and watch the thoughts. And I've, you know, I've tried to quit you know, hundreds of times, and sometimes a couple of months successfully, but there was always willpower involved. There was always a craving still there. There was always that, you know, if I just had one, that was always still in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. That's no longer there. I can go out with my friends on a Friday night, and they can all be smoking, and I won't even, I only want to look at one. What in the world happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> it was miraculous. Yes, that's great. Yeah. And have yeah. you been able to apply the the teachings from the book in other areas of your life. I mean, for myself, I've just found that being able to go back to my breath in the middle of the day when things get crazier 
I mean, something Eckhart said, I think, on one of the beginning classes about one complete full breath is a meditation. Mm. Well, that's where the question one comes, because breath. I do have other one issues. One conscious breath is a meditation. Uh, earlier in the book, uh, in the chapter, he talks about going below thought. Yes. And he described my situation like, exactly like he's, like he's here. Um, we talk about um, you know, alcohol, using food and TV to, to go below thoughts, sort of to numb the senses, numb your thoughts, and just sort of go into uh, trance, if you will. And I do that a lot. And I've been trying to break away from that by using the techniques and, I, and have not had the same success. And you also say, don't make it a problem. But I think I made it a problem, and I want to kind of break from that. So you're, 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 are you, is, you're, you're asking a question about how to use this more yeah. forcefully or whatever to, yeah. to, for alcohol? Yeah, with alcohol especially and, and food. You know, I tend to overeat when I'm tired and, I'm, and I just want to relax. Food, alcohol, TV tend to be the, the things I use. And that, that brings you below thought when, when we're trying to be above thought. Right. And when I try and do that, it's, I'm not as successful. I, I get very frustrated. Okay, what do you want to say, Eckhart? Well, it's uh, your wonderful success story as far as the smoking is concerned mm -hmm. and bringing, uh, experiencing how awareness can dissolve old patterns. In some cases, instantly, uh, and in other cases, it takes more time for awareness to dissolve the old pattern, and awareness has to be brought to the pattern when it arises repeatedly. And it does not mean that every time awareness meets the pattern, that uh, awareness is going to win. Um, win it may not be the right word, because awareness, of course, is not never fighting anything. Awareness mm. is just there as the, the conscious presence. But so bringing conscious presence, for example, into the urge to have a drink, uh, not that one or two drinks are a problem, but if drinking is uh, uh, drags you down, drags you down to a, a below thinking, mm -hmm. then, of course, uh, it is helpful to bring presence into the urge when it arises, in the same way that you did when you uh, felt the urge c come upon you to smoke. Mm -hmm. So have you practiced that? Have you been able to feel the urge to drink and then bring awareness to that? And what happened? Yes, I have, and it's, it, it, it kind of postpones it. Eventually, I kind of break down. Yes, I believe I mentioned in the book that uh, bring awareness to it, and it may well happen that the uh, desire, the urge, is still there after 10 minutes of awareness. Mm -hmm. I believe I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that uh, uh, you have lost. It means that the, the desire is very strong, and at that point, perhaps you will have a drink. Mm -hmm. And then when it happens again, you bring awareness to it again. Eventually, something will happen to the pattern. Uh, it's, uh, it's very rare to have an instant success as you did with smoking. It does happen in some cases. But mm -hmm. bring awareness to old patterns, whatever it is, addictive patterns, behavior patterns. Bring awareness, and eventually they cannot coexist for that long. So it's a continuing practice. But don't expect perfection. Don't expect you to be the perfect human being who never right. touches a drink again or whatever. Uh, as I said to Oprah, I enjoy a drink occasionally. And so. I said, woo -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> So what are you saying also, and you, you, you said this in the beginning, Peter, don't judge it. And as you begin to practice, what I hear you saying yes. is, this miracle that you experience with cigarettes is just that, because it rarely happens that you start this one time and it works immediately. What you're saying is the more you apply the practice of bringing consciousness to this desire or craving, to this yes. craving, that it will, it will gradually lessen. Yes. It will lessen. It will, it yes. will weaken. It yes. will weaken. Yes. Uh, you can also apply it to other things, like the uh, many people are addicted to television. They, uh, one day without watching TV would be dreadful for them. Yeah. So uh, it, you could, pra uh, as a practice, like a spiritual practice, you could say, one day a week, I'll see what happens if I don't watch television. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, don't do it when the Oprah show is on. Thank you for that. <laughs> One day a week, I'll practice and then observe inside yourself what it feels like, what the 
the need to switch on, the need to be entertained, the need to be stimulated, to absorb what's on the screen. Mm -hmm. So one day practice. Thank you so much, Peter. Are those are friends behind you? Yes, that might be my hi, neighbor. Hi. hi. <laughs> Peter, move out of the way so we can see them, so we can say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, everybody. Hi, 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 the Peter's group. That's so great there in Phoenix. <laughs> Yay, guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, all the best to Oprah, you know. <laughs> okay. Oprah is very cute. Oprah is very cute. <laughs> Uh, we're talking about the dog. <laughs> okay, we've got Eric on the line calling from uh, Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. Eric, what's your question? Hi, over. Hi, Eckhart. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, my question is um, in reference to page 224 when Eckhart writes the phrase, this too shall pass. Oh, yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah and I, f I feel it's a real powerful phrase that uh, brings a person into the present moment. And yes. it's also used as a slogan in 12-step recovery programs. And um, when someone's been living very much in the ego and form surrenders and enters a 12-step program, um, which I did over five years ago, and I currently act as a sponsor for newcomers, um, am I acting too much in the ego because I'm constantly working these 12 steps and sharing them and your concepts with others? And also, if this is the case, um, how can I live in consciousness and work at 12-step programs with the meetings and sponsorship? without the ego being so much at the forefront? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. The, the criterion is whether you yourself are still living it on a daily basis. If you're living the truth of it, this too shall pass is only a pointer towards a particular state of consciousness that is a state of detachment. Mm -hmm. uh, not that you don't care, but it's a state of that you still care deeply. But there's not, there is a detachment from what's happening, an inner sense of freedom in the background. So when you use these tools, for example, a phrase or a pointer, sometimes people who teach these things professionally, after a while they stop practicing themselves and mm -hmm. they, just, they just use them as a formal thing. Mm -hmm. And then the ego can come back in. Because you think you know everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you are not living it, you're teaching it, but you're not yourself living it anymore. And that is the question that only you can answer, whether you are still living the reality that's beyond this pointer, that what the pointer points to. And if you are living it, the ego has not taken over and you're doing wonderful and very helpful work. I know that the 12-step program has been extremely helpful for many people, I've yeah. had many people who've come to spirituality through that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're doing wonderful work and continue to be alert and awake so that there's a certain amount of self-observation just to make sure that you are still there yourself, that you come from that place mm -hmm. so that the mind doesn't take over. Okay, Eric? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. So let's begin, because I think that's one of uh, a huge part of Chapter 8 uh, in the discovery of inner space, the story that you began with, the ancient Sufi story from the Middle East about a king who's continuously torn between happiness and depression. On page 223, you write, the slightest thing would cause him great upset or provoke an intense reaction, and his happiness would quickly turn into disappointment and despair. A time came when the king finally got tired of himself and of life, began to seek a way out, he sent for a wise man who lived in his kingdom, who was reputed to be enlightened. And when the wise man came, the king said to him, I want to be like you. Can you give me something that will bring balance, serenity, and wisdom into my life? I will pay any price you ask. And what is that price the king had to pay? What is the price all of us have to pay? Well, first of all, of course, the, the price, uh, the king asked, well, how, how much does it cost? How much mm -hmm. is it going to cost? And the wise man said to him, it is so of such value that even your whole kingdom could not pay for mm -hmm. it. Now, what that means is that the primary thing in your life is nothing external. What is primary in your life is your inner state of consciousness. I got that. And compared to that, you could have the greatest riches if you are in a state of anxiety or fear, negativity, 
nothing is worth that. You know, in the Bible and in the church, they, they, I don't know if it's in the Bible, but I know in the church we sing this song called, It Is Well With My Soul. Yes. So unless it is well with your soul, it does not matter what your outward state is, where you living, how big, how many square feet you have, how many cars, whatever acclaim you have received in the world, unless it is well with your soul or your inner state of yes. being, yes. your inner space, then you're not well. Yes. And so that's the... Uh, uh, always to bear that in mind. Yes. What is... Am I at one with life at this moment? Mm -hmm. What is my inner state at this moment? Mm -hmm. Your primary concern in any situation needs to be your inner state. Your secondary concern is the outer situation. Mm -hmm. Because only when you're in an inner state of rightness, of presence, mm -hmm. can you uh, adequately deal with outer situations. So what is the price? There is no price in terms of monetary value right. or anything like that. We could say that the price to pay is uh, you let go of the false self. That is the price you pay. Mm -hmm. The false mind-made self. The price to pay is identification with that false, e the false I, the mm -hmm. false me. Mm -hmm. And so th that's a relatively easy price to pay because it's wonderful to let go of that. But the wise man gives the king a ring. Yes. And inside the ring, the inscription is... This too shall pass. This too shall pass. And he says, whatever situation arises in your life, before you call it good or bad, before you react, before you judge it, touch this ring and remember the inscription. that you have. And this, is, this too shall pass. Now, I find that to be very helpful. As a matter of fact, when I was going through last year this crisis at my school, that was one of the things I said to myself every day is, live in this moment, let's handle this moment as it comes, and this moment as it comes, and then what comes next, I'll handle that moment. And I always knew, this too shall pass. Works for me very well, and I'm sure a lot of other people, if you're in a difficult t stage in your life, you're going through, uh, you know, trauma or divorce or whatever, to know that this too shall pass. But when I'm feeling happy uh, and feeling joyful, I don't want to think this too shall pass. Uh that can actually also be very peaceful if you know that it is transient i know no, but that you're having such a good time and then you're thinking this too shall pass so don't get too happy if you don't know that this too shall pass then what can happen you will cling to the situation internally. i got it. i got that and if you cling to the situation and then it passes as it will as it will or even if it doesn't pass yet it might last for a little while even mm -hmm. while you are the clinging itself means already some fear is coming in oh i see that through the holding on you don't want this situation to leave you or you don't want to leave the situation mm -hmm. the clinging means brings already up some fear and that means you can't, you can't enjoy oh, it as much, really. I just had a great epiphany, not even for myself, but for all the people that I know that are, the word, key word here is clinging. So many people do this in relationships. They're holding on to a relationship that has already shown itself to be transient. It's moving on yes. to the next level. Yes. And what so many people do, they want to hold on and let it be as it always was. Yes. And it's in the process of passing. Yes and you should let it pass. Yes, allowing change to happen mm -hmm. and becoming comfortable with change. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of this, this too shall pass because we live in this world where things continuously pass away. Mm -hmm. the, the Buddhists call it impermanence. It's mm -hmm. one of the deepest truths of the Buddha. And, and, and the, the problem lies when you expect it to be the same as it always was and that's where so many people get in trouble in their relationships especially. Yes. And it's an inability to let go, mm -hmm. inability to let go of, of situations, of people, and uh, that eventually brings suffering. Yeah, just recently a friend of mine was telling me about her husband had said to her, he wasn't sure he wanted to remain in the relationship. He wasn't sure, and there's, you know, seeking counseling about that, and he's now, you know, sleeping in a different bedroom and all that stuff. And she's trying to hold on and wants things to be the way they were and wants to have a baby and all of that. And you would say, put that ring on. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
So do, especially don't cling. If you don't cling, it means there's no fear in the situation. The That's fear right. comes through the clinging, through mm -hmm. not wanting the change. Mm -hmm. And so if you approach the situation without fear, then mm -hmm. one of two things can happen in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. There may become a deepening in the relationship. When a relationship hits a crisis, mm -hmm. it may be time for the relationship to dissolve or it may be time for a deepening. Uh -huh. And so... How do you know the difference? When there's no fear, then you will know either it will deepen or it will end. Wow, or it will pass on. The fear keeps you stuck where you are. In got it. <clears throat> I got it. So let's see some of the email questions you've been sending during our class. Um, Linda in Tokyo, Japan. How do I tell the difference between an ego decision or a conscious decision? I'm in a sexless marriage and want to leave. Oh. I'm scared. I've been living in the moment for the past eight weeks. My, my answer is not coming to me. That's Good. what Linda wants to know. Oh, How yes. do I tell the difference between an ego decision or a conscious decision? Yes. I'm in a sexless marriage and I want to leave, I'm, but I'm scared. Good you just question. said it. You just said it. Though. Yes. And uh, an additional thing here, the sometimes uh, uh, something comes to you. This is what I'm going to do, your mind says. Okay, now I know what I have to do. The question is, what, where does that realization of what you have to do come from? Does it come from the ego? Or does it come from the deeper level of your being? How can I tell the difference? Mm -hmm. There's a qualitative difference, a difference in, one could say, vibrational frequency. Correct. If it comes from the deeper level of yourself, out of the stillness, it's always associated with peace. There yes. Is a peace. It's a peaceful Absolutely. realization. Absolutely. If it's agitated or if it's fearful and says, now I know what I have to do, or if it's angry, agitated, fearful, it comes from the upper level. And another thing I would say to Linda in Tokyo, you know, Japan, you're absolutely correct. Another thing, it comes from, if it's coming from inner space that we're talking about in Chapter 8, if it's coming from consciousness or inner space and not your ego, not only will you feel peace, but you won't have to ask 15 other people, is it the right thing? Yes. You will know it's the right thing. Yes. You will know it's the right thing. Yes. And I have found that if you are operating from consciousness, your higher consciousness, or as we're calling it in this chapter, inner space, that you, it, whether it's buying a pair of shoes or making a life decision, mm -hmm. if it comes from the place of inner space, you know the answer. When it's outside yourself, if it's in your ego mind, you have to ask the store clerk, you have to ask your friends, you have to ask everybody, yes. what do you think, what do you think, what do you think of these shoes, what do you think, what do you think, you know? Right, yes. But when you are, when it's well with your soul, the answer is clear. Yes. That's, that's how it. you know. A quiet, peaceful certainty. Yes. Powerful, quiet, peaceful. You know what you have to do. You know what's right for you. Mm-hmm. It's like the other day I had to uh, cancel an engagement and I was saying I never cancel things. But after I canceled, I felt such a calm yeah. and I knew that that was the right decision. Yes. Although it might be upsetting to other people, I felt such a calmness about it. And that is true for anybody who's making a decision. When you make the right decision, you feel a calmness and a peace about it. Yes. And that also relationships, leaving a relationship, if it comes from the right place, you're you leave, but you're peaceful. Right. As, yeah. You're not afraid. No. You're not afraid. No. You still could be sad about it, though. Yes, yes. Sadness can happen. You, you could be sad about it, disappointed about it. The interesting thing about sadness is, of oh, sadness, of course, also rises when somebody passes away, right. close to you. There can be sadness, and uh, if there's acceptance, then, because death is one of the prime examples of everything passing away, right. every for life form passes away. Everybody, if you live with a partner, mm -hmm. either your partner will leave you or you will leave mm -hmm. sooner or later mm -hmm. through death. Uh, so that's the allowing change to happen. Allowing change to happen. And you say the key to understanding this too will pass at the top of page 225 is knowing that non-resistance, not resisting, non-judgment, and non-attachment are the three aspects of true freedom and enlightened living. Hard to be non-resistant, non-judgmental, and non-attached when it's your husband who says, I don't longer want to be in this relationship. Yes, yes. And 
if there's a if you share a, a great deal of past with another person, it could also be a family member mm -hmm. and or a parent. Then it's sometimes harder to be present when there's a huge amount of past in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I got that. But once you see and accept the transience of all things, page 225, and the inevitability of change, you can enjoy the pleasures of the world while they, while they last without fear of loss or anxiety about the future. Yes. I thought that was such, so brilliant, the way you did that. That's the beautiful thing about being enjoy, able to enjoy the things of this world, knowing that it's, nothing is going to last. Nothing's going to last. And you can actually enjoy it more deeply now without the fear that it might finish. Because it is going to finish. Yes, yes. It and, is and going to finish. And then something else will take its place. It's okay. a continuous coming and going. I got that. Tonight we're mm. Skyping again with a study group in Los Angeles who've gather, gathered at the Bodhi Tree bookstore. It's a landmark in West Hollywood. Hi, everybody at the Bodhi Tree. Hi. Uh, oh, <laughs> gosh. Our, there's our Bodhi, Bodhi followers. Nick has a question about finding his purpose, and I know it's something that's been on the minds of quite a few of our students. Hello, Nick. Let's hear it. Yeah, hey, Oprah, what's up? Hey, <laughs> everything's um, up. <laughs> my question is basically, um, well, you have to worry about a lot of stuff in life. You have to go to work. You have to pay your bill. Uh, your cell phone bill works in the now, but if you don't work today, it's not going to work a month from today. So how do you live in the now and still worry about your IRAs, investing in your future, uh, what you're going to do as far as you know, money, paying your bills, doing what you have to do, you know, in this ego-centered world, especially in Los Angeles. So, <laughs> so what yeah, you're saying is, is what, what if, how is, does becoming who we are truly, uh, what if becoming who we were, were truly meant to be really isn't financially practical is what you're asking, right? Uh, yeah, what if I wanted to go on a mountain somewhere and just become who I was? I, I, I eventually would, I guess, starve or <laughs> freeze. But, um, I mean, you know, it, how do you integrate this in your everyday life, sort of being in the now, being the essence of who you are, yeah. um, without, without suffering in the long run? Without, you know, the squirrel would suffer. The squirrel would die if it didn't put away nuts for the future. So, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd seen a question that you'd sent earlier, Nick, where you said it's all fine and dandy to read about becoming who you truly are and being who you were meant to be. But how do we do that and still pay all of our bills? Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. However, the question, uh, the first few words of your question already contained an error. And it's easy. If an error keeps into a question, then it's hard to answer it truly. The error was, you said, we have to worry about paying our bills and all kinds of things. Is that true? No. You have to pay your bills, but you don't have to worry about paying your bills. And the squirrel has to put away the nuts, but the squirrel is not worried about the nuts. Only humans are worried about their nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so uh, you can, being present with what you do does not mean that you neglect your daily affairs mm -hmm. and so on. It means you deal with them in a different and in fact more powerful and more effective way. You give up the worrying part, you still pay your bills, but you let go of the worrying about paying your bills. In that way, you learn from the squirrel how to live. Because worrying is your choice. You see that, don't you, Nick? No, you worrying is your times, choice. It, at times when I don't worry, um, I, I've had moments in my life where I didn't worry, I just kind of let the, the waves, the world roll over me, and I kind of did nothing about situations and hoped that they would work out themselves, and they didn't. I mean. It, you know, wor worrying did help me in the past to actually get things together and get my life on track. Um, I guess to be, for me in my life, to be in the essence, to be with my spiritual self, it doesn't, it's not enough. I have to really be actively worried about the actual day-to-day -day business of surviving. Well, you know, I would, most people have to do, you know. I would still argue with that. This, it is true that you need to take action. It is not true that you need to worry in all order to be able to take action. Uh, so you can actually experiment with, in your daily life, start with little situations. Let's say there's a pile of bills that you have to pay. How, how do you approach these bills? Are you going to worry the night before or on the day? Or to, am I going to be able to pay you? 
you just take one bill after another, you look at it, you face it, okay, do I have the money in my bank account or not? If you don't have the money in my bank account, I have to do something to make more money. What is the possible, what can I do now? Put that aside, look, this action I can take, pick up the phone, make a phone call, do the present, effective, powerful, but no worry. If you, then, then you'll see all, your whole life will become not only more effective and more powerful, but also much easier. It flows with greater ease. Nothing in nature is worried. All the animals do what they have to do, but they don't worry about it. They are active. Everything is active in nature. The trees are active, the grass, the flowers. Everything is active and putting out energy. It's only the hum humans that worry about it and think they need worry in order to survive in this world. You don't need worry, you need action, but yeah. not worry. That's an interesting point. If you've ever been on safari or seen animals on a hunt or actually seen a kill, you know, they go out in search of, and we, everybody, I'm sure, watched the Planet, or you watched the Planet Earth series, right, the series, right Nick, where you see the animals? No. Oh, no, Nick, but, got you know it. what? <laughs> what he was saying, I'm sorry. Nick, you gotta saying, get the Planet the Earth. <laughs> And you get to see all these animals hunting other animals, and I just, just, it just made me think of what you're saying. As the animal's hunting the other animal, it's just doing it. It's not worrying, I hope I find a rabbit today. I hope I find a rabbit today. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. You, you want to continue? That, yeah. That reminds me of the lily in the valley. That it doesn't worry about clothing itself in the Bible. Um, it just does. It just exists. Um, it, it worries not, or the, or the sparrow or the crow does not worry how it's going to get its yes. next meal. Yes. It just, yes. it just does. Yes. And that reminds yes. me of that yes. right there. Yes. But I, I'm, I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking of those hippies in India that still haven't come back. <laughs> they're just, they're just broke and yeah, yeah. took Nick all their saying, idealism that's, there. Nick is saying, well, that's really good for that Bible stuff and for the lilies of the valley. But listen, I'm living in LA <laughs> and, uh, I got to worry right, about right, things. Really. Is there anybody else uh, there at the Bodhi uh, tree behind uh, you that, uh, thanks. is there anybody that disagrees with Nick that has you know, similar issues, and you're not worried about it. You've been able to apply. Come up to the microphone here. Let's get, <laughs> hey, come on up there. <laughs> hi. Hi. Hi, you How are. are you? Hi, who are you? I'm Jessica. Oh, hi, Jessica. Hi. So what I do you want to you. say about what we've been talking about? Um, you know, there's a, it's on page 238, and it's, um, about becoming one with the situation and that the solution arises out of that uh -huh. and um i've always kind of been a more of a take action person first and then deal with the inner peace and all that later but um i was wondering how do you deal with things like that in relationships and things like weight management and all of those issues do you just become still and just hope for an answer to come or do you still actively seek one out so what you're referring to is uh, on this page it says in, you don't react. What I'm saying there is you don't react against a situation when a situation arises that... Uh, you merge with it. Yes. And you the become, solution rises out of the situation. Yes. Yeah. Now this should not be confused with becoming inactive or just sitting there and looking and not doing anything. What it means is there's no inner resistance to that arising situation. Sometimes uh, things happen when you have a project, you have some work to do, and something happens to, some obstacle arises in what you want to do. A person, a situation arises. And so for many people, as soon as an obstacle arises, they become resistant and they go into a negative state and try to fight the obstacle. They're fighting the obstacle rather than accepting the moment as it is internally. You say, oh, the right. situation has changed. We talked about change. Right. Situations change continuously. And the world does not necessarily do what it wants you to do, what you want it to do. So you face a situation and any change that happens is immediately accepted inside. And through the acceptance, you respond to the situation. So you're not accusing, you're not making wrong, mm -hmm. you're not complaining about the situation to yourself and others. So many people burn up a huge, huge amount of energy uselessly that they could use to deal with the situation, but they burn up a huge amount of energy complaining 
in their heads and to others about what has happened. Right. Instead of looking at what has happened and saying, oh, this is how it is, what can I do now? A moment of stillness and then action happens. No complaining, no resisting, no fighting against, not making a person or situation into an enemy that again burns up a lot of useless energy and brings up a lot of energy that is going to sabotage what you want to do. So uh, again, you say when instead of reacting against the situation, you merge with it, the solution arises out of the situation itself. Actually, it's not you, the person who's looking and listening, but the alert stillness itself or yes. the inner space. When I say the solution arises out of the situation, it does not mean that you don't do anything. In some cases, it is you who's going to take the action, but it will come out of a powerful place of being one with the situation. Yeah, I, I, I think, too, Jessica, ask Nick to come back to the microphone. Thanks, Jessica. Nick, come back up here. We're not through with you. I, I, I think, too, I think you really represent a whole lot of people, particularly young people, who have said to me personally or have emailed uh, and think that um, being uh, in alignment with who you're truly meant to be and awakening to your purpose is some kind of, is, uh, represents passivity, that you're just sort of sitting around, just, you know, waiting on a woo. <clears throat> moment and not really doing anything. The real purpose of this entire book and the work of spirituality is to get you, to get us to align our personalities with our soul or higher consciousness so that the work that you do in the world comes from the place of the higher consciousness and you use your ego or personality to serve that. You allow your personality to serve the calling of consciousness that has put you here on the earth in the first place. And when you do that, everything has a flow to it. You're in the right job that gives you the right amount of money for you at any given time because you are in alignment. So you're not worrying about things because you're not living beyond your means. You're not stressing about things because you're not allowing your ego to determine and define who you are in the world. So you're not acting out of an external self, but acting out of the place of inner space or consciousness so everything is in alignment. And that's not passive. That's not, woo, 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 I can't pay my bills, and so let me find myself later. That is aligning your personality with the higher consciousness so that your higher consciousness, you operate from a place of being, and the, the inner space is directing and guiding your life and not the outer space. You get it? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I'm sorry if I made you mad over. <laughs> 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 uh, but I, I do. I, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. <laughs> no, I'm not mad, but I just, I, I hear this, I hear this a lot. I mean, earlier today, my stylist was saying, well, what about my passion? What about, what about my passion? Do you want me to just give up my passion? No, this isn't about giving up your passion. It's about feeling your passion more deeply. Yes. yes. And being in alignment with that. How do you know if you, what you want, what your passion is, isn't just ego driven? What if I just wanted to be like... I don't know, rock star, and that's just completely ego-driven, and that didn't help the world in any way. But if I kept on working towards it, um, it would just it would just not be serving anyone but myself. How? What if my passion is wrong? You know, what if, if it's sorry? Wrong, too many questions. No, no, no it's no, fine. No, go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> is, Eckhart, answer that. Uh, sometimes you may not know until you have achieved what you wanted to achieve, whether it was ego or not. When you get what you wanted to achieve and very soon you fi fi find it does not satisfy you, then it was the ego. So you can, this is a learning process. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's saying you shouldn't try to achieve this or that. If the, the impulse is there to have this or that, do it mm -hmm. and see what happens. If it doesn't satisfy you, it's the ego. And the greatest <laughs> rock stars are those who, who, who are rock stars because they sing, they sing or they perform because they had to. And whether they were performing to, you know, grand crowds or in their garage mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. to just their family members, they sing because they have to. The greatest yes. dancers are those who dance because they have to and they become 
rock stars or dancing stars because that is coming from such a pure place of, of, of passion. And that's what the world feels because those are the people who last. Yes. The people who are operating from the passionate true space yes and not just doing it because they want to make the money or because of the ego self yes that's what i think very good but it's nice that's talking right. to you nick <laughs> <laughs> thank you sorry it took so long but it was a pleasure thanks here. everybody thank at the you. Bodhi tree jessica okay. nick and all the all our Bodhi buddies there. <laughs> okay now we have an email from sumaya in bethlehem uh who wanted to say that i live under military occupation i've witnessed the demolishing of my home and I do not know how to apply your theories when the outside is so out of my control. How can I be at peace when there are soldiers outside my door? There's a question for you. That is, of course, the experience of many people in this world. If you look what's happening in this world, people are confronted with violence all the time, with loss. They lose their homes. They lose family members. Is it possible? here to enter a state of surrender? Uh, is it possible to accept the seemingly unacceptable? Oh. And for some people it has been possible. I know it is possible to accept what seems unacceptable. And if you accept oh. the unacceptable, you will go very deep very quickly. And what otherwise would take many years realization to realize it will take you to a very deep point if you accept something great loss in your life in prison I continuously get letters from people in prison now this is unacceptable some prisons are dreadful places and some people there live in agony and suffering and anger and resentment and some a minority a few have realized that they can live in the state of inner surrender, which is not negative. It's a complete acceptance that this is as it is right now. Because they are in non-resistance, non-judgment, and non-attachment. Yes, because, yeah. and you accept it because, why should you accept it? Because it is at this moment. Mm -hmm. It is. So no matter what it is, accepting the isness of this moment brings you to a place of inner freedom and also a place of power. Mm. Go, you have to go, to, in order to accept the unacceptable, you have to go really very deep and say, very, bring a very deep yes to this moment, mm -hmm. an uncompromising yes. I think that a lot of people have trouble with the word accepting it because yes. accepting says to people, I must then also condone it. No. What you're yes. saying is, Stop. Den by your term, accept, you mean don't deny that it's happening. Yes. As you resist it, y y if you continue to resist it, the example you used earlier in, in our classes is you're, you're, you're in the mud, you're stuck in the mud, the wheels are in the mud, you must first accept that I'm stuck in the mud before you can get yourself out of the mud. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can't keep saying I'm not in the mud. No. Or you, and you don't say... I shouldn't be. Why did this happen to me? I can't believe I'm in the... And, and then all the energy goes into the complaining and into the resistance. Correct. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got it. Christina lives in Toronto, Canada, and Skyping us from her family room. Christina, your question. Hello. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Akbar. Hi. Hi. Um, I uh, have been afraid to drive for about 16 years now. I was in a serious car accident, and um, it has stopped me from... from you know, being responsible in my family life. My husband has so much burden. He has to take our kids to their activities and, and, and so forth, take time off of work to take them to doctor's appointments. So my question is, uh, but just recently from reading A New Earth, I, um, I've i started to drive. So yay. But uh, my question is, how do I remain in the inner uh, spaciousness that you speak about on page 238 uh, so that I can stay behind the wheel I mean, things are going well right now, but if that uh, fear um, comes creeping back, how do I handle it? I don't know if I want you behind the wheel if I'm on the road and you're trying oh, to do that. Don't say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, the uh, first, the, you're now able to drive. That's wonderful. The, the old fear is gone. 
but now a new, new fear has arisen, and that fear is about whether the fear is going to come back or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so that is often the case, people develop a fear about a fear. Mm -hmm. Where is it going, am I going to be in fear again? The mind tends to do that kind of thing because it projects itself into the future and says, am I going to remain fearless or is mm -hmm. the fear going to come back? So realize that that is your mind trying to figure something out and thereby creating a new level of fear on, the, on top of the original fear that has already dissolved. So trust that it's not going to come back but something you can do to help it is to actually consciously enjoy the driving and enjoy sitting in the car, mm -hmm. enjoy sitting at the traffic light, enjoy the driving itself. It, um, I enjoy driving. It's, it's a very peaceful thing to do for me. So, and be comfortable with being in the car. And uh, what I used to do often in the, don't do it so much anymore, I would get into my car and drive out to some lonely place and mm -hmm. sit in the car and meditate or write. I liked being in the car. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, use the enjoyment. The more you find the enjoyment, the less likely the fear is going to come back. So seek the enjoyment of it. It is to do with enjoying the present moment, the driving itself, the movement, and so on. And don't go into your mind. Don't follow up that thought when it says, oh, is it going to last? Is this state of be, being without fear going to last? To stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. and the more you're in the moment, the less likely fear is going to come back. It can't really come back when you're in the now. Mm -hmm. It's only when you leave the now, then it'll come back. Either you go into the past, and you remember something that happened in the past, you, mm -hmm. you've left the now, or you go into the future and say, am I going to have fear again at some point? <laughs> So st the more you stay in the now, the more you're keeping out fear. Fear comes through past or future. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Yvonne. Hey, Yvonne. Okay. Yes. Hi. What's your um, question? I like this question. It's about this too shall pass and um, the quote about it. Um, forget the quote now. Shoot. Um, <laughs> How do you be a voice for uh, change in the planet where things are going wrong and still be present in the stillness and create the action without being taken down by all the horrendous things that are happening? It seems to me like a paradox to be yeah. present and then to work for change in the future. Yeah, you said, how can I be a voice for planetary change and really say I don't mind what happens because there's so much... I don't mind what happens. That's yeah, what so much crazy stuff is going on in the world. How can you just say... Do not mind uh, animal abuse. Right, not mind animal abuse, not mind all the violence going on in the world and just say, this too shall pass. First, of course, um, the English language has two expressions that, that are related and yet very different. Sometimes... Uh, I don't mind is interpreted by people as meaning I don't care. Mm -hmm. so I don't care and I don't mind are very different. I don't mind does not mean that you don't care. It means there is a space of freedom inside you mm -hmm. and that is a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. And unless you are rooted in that peaceful place within, you cannot ultimately be an agent for true positive change in this world. Your state of consciousness is what transmits itself through whatever you do. Mm -hmm. Your state of consciousness is primary. Mm -hmm. And only if your state of consciousness is at peace can whatever you do reflect that. And you can be a bringer of peace into this violent and insane world. And you can then, through whatever you do externally, can bring sanity into this logic, insane world. Whether it's about that particular thing you're, you're concerned about or not, because if you are in a state of consciousness where you are at peace, everything that you do in the world will bring peace to the world. Yes. And that's how you change the world. Yes. 
And everything you, will do, you do will be much more empowered. It will be empowered by that consciousness rather than coming from antagonism, coming from the thinking I have to fight these people, making situations or people into enemies. That's all the old consciousness. You cannot change this world through the old consciousness or applying the structures and the ways of the old consciousness. Yeah, one of the things you shared with us earlier, uh, what he was saying, Yvonne, in one of the early classes, is that you cannot uh, make change by fighting against anything. And a surefire way of knowing that something is going to fail is when you say it's the war against. Yes. The war against anything cannot win. No. So if you cannot fight, it does not mean that you cannot take action. You can take powerful action, but it comes out of that ba basic place of inner peace. Uh, people don't realize, many people don't realize yet that very powerful action ca come out of the place of inner peace. Mm -hmm. They believe they need to be agitated to bring about change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coming from inner peace, motivate other people to sort of mind what's going on so that they might do things differently in their lives that impact the planet as a whole. That's the thing that kind of worries me, that the concept can give people apathy and like, oh, I'm going to throw my cigarette on the ground and it's going to go into the ocean and I don't mind what happens. That, that's no, that's not it. You see the consequences of any action. If you're present, then you, you will not do unconscious things that will actually produce suffering. It's only when you're not present that you will produce suffering in one form right. or another. Got that. When you're present, you, can, you, do not, you do not generate suffering for yourself or others. It's the only place from where you don't generate suffering. And then already, you're, you are already the beginning of the change of the world. And then it doesn't matter what you do, you may just disseminate information. But the information about, to make people aware of certain things, some people, this can be a very important thing to do. And the way in which you disseminate the information will also be empowered by your state of consciousness. It will, will not make others wrong, other people wrong, and thereby produce a reaction. And then you're trapped in the same old thing. You've experienced that, right, Yvonne? You've been on the street or oh, some, yeah. and somebody is trying to hand out something, and if it's a person who's really agitated or you can feel or sense their anger and agitation, you don't want to take the pamphlet. But if the person hands it to you or whatever it is with a, you know, with a, with, a calm, with a sense of calm or peace, then you're more inclined to want to even engage with them. Yeah. I've experienced that as myself like 15 years ago in college, being the staunch environmentalist and telling people what to do. And, of course, watching them do the opposite, yeah. and inspiring the exact opposite that I wanted. So I've worked the last 10 years since the power of the now to be present. But in order to do that, I had to, like, stop looking at the atrocities of the world. And now I'm ready to come back and I want to keep the spiritual side but at the same time not let the world get me down but be able to yes. do something and be a part of positive change yes, that's your challenge now that's your challenge now and your spiritual practice now is to balance the two so that you can be active and bring about change in the world without losing your rootedness in being and your presence so that's a balancing a balancing yeah. act yes and that's what you have Thank to do you now for sharing. Thank you. To do it. I'm learning slowly what you just said about accepting the acceptance, the deep acceptance of the, the world as it is. That hit me. Yeah. Finally, I'm starting to understand it. That yeah. the not the accept of it's okay. No. Right. Just that it this is happening. That it is happening. Yes. Yes. And that the oh, angrier you and more upset you uh, you get about it, it's still happening. Oh okay, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't serve anything. I get that. But then how do you keep going? But I'm. It's slow process. There's two more weeks, two more chapters. <laughs> I'm hoping. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Inner purpose yeah. is going to help that a lot. Yes. Thank you. Tell Nick yeah. to be sure to show up for inner purpose. I got a few things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, Natalie lives in Australia, but is on holiday with her family and is Skyping us from her friend's kitchen in England. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Hi. Hi Atta. How Hi. are you? Yeah, we're both well. Thank Good. you so exciting for me. Um, on page 239 in your book, um, you say that some people feel more alive when they travel and visit unfamiliar places or foreign countries because those times sense perceptions, experiencing, take up more of their consciousness than thinking. 
Uh, since the class on the third chapter, I've been sharing an amazing holiday with my family and our friends here. Um, I've been able to enjoy my holiday so much more by practicing the teachings that I've read about in the book and the things I've learned from the class. Um, but my life back home is not like my holiday. It's really busy. I've got a job and three children and my husband has his own, his own business. And on reflection, I think I've filled up any free time I've had so that I wasn't alone with that constant noise in my head. I feel really great at the moment and I want to feel the same when I go home. So my question is, how do I transition between this wonderful holiday and go back to my normal life at home? Okay, okay. That's a good question. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, it's a good question. The, the everydayness of uh, many people's lives can really pull you into a place of unconsciousness because of the repetitiveness of mm -hmm. one's life. So it's up to you when you get home to uh, bring a, to invite a different state of consciousness as much as possible into your daily life, into the daily routine of your life. Invite a state of presence. When you are engaged in things that you do every day repetitively, things that usually are a means to an end, Mm -hmm. Driving the kids to school, going, doing the shopping, doing, well, you can see how many things are a means to an end in one's daily existence. And that's not a very uh, powerful way to live when almost everything you do in your daily existence is a means to some end because you want to, like, right. you have to do this and this, have to do this. So bring in presence where instead of, of treating whatever you do as a means to an end, as much as possible, make it into an end in itself. For example, when you're driving from here to there, be absolutely present every moment. Look around, be alert, as if you were seeing things for the first time. Mm -hmm. The trees, the people, the traffic. And you do that by not labeling things. Not labeling mentally mm -hmm. what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Be there as, as a conscious presence when you're doing shopping at the supermarket. Uh, most perceiving be, without naming is Perceiving without naming. Be there with every step. Look at the things around you, what do I need to get. To be conscious of every movement, of everything around you, so that it's not an everyday thing. It's that everything that you do is happening just now. It's not yeah. a repetition. That's and, I, and I promise you if, you, if you start to do this in your everyday life, what he says on page uh, 252, as much as possible in everyday life, use awareness of the inner body to start to create space. Um, when waiting, when listening to someone, when pausing to look at the sky, all on page 252, a tree, a flower, your partner, a child, Feel the aliveness within at the same time. This means part of your attention or consciousness remains formless and the rest is available for the outer world of form. Whenever you inhabit your body in this way, it serves as an anchor for staying present in the now, prevents you from losing yourself in thinking, in emotions, or in external situations. When you really get that, what he's saying on page 252, Natalie, everything around you takes on a magical quality. I, I can really testify to that that just doing yeah. routine things becomes almost like you have wow moments doing the smallest things, you know, washing I've the... Been feeling it. Yeah. I've been feeling that at the moment because we've been seeing so many amazing things and meeting so many different people and being in places where they speak different languages. But I know at home what I do is that when I'm doing something, I'm thinking about the next thing that I'm going to be doing. The next so I, I really need to, um, I can really take that on. Thank you what so much. What I would like to say to you and everybody else, when you start to put this into practice, and I've been doing it myself during the past eight weeks, when you start to actually put it into practice, everything is amazing. Yes. Everything <clears throat> starts to be amazing. The fact that you're breathing in and out of your lungs starts to be amazing. That's what the now does. It brings you... To, to, a, to a level of consciousness and presence, so just being is amazing. And you don't have to leave home to experience that. 
Isn't that the, that's the, that's, that's right. the key, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's isn't the key, it? yes. What is on the backboard? I thought I saw my name there when there was a wide shot there. Does that say that's Oprah? From my, it does, that's from my Georgie. She's asleep because it's about 3 a.m., but she wanted to say hi, so that's her hi, Oprah. Hi, Georgie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. But that's the Bye. Th thank you. Yes. What Natalie was talking about yes. is the whole point of awakening to your life's purpose. And next week we're going to be talking about inner purpose, yes. which is what I was trying to say to Nick, um, uh, maybe too stridently. <laughs> that has happened a couple times where I'm like saying to Gail, Gail will say, I don't understand. I'll go, well, the reason is... Um, well, Nick represents about... Uh, 50 million other people who are the same. That's uh, right, yeah. who are feeling that, well, listen, I got to make money. Yeah. I got to make money. But what we're going to be talking about next week, Nick, <laughs> is when you align the inner purpose and let the inner purpose determine what your outer actions are, yes. then you're not worried. That's right. You never worry. Yes. No matter how much money you're making. Yes. You're not worried because you're on purpose with your life. Yeah. You're on purpose with your life. Yeah, well, you know, I think a lot of people feel like this is all kind of, sometimes they feel like this is ooey-gooey stuff. And yes, and I'll get spiritual, but let me make some money first. <laughs> yeah. I want to yes. be spiritual and all that, yeah. but I got to make some money first. Yeah, that's yeah. actually the, in, the, in, the Gos, in the New Testament where he says, let me first do this, they, they invite you to the kingdom of heaven. That's right. They, well, let me first do this, with another, when there's another excuse, let me first do this, first I have to do this, yes. and then I'll be ready. Uh -huh. Of course, it never happens. The that's then, right. The then never comes. So uh, there is Barbara in Shanghai, China, who writes, I find it really difficult to be the observer of a challenging work environment, especially when I'm frustrated with employees and have to discipline my staff. What are some of the practical steps I can take to overcome the situation? Well, there you use whatever the practical things that are described in the book, mm -hmm. uh, conscious, uh, one or two conscious breaths as mm -hmm. often as possible, getting in touch with the feeling of the inner body, the aliveness of the inner body, while you are listening to people especially, mm -hmm. then already a different energy is there. You are listening from a different state of consciousness when you are in touch with the inner body while you listen. Right. And a lot of things, uh, uh, a person who is uh, running an office or whatever the, our yes. questioner does, they probably have to deal with many people every day, which involves listening to people in addition to, of course, speaking to people. Mm -hmm. So be there as the, feel the aliveness within as you listen, as much as possible, take conscious breaths while you are engaged in things. That's right. Bringing, bringing spaces, little spaces into your daily existence. Gaps. Little gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, that is more important than doing, a, it's, it's wonderful to do a meditation at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but bringing little gaps I into your everyday activities mm -hmm. is even more important. I love what you talk about on page 232 and 233. You tell people to avoid watching television programs and commercials that assault you with a rapid succession of images that change every two or three seconds. <laughs> uh, rather than watching at random, choose the programs you want to see. Whenever you remember to do so, feel the aliveness also inside your body as you watch. Alternatively, be aware of your breathing from time to time, looking away from the screen at regular intervals so that it doesn't completely take possession of your visual sense. We just did a show the other day, um, and this mom, it was a show about giving up what you could, what you could be willing to live without, and this family was going to give up their computers, or they did give up their computers and their televisions for a week, and their little five-year-old boy was crying because he had to give up the computer his mom walked in the room, stood behind him, was behind him, called his name, and he still couldn't, he couldn't hear her because he was so mesmerized by the video game he was playing. What are we doing to ourselves, and more importantly to our children, through the video games, the, the television, which is, 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 is a form of, like, hypnosis almost yes. for people? Yes, yes. And it, it pulls your attention out of the body. It's like a leaking, an energy leakage, mm -hmm. when, especially for young children, mm -hmm. when uh, the energy gets drawn out very easily. And uh, so it's continuous uh, energy leakage, and they cannot focus on, 
on because of the rapidly changing images on TV screen for, in many programs, uh, the ability to to have a prolonged focus on something is greatly diminished. Well, I thought that. That's why we have so many children with ADD, because they've grown up in a world where they can only, there's 30 seconds and 30 seconds yes. and 30 seconds. Yes. That uh, means the quality of your life is also diminished, because the quality of your life very much depends on the degree of your attention. Mm -hmm. At attention mm -hmm. is quality. So if you, can, if you cannot give attention to anything for very long, that diminishes the quality of your life and what you can do. So parents need to be careful with their children. I'm not saying remove all these things immediately from your children because <coughs> they are addictive, yeah. but very gently um, d don't reduce the amount of time they spend with video games and the reduce gently the amount of time they spend watching television. Because they cause you, as you say, so when watching television, the tendency is for you to fall below thought, not rise above it. Television has this in common with alcohol and certain other drugs. While it provides some relief from your mind, you again pay a high price, loss of consciousness. Yes. And here we have... Well, that's what it's designed to do, isn't it, for the most part? Yes, it's uh, here we Our have... Our show, though, is designed to make you more conscious. I will have to say that. I know that. When I wrote there somewhere, there are some television shows that have been helpful to many people and have raised people's consciousness. It says that somewhere in the mm -hmm. book. It does. I saw you, you in my mental, in my really? mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You could have just said, oh, the Oprah show. <laughs> so I saw you wrote that there are some television shows. You could have just put in parentheses, the Oprah show, for example. Yes. So, and, yeah, but for the most part, television is designed to numb us out. Yes. And here <laughs> we have the interesting uh, concept of... Um, Go, arising above thinking and falling below thinking. So what we are engaged in here, now most people are at the thinking level, they mm -hmm. are controlled by their mind, they are identified with their mind. Mm -hmm. This work that we are doing here, if you can call it work, it's not work really, no. <laughs> um, is rising above thinking. Mm -hmm. being, being present mm -hmm. means you have risen above thinking. You are fully conscious, but there's little or no Thought activity. Can you tell me why you say on page 233, make sure you don't go to sleep immediately after switching off the set, or even worse, fall asleep with the set still on? I know my friend Gail sometimes is watching TV and she goes, I don't know if I was watching or my feet were watching because she goes to sleep with the TV on. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then the, all the, the turmoil that you've just been watching and you've just spent a, a, a significant amount of time below thought mm -hmm. in a state of unawareness and mm -hmm. unconsciousness and if you go from that will af affect the quality of your sleep and you will notice also when you wake up in the morning you won't be as refreshed it's it's vital to go into sleep from a place of consciousness mm -hmm. rather than unconsciousness then the quality of your sleep will be much better and you will wake up feeling I renewed that See, I don't watch television before going to bed, hardly watch television at all, but I notice that if I meditate before going to sleep, I have a better sleep. Yes. And what I recommend to people is, as they lie in bed, uh, ready to go to sleep, uh, lie on your back, flat on your back, and bring attention, scan your body with your attention, mm -hmm. from your feet to your head, mm -hmm. your hands, your arms, and then feel the... In the internal aliveness of the body as you lie there. You lie in the energy field of your body. That means there's also very little or no thinking going That's on right. because the attention moves into the body. Into the body. And there, from there, you go to sleep. Hold that for five, ten minutes. It's a very pleasant way of, of, of saying goodbye to that day and of mm -hmm. going into sleep. It feels very much alive. It's, it's joyful, actually, to, to lie there in, the, in that energy field. And that energy field that you're talking about is exactly what this whole chapter is about, is the energy field of inner space. Yes. Go inside the body yes. and allow yourself to be the observer of the body. Yes. And be in, then you connect with the energy. You merge the energy field. And, of course, the body is mostly empty space, 99.999% empty space, physicists tell us. Mm -hmm. 
the space between the molecules, the atoms that make up the body, the spaces in between the atoms is so vast that your body is 99.999% empty space. <laughs> That's a, that's a lot for my brain to take in right now. But I do want to thank you for uh, joining us. This eighth class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our classes, you can do that tomorrow also at Oprah.com and iTunes. It's free because of the generous support of Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins. This week, you can update your workbook. Get ready for our next class, Chapter 9. We're coming to the end. Your inner purpose your inner purpose, for all of you who read this book looking for your inner purpose, this is what it's all about, people. Thank you. Thank you. For bringing us into inner space. Next week is inner purpose. And as I was saying to Nick earlier, inner purpose, when it defines what you do in the world, puts you in alignment and all things come. Yes. As they should. And then becomes the alignment of inner purpose and outer purpose. Ah, uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good Let's night. do our high five. We almost didn't do it last oh. week, and people complained. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to class number nine of our New Earth web series. We're here with author Eckhart Tolle, number nine. We're counting down. We're down to the last two chapters of our book, and it is my most sincere hope that all of our classes so far have been leading you to find more purpose and joy in your own lives. And uh, tonight's class, tonight's lesson is really about bringing clarity to finding your inner purpose. And uh, so I, I think this is my most exciting chapter of all. I know I say that every chapter. I didn't say that last chapter, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. But before we begin um, the class, I'm going to let you lead us in our, our moment of silence or moment of silence today. Good. So um, we're already familiar with the silence that we start with. Mm -hmm. And um, this time I'd like to use a very short, very powerful line from the Old Testament. And I believe that this will be especially helpful for those Christians who are not quite comfortable with silence and somehow feel that silence is not compatible with Christianity or Christian teachings, which is not the case at all. Perhaps it has been overlooked mm -hmm. in the past couple of centuries in Christianity, but it is certainly compatible. And so this is one of my favorite lines from the Old Testament, and that can take us very powerfully into stillness. And this line is, be still and know that I am God, meaning God is found precisely in that inner stillness, through the realm of inner stillness that you can reach what we call God, but which nobody can understand through the mind. It's the mystery, the mystery which you cannot really explain or name, which we call God. This is the depth of that. We touch that when we go into stillness. So these beautiful lines point to that inner experience. So I'll say it again, and when I've said it, we just become still for a moment. Be still and know that I am God. I love that. That's one of my favorite Bible passages, yes. actually. Yeah. Yeah. That and lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Yes. Well, today, uh, tonight, 
we're discussing chapter nine, your inner purpose, finding your purpose is what I believe we're all put on the planet to do. So many people spend their lives, you know, trying to figure out what job, what job to do, what to do, what to do, what to do. I think when you figure out what your purpose is and you align the outer purpose with the inner purpose, then the job really doesn't matter, yes. right? That's, Very true. that's the essence of what yes. you're saying yes. in this chapter. Um, let us begin, page 257. As soon as you rise above mere survival, the question of meaning and purpose becomes a paramount importance in your life. Many people feel caught up in the routines of daily living, you say, that seem to deprive their life of significance. Some believe life is passing them by or has passed them by already. Others feel severely restricted by the demands of their job and supporting a family. Some are consumed by stress, lost in frantic doing. Many people long for the freedom and expansion that prosperity promises. Others already enjoy the freedom that comes with prosperity and discover that even that's not enough to endow their lives with true meaning. There is no substitute for finding true purpose. So how do we do it? Now, what you just read basically, of course, means that many people spend their lives in a state of almost permanent dissatisfaction, Right. unfortunately. Uh, so they may be looking for some purpose, or they may have given up hope that there is some purpose for them, and they're just surviving mm -hmm. or making a living or caught up in the doing. Caught up in the doing, uh, in the stress of it. Right. And so, usually when we talk about purpose, when people talk about purpose, they think of purpose in terms of future. Where am I going? What am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. What's the direction I'm going? What is my goal, the goal that I want to achieve? And that, of course, is there. It has its place, but I call that the outer purpose. More fundamental than the outer purpose is what most people usually overlook, and that is the realization that what matters most is finding your inner purpose. Now, to most people, that initially doesn't mean anything, inner right. purpose. And this is why I explain it briefly in the dialogue that is there in that chapter, where somebody asks about, I want to know what my purpose is, and I tell that person, your purpose is to be here at this moment and asking that question, because right. this is where you are. So inner purpose is aligning your life fully with the present moment, so that you are no longer out of alignment with the present moment, which, is, which leads to the state of dissatisfaction that we talked about, mm -hmm. that is the reality for many people. Mm -hmm. So you have to go, first of all, beyond the state of dissatisfaction that is so many people's reality. Right. But you cannot go beyond the state of dissatisfaction through some future goal that says, one day I would like to be in a state of fulfillment or satisfaction. No. You have to enter the state of fulfillment and satisfaction by becoming one internally with the present moment. And the, your purpose then, your inner purpose, is that alignment with where you are right now, to be totally where you are and whatever you are doing, even if it doesn't look like your the life purpose for the, that you right. want for the next 30 right. years, right. whatever you are doing now, to be total in doing it, and well, no matter what it is, to be true to life by being true to this moment. Yeah. As you say on page 271, there is always only this one step, and so... You give it your fullest attention. This doesn't mean that you don't know where you're going. It just means that the step that you're taking right now is primary. The destination is secondary. And what you encounter at your destination once you get there de depends on the quality of this one step. I love this so much because I discovered this when I was in the third grade. I couldn't articulate it this way in the third grade. But when I was in the third grade, I turned in a book report early in Miss Driver's class. And the reaction that I got from my third grade teacher taught me or informed me that when you do your best, when you do your best in any given moment, that is well received. Because my third grade teacher told all the other teachers in the teacher's lounge, and I became known as this kid who really loved to read. And that's why we're sitting here today, <laughs> because of that. But I learned 
in the third grade, this whole process of whatever you're doing in any given moment, if you do it your best, it leads you to the next best moment. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about what's the next moment coming if you only do your best in this moment. That's right, because when the next moment comes, it comes as this moment. Right. Uh, the future, you never experience the future as the future. You experience the future when it comes as the now, because that's all there is. That's all there ever is. And that's an amazing realization for people to realize life is always just this. It's always the now. Yeah. It's interesting because and last week we had Nick from uh, the Bodhi Tree, and you, you said, to, and when Nick was up talking about, uh, he had to, well, you have to worry about your bills. And you said, well, you don't have to worry about You have your to bills. pay your bills. You have to pay <laughs> your bills. But you don't have to worry about yeah. paying your bills. I don't know about the rest of you, but that lesson has sort of been with me all week. So anytime I'd find myself, you know, in the mind worrying about something, I, go, I don't have to worry about this. I can either figure out what to do about it or re release that thought. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if the bill is here, but the money is not there right now, I can't do anything, put it aside, and put then see what action can I take now. And then you do whatever action you can take now. Yeah. If you can't, can't take any action, then you just be with it. Yeah. Right. But I love that when I read that there is always only this one step. And so you give this one step your fullest attention. That's in the middle of page 271, everybody. And this doesn't mean you don't know where you're going. It just means that this step is primary and the destination is secondary. And what happens is most people are living their lives as though the destination, the end, yes. the well, end is what it's all about. Yes, as if the end were more important than, than uh, the means. Than means. And so the means and the end, however, are one. Right. So if there's a dissatisfaction and a denial of the present moment, which is a denial of life, right. you're not honoring life if you don't honor this moment by being open to mm -hmm. this moment, then that is how you will experience the future, because the future is no more than an extension of now. Right. You also say on page 271, the unconscious assumption behind all such action is, is that success is a future event and that the end justifies the means, but the end and the means are one. You say that. Let's say you're a business person. After two years of intense stress and strain, you finally manage to come out with a product or service that sells well and makes money. Success in conventional terms, yes, but in reality, you spent two years polluting your body as well as the earth with negative energy. You made everybody crazy. <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> you made everybody and everybody yeah. around you crazy and affected others you didn't even know. The unconscious assumption behind all of this action is that success is a future event and that the end justifies the means, but the end and the means are one. And if the means did not contribute to human happiness, neither will the end. Yes. So whatever the end result is, it's going to carry the energy of what it took to get there. Yes, that's it. Yes, yes. That's exciting. Yes, and that means you actually, you, you determine what kind of future you're going to experience by deciding to be tot totally aligned with the present moment. That's right. It's your, it's your state of consciousness now that will determine whatever is manifested yes. in the future. And when that happens, that'll just be now. Yes. I got that. I got that very much. Okay, so let's, let's continue with this lesson before we go to Ivy a little bit. You say the true, pur true or primary purpose of your life cannot be found on the outer level. To me, that's the essence of what this book is all about. Everybody who's searching and waiting for answers and looking for it on the outer level, it does not concern what you do but what you are, that is to say, your state of consciousness. So the most important thing to realize is this. Your life has an inner purpose and an outer purpose. Inner purpose concerns being and is primary. Outer purpose concerns doing and is secondary. You want to elaborate on that? So once you realize that the primary purpose of your life is, this, is the inner, mm -hmm. and this is what becomes the main purpose, then the secondary purpose, the outer purpose, falls into place. By being true to life and being true to now, life will bring to you whatever is most appropriate as far as your inner purpose is concerned. Life will become helpful. 
suddenly, sometimes the helpful idea comes from within, a sudden realization, oh, this is what I want to do, this is what I have to do. Mm -hmm. But the, the realization only came because you were aligned with the present moment. So let's say this, everybody, everybody who is born, is alive and breathing, has an inner purpose. Yes, the inner purpose is the same for all of humanity, which is being aligned with life, saying yes to life by saying yes to now, aligned with the power of the present moment, which is the power of life. That's everybody's purpose. Then the outer purpose varies from person to person. How that translates into what you do mm -hmm. varies from person to person, and even in one lifetime it can vary. You may do certain uh, you have a certain outer purpose for 10 or 20 years of your life and suddenly it changes completely. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that varies and is subject to time. It doesn't necessarily last your whole lifetime. Whatever you say finding and living in alignment with the inner purpose is the foundation of fulfilling your outer, outer purpose. purpose. It's the basis for true success. Without that alignment, you can still achieve certain things through effort, through struggle, to determination and sheer hard work or cunning, but there is no joy in such endeavor and in such endeavor and it invariably ends in some form of suffering yes that is you're struggling to make it you're struggling and fighting and basically you're making you're fighting against life or the world me against the universe is what the ego how the ego sees it and isn't it sort of like swimming upstream i always compare it to swimming upstream when you're like going against the grain of your life. There's a flow to all of our lives. And if you are suffering, if you are in pain, if you can't figure out what it is you're supposed to do, if you're worried, worried, worried all the time, it is because you're going against the flow or the grain of your life. Yes. It means you're going against inner purpose. Yes. That when you align with inner purpose, everything flows. Yes. Yeah. And any negative and state, whenever negativity arises and you, yeah. you dwell in negative inner states, then you're, you're not going with the flow of life. You're right. against the flow of life. Yeah. And then you experience life as not helpful. You experience life as even as hostile because you are in a state of inner denial. You're in a state of negativity. You're not open to life. Okay. I got that. I really got that. I really got that. Another friend of mine, a teacher uh, who wrote a book called Seat of the Soul, Gary Zukov calls it, says, when the personality or ego comes to serve the energy of the soul or consciousness, we've been calling that, when the personality comes to serve the energy of the soul, that is authentic empowerment. I take that to mean from Seat of the Soul that when you align your personality or use your personality to serve the inner purpose, yes. to serve the soul or the consciousness, then you are your most powerful yes. in the world. Yes. Yeah. And then you are not run by the mind anymore because the mind becomes the servant of what I sometimes call awareness mm -hmm. or presence. Mm -hmm. The mind then serves something greater than itself, which is the consciousness. You say on page 259, instead of being lost in your thinking, when you are awake, or aware, you recognize yourself as the awareness behind it. Thinking then ceases to be a self-serving, autonomous activity that takes possession of you and runs your life. Awareness takes over from thinking, and instead of being in charge of your life, love this everybody, instead of being in charge of your life, thinking becomes the servant of awareness. Yes, and then the mind is quite helpful, so the mind can be used for many wonderful things right when it no longer controls you I got it so in essence our goal on earth as human beings these spiritual beings in the body higher consciousness inside this flesh filled membranous whatever body our goal is to allow the light of inner purpose or consciousness, consciousness. to come through yes everything that we do yes this is why we're here, and that is then also the entire universe is, the purpose of the universe, one could say, is the flowering of consciousness. It right. moves towards more and more consciousness. Okay. So we then become bringers of that, which is why we are here. So then the, the consciousness, you could call it the light, mm -hmm. the light of the source, the light of God, comes through the human form. That's right. And so when you allow the light of God 
the light of consciousness to come through you and it is allowed to fuel whatever it is you do whatever it is you do will be fueled with a spiritual power that will allow you to be the best at what you do yes okay. and and then that also means that what you do is not of primary importance but how you do what you, you do, do is what matters mm -hmm. how you do it and you could be doing something that the world would regard as relatively insignificant and yet make an enormous difference to the consciousness on the planet Ivy is Skyping Hi, us from her living room in Richmond Virginia Hi, Hi. Ivy I hear Hi. you have a question Hi. about uh, one of my favorite quotes go ahead what is the question yeah. Well, my question deals with trying to find a career path that merges your inner purpose with outer purpose. And on the top of page 274, you say, Eckhart says, there may be a period of insecurity and uncertainty. And he goes on to say that if you're able to live with uncertainty, even enjoy it, um, yeah. you, you become comfortable with uncertainty. Infinite possibilities open up in your life. And my question is this, I'm 26 years old, and in the past few months, I've tried to find a career path that merges my inner purpose with my outer purpose and haven't really been able to do so. I began to think a lot about my life's purpose and question whether or not I would ever find a career that merged my life's work with something I was passionate about. So my question really is twofold. The first is, how should I approach finding a career that is fulfilling but doesn't strengthen my ego? And secondly, and perhaps the more pressing question for me is, how do I do this while also becoming comfortable and embracing the uncertainty that's defining my life right now? Good, Good. question. Yes. So to what extent have you become successful in embracing and accepting at this time of your life that you don't know yet what your purpose is? To what extent are you able to say, well, See, can I become comfortable with not knowing? Have you been able to do that? I, there are periods where I've been able to, but mostly it's just a lot of thinking and feeling very uncomfortable about not knowing. Yes, and often the uncomfortableness are certain thoughts that go through your mind that tell you that it's not okay to be in this state. Mm -hmm. And then you have certain emotions, which are the body's reaction to those thoughts. So you, when these thoughts arise, they tell you it's not okay, the way you are right now is not okay. Realize that these are thoughts that arise in your mind, conditioned by the surrounding culture and so on. And you don't necessarily need to believe in each thought that comes and tells you it's not okay not to know what to do. Life is an adventure. It's not a package tour. When you travel, you can take a package tour and everything is already planned, there's no uncertainty, <laughs> and every year you go to a huge nice hotel room, the more exotic country, but you won't even know it's exotic because your hotel room is the same as every other hotel room. You're totally sheltered, but everything is planned. You know beforehand where you're going to be in 10 days' time, exactly. That's not an adventure, and it's unlikely that you are going to evolve internally through a trip like that. Mm. But if you went into a true trip into some exotic country, thrown back on your own resources, then you would encounter true adventure, but all, and, and you would probably not be the same person when you come back. Why not? Because we are constantly faced with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to accept that, you can actually enjoy the adventure. If you cannot accept the, it's, I'm giving this um, analogy of a trip because yes. life is a journey. Yes. And so the person who cannot enjoy the uncertainty when adventure comes is going to be in a continuous state of uh, negativity or fear. I don't want to be here. I'd rather be at home. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So realize that life is an adventure and part of the adventure of life is being in that state that you are in now. If everything were already clear to you now, everything were already mapped out, there would be no evolution of yourself as and, a human and, being. And may I say, Ivy, that is part of what being 26 is all about. <laughs> that, is, that is what 26 is. You're trying to figure it out. That is, yeah, yeah that and, is what the 20s are for. Yes, and, and another very uh, helpful thing to remember is one of the um, most wonderful things it, in your period of life is to make mistakes. Yeah. Because mistakes means 
you realize, oh, that's not, that wasn't my purpose. Yes. And so you're a little bit closer to your true purpose. And then perhaps you think, oh, maybe that is my purpose. And then you, after a while you realize, no, that's not. It, it's very helpful to make mistakes because gradually you begin to realize what it is that is right for you. Yeah. And many times, uh, as Eckhart says in this chapter, Ivy, and you will find in your 20s, the 20s are about figuring out where you want to be, and there's this frustration. That's why they call that show The Young and the Restless, because there's a restlessness <laughs> about it. Uh, and I know that because I've kept journals since I was 15 in my 20s. Oh, I'm just restless, restless, restless. And when I was your age, 26, I was an anchor woman in television uh, doing the evening news. I hated it every single day. And what I now realize, and even then, uh, my dis displeasure with being in that place every day was really informing me what I needed to do. What I needed to do was to get out of that space. And many times... Being in a space that you can clearly identify as this is, I do not want to do this. I want to be in television, I knew, but I do not want to do this. And, you know, and I had my, 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 my father and everybody around saying, you're going to give up that job in television? I knew I could not do that. News felt uh, exploitive to me. So many times if you're in a position where you know it's not what you don't want to do, isn't that also helpful, Eckhart? Oh, yes, yes. Um... For a while, I thought my life purpose was to be an academic in the, mm. at university. And then a sudden realization, you know, after years of spending time working hard to become a professor, I realized that's not my life purpose at all. I had to, but I had to go Didn't through that. Didn't you give that. up a promising career as yes. an academician? Yes, a prom I gave up the PhD, I gave up the promising career, and uh, my relatives, my mother thought I was insane to give that up, but I knew this is what I had to do. It was so clear, there was no doubt about it anymore. For a little while there was doubt and then the realization was so strong, I had to walk out of there. And that led to a period of uncertainty for a few years. I didn't know what am I supposed to do with my life. Here I am, I was just barely managing to survive. And gradually I lived, but I was not unhappy. I, I was happy with the present moment mm -hmm. then already. And then gradually, something evolved. People started asking me questions. People that I met casually in parks, casual. And gradually, a kind of spiritual teaching started to happen. And after a little while, when somebody called me for the first time, oh, you are a spiritual teacher, I said, oh, that's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the purpose came by itself. It came just out of that state of just being with what is, and not being unhappy with not knowing, mm -hmm. being at ease with not knowing. Mm -hmm. Then it's much more likely to come to you when you're at ease with not knowing. So the question that you can ask yourself, can I be at ease with, with not, not know. knowing? Because what you say on 274 that Ivy had mentioned earlier, you become comfortable with uncertainty, infinite possibilities open up in your life. And it means when you become comfortable with uncertainty, uh, it means fear is no longer a dominant factor in what you do and no longer prevents you from taking action to initiate change. That's the big thing. Yes. Because as long as you are afraid, you cannot allow the energy of what is supposed to happen to come into your life, as long yes. as you're afraid, right? Yes, the fear right. blocks that. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, be alert and watch your mind to see what kind of thoughts it produces. Feel also there may be the emotion of fear, as Oprah says, mm -hmm. arising occasionally, associated with a thought. Which like what's going to happen to me? Yes, because the mind wants to know what's, what, what the future is going to bring. But how dread life would be, how dreadfully boring it would be if you knew already what's going to happen. Well, part of that is because, too, uh, people get afraid because of, again, what Nick said. What, Nick is our spiritual teacher this way. Because of what <laughs> Nick said last week about worrying about your bills because yes. you're, you're living outside yourself. You're creating more debt, creating more debt, creating more debt, uh, allowing yourself to, be, to operate from the thinking mind. Yes. Uh, at the time that you made these decisions for yourself, you were living on, and practically, you said, at the poverty level. Yes. So. Yes. And so you survive somehow, you mm -hmm. make it. Uh, one more question before you go. Is there anything in your life that 
you, that you truly enjoy? Are there certain things that you enjoy doing that may not be necessarily associated in your mind with career? Not really. That I can think of. Nothing I can think of. Okay, then I what's left? What's left is for you to enjoy the present moment and yeah. make that your spiritual practice. Yeah. Okay. But I thought you were saying earlier, Ivy, about you know trying to align your passion, what you love, and getting paid for it. Isn't that what you were talking yeah. about earlier? Well, something I was passionate about to align something, like, to align what I'm passionate about once I figure that out. <laughs> I don't really know what that is right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and well, I will, I, to, to reiterate uh, something that uh, Eckhart was saying last week, it doesn't come out of your head. For everybody who's looking for that answer, for the purpose of your life, or what should I be doing, it does not come from your head. It's not something that you're ever going to think up. No. You don't think it. It comes from that space that we opened tonight's session with, being still and knowing that I am God. Being still and allowing the, the presence of a universal energy, the presence of consciousness to come through you in such a way that it's a feeling. It is a feeling. It is not something you're going to think up how to do it. And you will just, uh, you, will, you will start to feel that I feel better doing this thing than I feel doing the other thing. It's a feeling that comes to you, not... Not, not something that comes in your head, That's correct? That's right, yes. And you need to be careful that you are not in a state of dissatisfaction because right. when you're in dissatisfaction, it's, the answer is not likely to come, neither That's from right. within nor from without. So be, keep your inner space clear, aligned with now, so that no negativity arises. And then may I add also, for you and everybody else who's trying to get this whole idea of purpose, uh, some clarity about that, when you allow yourself to be still with it, you're not afraid of the uncertainty. The, the universe rises up to meet you. The world, uh, Eckhart says in here, I can't remember what page in this chapter, but he talks about how uh, coincidences happen. Yeah. You know, little things and big things happen. So you then have to be alert and paying attention to your life so when the opening shows itself, you're ready. Yes. Yeah. That, and that's much more likely to come when you're in a state of clarity, aligned with now, then the answer can come from within or the answer can come from without. Right. As some, a chance encounter, something you see in the paper, or, right. so, or something you can't even think where it might come from. It's a synchronistic event, a coincidence. Right. It shows itself. Yes. That's right. Yeah. In ways that you hadn't seen before. Thank you, Ivy, from Richmond, Thank you. Virginia. Thank you so Thank much. You. So you say on 261, while you're perhaps still waiting for something significant to happen to your life, you may not realize that the most significant thing that can happen to a human being has already happened within you. The beginning of the separation process of thinking and awareness. Which is the awakening, which is another way of, of explaining what the term awakening means, that before your awareness or your consciousness was totally identified with thought processes, with thinking. But now, and this is the case for everybody who reads this book and finds it meaningful. Right. It means if you are reading this book and you find it meaningful, something within you responds. It means you have already begun to, to awaken. awaken. Yeah. If you haven't, the book will be meaningless. Got it. <laughs> Got it. You say, as long as you are unaware of being on 263, you will seek meaning only within dimension of doing, the dimension of doing, and the future, that is to say, the dimension of time. Whatever meaning or fulfillment you find will dissolve. Invariably, it will be destroyed by time. And meaning we find on that level is true only relatively and temporary. Yes. So you're saying looking outside yourself, you're not going to find the meaning. No, that's right. Yeah. So let's go to the Beau Dutrie Bookstore in West Hollywood. Is Nick there tonight? Well, Nick, step on up to the microphone. <laughs> You're back. So glad to see you. Good to be here. <laughs> okay. You have a question tonight? Um, I do. And um, actually, uh, my question uh, kind of relies on a premise that's not exactly stated in the book. Uh, but the premise is God is love. And if God is love, and you love what you're doing uh, as far as a career, then God, does God then sanction that career? And is it then meant to be 
uh, is it right if, uh, let's say, if you don't go to church, but if you enjoy doing something like reading, uh, and if you're reading constantly and, and you get a more spiritual feeling from reading than ever walking into a church, then isn't that, isn't that right? Isn't that in alignment with, um, or is, is love not anything that matters in a career choice? Oh. Well, good question. Now, love, of course, is used in a very loose sense. It means so many different things to different people. And the expression, I love this or that, or I love doing this or that, is used casually by people, often meaning totally different things. For example, if somebody is obsessed with what they do in an ego way, totally focused, but in a negative way to a large extent, uh, totally f obsessed with what they are doing, uh, and they, an outside observer might say, oh, he loves what he's doing. He loves it so much that he gets up at 5 every morning and doesn't, go, leave, doesn't leave the office until 10 at night. But he's totally obsessed with what he's doing, and there's no love in it. It's an obsession. But in a, in, because love is used in such a loose way, sometimes we call that love. Mm -hmm. So when you actually love what you're doing, it's a totally different energy field that moves into what you are doing. It means you are aligned completely with what you do. Mm -hmm. And then, yes, then you do bring a different consciousness. You bring the unconditioned consciousness into this world through whatever you do. And it might be a doing, or it may just be being somewhere. You mention a church. You can find God in many places. Every, any place is holy. And the present moment, when you only pay attention to it completely, then you realize, actually, it's sacred. The present moment is sacred. When, you're really, when you really bring attention to it, and then it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in a building. You can be out in nature. You can be in the middle of the traffic, and you really bring your attention to this moment, and you realize there is a sacredness here. Mm -hmm. You may be able to feel it more deeply when you're out in nature than in the middle of L.A. freeway, but even there, it can be sensed if you are present enough. And there, that's love. There, lo love arises. And if you're doing something, and you're total in what you do, not obsessed, not wanting the future more than you want the present, mm -hmm. but totally wanting the present, totally wanting what you are doing. Then, yes, then you love what you do, and that is true love. And anybody who embodies that energy is creating the new earth. And so that's so, correct, then? Yes. If there's a difference. I, I guess I'm thinking of Joseph Campbell, where he talks about following your bliss, mm -hmm. and he talks about how uh, appetitive desires like uh, eating and sex and drugs, things through the body, loves that come through the body are nothing compared to the love that comes from the spirit, which um, makes everything else pale in comparison. Yes. And that is the bliss that Joseph Campbell talks about. Yes. And that's, that's, what, I, that's what I think you mean yes. uh, when you say that we are present and we're doing what we're supposed to do because we feel that feeling that makes everything else pale in comparison. That's right. um, yeah. Nick, that's what he's talking about at the bottom of 261. So while you're perhaps still waiting for something significant to happen in your life, you may not realize that the most significant thing that can happen has already happened within you. The beginning of the separation process of thinking and awareness. When you take yourself out of your head and take yourself out of the doing, 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 and allow yourself to connect with the consciousness or spirit or soul, whichever word you want to use for it, that is connected to all consciousness. Mm -hmm. The spirit that is cr create connected to the greater spirit is what he's talking about. Yes. And, you and, got it, Nick. Uh, <coughs> Nick, <coughs> you got it. it's a lot of hard work. What can I say? <laughs> Nick, uh, listen, I didn't worry this week because he's told you not to worry. Have you been worried about your bills this week? Uh, no, he just... Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's a uh, 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 One more thing, when, just to add to this. When the doing, when you're doing 
in that uh, state of consciousness, that means whatever you do is not primarily a means to an end, Correct. but an end in itself. Right. You know what you want to achieve through the doing, that's fine, but the essence of the doing is in, in, in the doing, not the goal that you want to achieve through it. So often the question you can ask yourself is, is what I'm doing right now primarily a means to an end or am I total in what I do? And there's a different quality flows into what you do when it is not just a means to an end. And that is doing in the state of presence and different energy flows into that. I love that. We're at the bottom of 263. You say, for example, if caring for your children gives meaning to your life, because everybody's looking for meaning, yes. what happens to the meaning when they don't need you anymore and perhaps don't even listen to you anymore? If helping others gives meaning to your life, you depend on others being worse off than yourself so that your life can continue to be meaningful and you feel good about yourself. If the desire to excel, win, or succeed, I'm at the top of page 264, everybody, uh, at this or that activity provides you with meaning, what if you never win or your winning streak comes to an end? Making it in whatever field is only meaningful as long as there are thousands or millions of others who don't make it. So you need other human beings to fail so that your life can have meaning. I was going to ask, though, what if you're making it, you're aligned with your purpose? Yes. Now, after that, it doesn't yes. say that those things should not be pursued immediately after what you just read. Yes. It says, I'm not saying here that helping mm. others, <clears throat> caring for your children, or striving for excellence in whatever field are not worthwhile things to do. For many people, they're important. In the end, though, you say it means you should connect them to your inner primary purpose so that a deeper meaning flows into what you do. Yes. For yeah. example, then, if, for example, we talked about looking after your children and the, that being the main purpose of your life. Yeah. And again, we have the two dimensions of purpose. Outer purpose, which is what a good parent does anyway. Right. You look after the needs of the child. What right. You, and, and you protect the child as much as possible. But is the inner purpose there also? Which the inner purpose is there when a field of awareness arises between you and the child, there's a space. Are you able to give the child spaciousness or space? Are you able to be open and listen to the child in non-judgmental way? Are you able to be with be. your child? Are you able to be with your child? Or are you lost McCarthy in was doing? Saying. Is it continuous doing? doing? Yeah. Or can you bring being into your relationship with your child? And if you bring being in, that is you're fulfilling the inner purpose. And, and then when the child grows up, it's less, much less likely or improbable that you will get attached to your role of parent. You will then be able to let go of the role and then be... be and then able to be, be whatever you need to yes. be in any given situation. Yes. All right. You say, if you ignore your inner purpose, that's why I keep reading from the book, because I think I want to stress how important it is to connect to inner purpose. If you ignore your inner purpose, bottom of 264, no matter what you do, even if it looks spiritual, the ego will creep into how you do it, and so the means will corrupt the end. The common saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, points to this truth. So in other words, not your aims or your actions are primary, but the state of consciousness out of which they come. Fulfilling your primary purpose is laying the foundation for a new reality, a new earth. Doesn't that mean that it's not just what you do, but it's the intention behind what you, which, which you do it? Yes, the, mm -hmm. the consciousness that flows into what you do. And uh, there's no future is always secondary in the doing. That is the your future is, is not what, that you look forward to primarily, but totality in what you do, being totally here. Any performer, any artist know this very well. Uh, I, can you be, when you're total, then a completely different energy arises. That's right. Uh, I sometimes, I, I, you see, in, uh, when the moment the artist performs, sometimes the, uh, there's an empowerment that suddenly comes in because then, it's sometimes only then that this person can be absolutely total in yeah. the present moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. I was with Tina Turner and Cher this weekend. Yes. The show that we're doing on May 8th. Everybody don't miss that. Tina Turner and Cher. And watching them in rehearsal, you know, sitting 
in the, uh, you know, we were just all sitting in the bleachers and watching. And, and then when they each came to the stage, something happened where there was like, uh, they were infused by something from, an, from another level yes. that, that you could see. Yes. Something came over them yes. on the stage. And whatever that was, this is so interesting, watching them perform, and I heard you say, I want some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I want some of that. And what that is, is the, is the presence or yes. level of consciousness that they're bringing. Yes. Not just the beat and the rock and roll. No. no. And, and that's also what people respond to. They go yeah. there because they can sense there, there's something there that is very powerful. Very powerful. Yeah. Inspiration and enthusiasm. Yes. Yeah, and yes. you say when the combination of inspiration and enthusiasm, something happens that's bigger than one person. Yes. Yeah. So Gwyn and Bob have spent the last 17 years teaching at schools on U.S. military bases throughout Europe. They now live outside Munich, uh, Germany, and are Skyping us from their kitchen. Hi, Gwyn and Bob from Munich. Hello. Hi. 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 Hello to you all. It's the middle of the night there, early morning. What's your question? Yes. Um, well... My question's about apologizing. I'm reading on page 258. You say the most important thing to realize is your life has inner and outer purpose. And I have found that um, apologizing when it's um, the right time helps me get back in alignment. However, when I've been wronged by someone, I expect to hear that apology to help build the relationship and get it back to a positive way. Um, and I like feeling comfortable around others. And when there's not closure and not and apologies don't come, I feel very uncomfortable. And I'm beginning to wonder if this is my ego at play. And how can I maintain an inner and outer alignment when I don't feel I had an appropriate apology from the person I expected it from? Well, you just answered your own question, really. I'm going to let Eckhart answer <laughs> it. But you just answered your own question because you just, key word here, appropriate. I have not received the appropriate apology from people. That would be your ego that needs that appropriate apology. Take it away, Eckhart. <laughs> 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 Mr. <Good>. Tolwin. <laughs> and adding to that, uh, of course, the ego, another thing the ego does, it keeps accounts and it says, you owe me. Yeah. And in this case, of course, it says, you owe me an apology. Now, yeah. this is good because this is an opportunity for you to become aware of the ego in you. So whenever the ego arises and you recognize it as the ego, it's a great opportunity of saying, oh, there's the ego. There's, there, there are the thoughts that the ego produces in my mind which say, he should apologize. She should have apologized. And another thought that comes, I can't be comfortable with this person anymore unless he or she apologizes. Mm -hmm. So you can observe the thoughts that the ego produces and you can observe the emotions that are there as the result of those thoughts. So it's a wonderful opportunity for you to see your own ego, which is no more than the human ego. It means there's anything wrong with you. Right. Uh, but to observe the ego in action. This is always the greatest thing. To, and then at that moment when you become aware of this kind of thought, emotional, mental, emotional pattern in you, who are you? When you recognize it, you're already in the space of awareness from where you recognize it. And you take away its power. You diminish yes. its power. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of, so people, there are many reasons why people don't apologize. People don't apologize because they may not even know that there is anything to apologize in their view of things. Mm -hmm. Or they may not apologize because their interpretation of what's happened is the complete opposite of your interpretation. And perhaps they think, or their ego thinks, that you should apologize. <laughs> or, <laughs> or... I like to think I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, other, I, other... I get it. Yeah. But also that's how you're using it, based on what you're saying, you, you, based on what you've just told us here. It's your ego's way of feeling uh, superior because... You like to yeah. think you do, and you're the one that goes and says, well, I apologized, and you didn't. Or, yes. or you can keep a resentment inside for quite a while, and in a resentment, whenever you think of that person or you meet that person, there's a little resentment there at the back, which is also the ego. The resent ego loves hanging on to resentments, 
And when resentments go on for a long time, as I've described somewhere in the book, yeah. they become grievances. Right. Grievances are heavy, long-term resentments. resentments. So you can observe that in yourself and again uh, be happy that you are observing, able to observe the ego in you. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. And of course, if, and then another person, the other person who is not apologizing, perhaps it's the ego who prevents them from apologizing because the ego in many people, this is not a particular function perhaps of your ego, but in many other people, the ego finds it almost impossible to apologize because it believes that it would be losing something by apologizing, which of course is a delusion. So these things happen. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to see your own ego, and by seeing it, realize awareness grows in you. That's right. Bob, what's your question for Eckhart? Yes, on page 265, Eckhart refers to your external purpose becomes charged with spiritual power because your aims and intentions will be one with the evolutionary impulse of the universe. I love that. What is, what is the evolutionary impulse of the universe? That is so great. Okay. Let's read that one more time. Yeah. Once that foundation, you, he says, fulfilling your primary purpose is laying the foundation for a new reality, a new earth. Once that foundation is there, your external purpose becomes charged with spiritual power because your aims and intentions will be one with the evolutionary impulse of the universe. Thank you, because I had written aha and did three little, I've read it three times and I got <laughs> stars, circles, everything <laughs> around that. That's a great, thank you for bringing that up, Bob. Okay. What do you mean by that? Now, um... I'm not sending you back to the book, but the answer is somewhere in the book. So, but I'm not sending you there now. Okay. So let's look at it. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the evolutionary purpose of the universe is the growth of consciousness. It's going towards something is flowing into this world of so-called matter, physicality. Something is flowing into this world of physicality or matter that comes from a different dimension, almost, one could say. Well, how do I know this? Because I know it in myself. Mm -hmm. And I know it, I've observed it in other people, too. Mm -hmm. Something is flowing into this world of this heavy, well, it seems to be very heavy, the heaviness of matter. Something very different flows in, which I call consciousness, mm -hmm. which you can call spirit. So a spirit is beginning, has already started a long time ago, but more, now beginning more fully through the human form, amongst other forms, to come into this world more and more fully. This is the arising of awareness, the arising of presence. And all that is part of the greater evolution because there's a famous dictum, which is so true, as above, so below. So whatever happens here on this planet and in the human form, will be reflected throughout the universe. These are universal movements. As above, so below. As below, so above. So there's a, what it happens here in, mic, in the microcosm of the Earth will also be happening in the macrocosm. So when I say how people might ask me, how do you know what the purpose of, what the evol purpose of the universe is, the evolution of the universe is, because I know it in myself. It's, if you know it in yourself, you know many, many answers, even about the macrocosm, because the macrocosm is no more than a reflection of the inner. And you see it all the time in nature. Yes. You see it all the time in nature. The whole process that's going on in nature is also going on with humans. Yes. If we compare ourselves to, to nature. Yes. Yeah, the principles are the same. Yes. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Bob? Kind of. No, don't. You have to, to really know the answer. You have to go within. It's not through the mind or through somebody like listening to me and then saying, okay, I believe what you said. I don't want anybody to believe what I said. I want people to, to really go within and verify within themselves whether or not that is true in their own experience. So by becoming more conscious of your inner being, Okay many answers will come. Okay, let me, let, me, let me take a stab at it, interpreting what I hear uh, Eckhart saying. He's saying that there is, you know, there's a universal source or power of energy that all of us, that, that 
we all stem from that universal power or source or energy. You're with me, right? And you can call it God, you can call it whatever you choose to call it, you can call it, you know, higher consciousness, or you can call it universal energy, you can call it the divine. When you tap into the part of you that is, we're calling consciousness, or presence, or inner purpose, when you tap into that, that is connected to the source of all universal power and energy. You with me so far? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when you tap into that part of you that is connected to all universal power and energy, um, your aims and intentions will be one with what all universal power and energy is striving for. And what it's striving for is for you to allow the consciousness to come through you as a human being. So that's what he means by evolutionary impulse. The impulse of the universe is to support you and you bringing about your higher consciousness. That's why you're here, is to allow that part of you that is connected to all that is universal energy, the source or God, to, to, to better explain it, it is the God in you. When you allow the God in you to come forth, the God of all things supports that. Yeah. And you just gave yeah. us a demonstration of that because the whole energy shifted when you spoke those words. A very powerful energy came through. So beyond what you said, mm -hmm. the energy that came through with it was actually a demonstration of that. Well, thank you. It's true. <laughs> Did it? Yeah. Good. It. You got it now, Bob. Yeah. Can I ask one more thing? Sure, sure. Would there be a way to, to convey um, Eckhart's teachings on, on awareness to Christians who are probably offended by labels like evolution? Uh, is there a way to convey this message? Of the awakening without getting into the evolution. So people are going to really shut down when they hear the word evolution. Well, if they are completely shut down, then of course there's no way they are going to listen to you. But not all those people are going to be completely shut down. I don't believe that evolution is necessarily a problem for all Christians. Yeah, an evolutionary process, the evolutionary impulse of the universe is about the evolvement as the Earth I mean, because even as Christians, you know that the earth keeps evolving. It keeps evolving. It keeps moving forward. We as human beings keep evolving. Uh, yes, you can see it in your own life. You can see it in you your evolve. own life. You're not the same as you were, you know, 25 years ago. That is your evolutionary process as Bob yes. and Gwen here on the planet. Bob and Gwen have evolved yes. as Christians. Yes. And even as you are a practicing Christian, in the beginning of practicing Christianity, you're not, your faith may not be as strong or you, not be, you may not be as tested, but you evolve in the process of your, your Christianity. Actually, can you ask somebody in the back to bring me the email, Dean, from, that came in from a message board this week that I thought the woman who talked about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost uh, as consciousness and that the, there was a beautiful email from, that, that came on the message board from a woman who's, who's you know, a practicing Christian who said that she was uh, Catholic. And um, I'm going to try to get the emails because she best, better, best. And I had, a, I had an aha moment reading it because I thought, oh, that's right. The Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the higher consciousness that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you just call it consciousness. Mm -hmm. But as a Christian, it is the Holy Spirit where Jesus said, I leave you. Yes with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You see that, right, Bob? Mm -hmm. Oh, Gwen? yeah. Yeah. It, it's just the use of that word sometimes puts some people off that might otherwise have the door to be awakened and just knowing that word is in the book, they might just say, oh, I, I'm not well, quite ready evolution. to do that yet. Right, evolution. Evolution. So, yeah. Well, it, I think it, it will particularly put people off who take a literal, to, uh, absolutely literal interpretation of Genesis. But yes. most Christians, I believe, don't 
to take an absolutely literal interpretation of Genesis, and they would be. And perhaps, if you do, then that's not for you. Then no, this that's, then this that's isn't fine. the path. Then you need to, no. to follow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but if you're open to the idea that this, the creation may not be literally true, but that there is actually, it's a description of an evolutionary process, not of blind chance. This is what Christians object to mostly, and I also see it, it's absurd. There is no, it's not blind chance. Evolution is not something of coming together over billions of years of atoms and molecules accidentally to bring about this beautiful universe. I do not believe that, that there is no guiding intelligence behind evolution. There is. Mm -hmm. That is so obvious when you look at the world and you look at yourself. You know the famous analogy of the monkey and the typewriter? No, I don't. Oh, <laughs> they say... <laughs> a famous analogy. Yeah, this is to do with, uh, to describe what, what evolution means by people who believe it is blind chance. It's a mechanical, mechanistic thing that mm -hmm. how evolution happened all chance events, that would mean if you put a monkey at a typewriter mm -hmm. and this monkey is uh, immortal and this monkey starts hit hitting the keys of the typewriter and goes on for a billion years or two billion years or longer, mm -hmm. they say if evolution as chance development is true, then eventually the monkey is going to produce by chance the works of Shakespeare <laughs> over a billion years. It, right. it's, it's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> I miss that monkey in the typewriter analogy <laughs> somewhere in my uh, <laughs> college upbringing. But, but you see the... Yes, uh, I see it. Yeah, I see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he has the quote. Um, uh, Bob and Gwen, can we go back to them? This is from somebody named Button20. Did you see this last week? No. You don't see the message boards, do you? Um, actually, she's Joni in Long Beach, actually. Um, she said, my faith was strong... Oprah, 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 my faith was strong, but now it's growing stronger and stronger every day. The words of the Bible, she said, are just jumping out at me. How could I have not seen them so clearly before? Like, be still and know that I am God. I will not leave you alone. I will always be with you. This book, New Earth, uh, has put into words what I've always felt from within. As a Catholic, I can describe my faith very simply. It's based on the Holy Trinity, which is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's it in a nutshell. The rest of the Bible is just the history lesson as to how all that came about. To say it another way, God created the world, saw what a mess we were making, sent his son down to teach us how to live. Then Jesus said, when he knew he was going to have to leave us, I will ask my Father, and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with you always, the Spirit of truth, which the world cannot accept because it neither sees nor knows it, because it remains in you and will be in you. John 14, 16. And here it is again, she writes, John 14, 26, 27. The Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you, do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. And you know what, Oprah? I got it this time when I read it. I really got it. People wouldn't be so afraid if they only knew that the energy flowing through their very being, which I choose to call the Holy Spirit, is the most fabulous wireless connection to the most powerful source in the universe, the God that created us. May God bless you and keep you safe in his grace. You're truly one of his messengers. And that's from Joni of Long Beach, California. And she writes, ends with, life is a gift, live every day as a thank you note. Very good. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, I just thought this was so fantastic. So I'm happy to share that with you. That's what, that's what one Christian had to say, okay? Thank you. It's very nice. I thought that was great, too. Joni of Long Beach. I almost Skyped her this week. I thought, isn't that perfection? Yes. I thought that was Beautiful. perfection. Beautiful. Thanks, Gwen and Bob. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, shall we continue here? You say your inner purpose is to awaken. It's as simple as that. You share that purpose with every other person on the planet because it is the purpose of humanity. So let's again talk about what it means to awaken. Doesn't the very word purpose imply that you can do something about it? 
purpose means on purpose. That's right. I ask that question. You say you in, can't make it happen, that it is an act of grace, this awakening. Yes, and what I talk about is the, the first moment of awakening. It happens or it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. First moment, which is the disidentification from the stream of thinking and the arising. It might only be a glimpse at first. The arising of awareness. You're suddenly becoming aware that there is a realm underneath thinking. There's a realm of stillness inside you. Mm -hmm. You touch it. Maybe you're out in nature and suddenly, as you did when you were on the mountaintop. Oh, I had another one. You know what? Yeah. I had another one. Just um, Friday, and this is going to be on this Friday, but this past Friday I was at Tom Cruise's house. You know Tom Cruise. Not personally. But. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know he I jumped on your sofa. Oh, Yo, you even know that. Okay. <laughs> you even know that. Okay. We're, we're going to talk about that. Now I'm jumping on his. I went to his house to jump on his. Anyway, um, Tom Cruise lives in the. I, I could cry just thinking about it. He lives in the most magnificent place I have ever seen read, heard, or experienced in my life. I, I tell you, I drove to, th through his house through this grove of aspen trees for like a half mile before we get to the gate. He lives at the top of a mountain, and he, the house sits in the center, and you're surrounded by all the mountains of Telluride. And we went outside through his bedroom to stand on the balcony, and there are all these aspen trees around, and the mountains, and absolute stillness absolute stillness so much I st my eyes started to water I've never I've never seen anything more beautiful or felt anything so deep so so rich and um, aside from that time I was on my mountain but I, 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 I and I, I said to him first of all what it takes to be the kind of person that comes to this that ha that has that as your space and, you know, he's had a lot of, you know, things going on in his life. And I said, no matter what, you have this. You have, you have this place to come to, my God. How it just, and I felt so filled up when I left from the stillness. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And we stood out on Tom's balcony and I said, Tom, can you hear the silence? It has its own language. And he said, yeah, you're right, it does. It has its own language. Was he already aware of it? Or yeah, he made was. Him... No, he was, yeah. he was aware of it. He was aware of it, yeah. 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 Wonderful. That was my moment with Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> that you'll get to see. Now, when you see us, see us on television this Friday, you, you won't get all of that because it's all about the interview and stuff. But I had a, a spiritual moment with, with Tom at the top of the mountain. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are wonderful moments of grace. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, you don't necessarily need, need to be in those beautiful places. It's a great, it's an act of grace when it happens. Yeah. But that stillness is primarily an, an inner dimension and it can arise anywhere. Mm -hmm. As, but sometimes it's good to have experienced it there where the envir environment is most conducive to experiencing ultimately the inner because if you don't feel it on the inner, you won't really be aware of, this, of the silence around you. That's right. It's only through the inner that you can be aware of the outer silence. So to, to be aware of silence, uh -huh. how, uh, how can you be aware of silence? Only by being still. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Because it's only the stillness in you that is aware of the silence. If your mind were totally occupied with noisy thinking, you wouldn't even know it's still around you. Or you would say for a moment, oh, it's very still, and then you carry on thinking. Right. You wouldn't really experience it. So there's the, the equivalent of outer stillness. The, this is the outer dimension of spirit. Right. Say, is you, can, you can sense the spirit that's out there in nature, but you can only sense it because you already have it within you. It's uh -huh. that in you that responds, that senses it. So only people whose mind is not totally noisy can actually be aware of silence mm. and so uh, I sometimes observe when I go I will go for a walk in the forest every day and often I see people who are jogging or walking their dogs and very few are really there mm -hmm. they're talking they're talking on the phone they have headphones on 
uh, they're talking to their friends, and or they're immersed so they could in be thinking. Anywhere. They could, could be, be anywhere, anywhere right. in the office. Right. Yeah. Um, someone asked, uh, Eckhart, everything you say in your book resonates with my spirit, so I believe it to be true. However, do people ever ask you how you know all of this? If so, how do you respond? Where does your knowledge come from? This is Renee in Indianapolis. Well, that's Where does it. your knowledge come <laughs> from? How do you know what you know? <laughs> well, the essence of it comes through inner realization. It, in other words, it's by touching the consciousness that one is, that yes. you are. It comes through becoming still and listening for what comes out of the stillness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not primarily based on knowledge, although, of course, I have read spiritual books, mm -hmm. quite a few. I use sometimes some of the terminology that is already in existence, has mm -hmm. been in existence for a long, long time. But the book is more than just a compilation of other spiritual books that I have read. The essence of the book is in my own realization. So in other words, the answers come by being still. When I write, I sit there with a notepad, a pen, and become still. Not on computer? No. Okay. Everything is done by hand. Mm -hmm. So I, and then I wait for some a movement of thought to come out of the stillness. Mm -hmm. And then gradually a thought formulates itself. And then there is a critical faculty that says, okay, does that make sense? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't make sense, I become still again. And then perhaps a thought, a thought that is more suited to what I can sense comes up. And then I write it down. So did you write this book from the place of inner space? You know, last week we talked about inner space. And uh, I was a little frustrated until the end of the class because I was trying to get this concept of inner space across to all of our uh, viewers and listeners. And at the end of last week's class, um, as we'd gone off the air here, Eckhart said, I said, I'm, I said, remember I said to you, I'm a little frustrated. Yeah. And you said, because you cannot understand it through concepts and language, no. that inner space isn't something you can understand with your mind. No. So as an explanation, it's not very it's not very satisfying when one talks about inner stillness and then people try to understand, okay, what's he actually talking about? And you can see already when you're in your head and say, inner stillness, what's, what's that about? Well, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make, of course it doesn't well, to the say, mind. people say, it's all that woo-woo stuff. Yes, yeah. that's what some journalists uh, often say. They come to spirituality and say, oh, it's all that stuff. Goo -goo, they goo -goo. don't give themselves a chance. Yeah. You really, it's, it, you have to give yourself a chance and see whether you can sense in yourself that to which these words point. Yes. So, and only then does it become real and alive. And that is the same thing we're saying to Bob and Gwen when Bob is trying to say, what do you mean by the evolutionary impulse of the universe? What that really means is that when you are in alignment, when your inner purpose is aligned with what you do, that you will be supported by the spirit of God or by universal energy in such a way that life opens up to you. Mm -hmm. And people think, oh, it's about you being lucky or, gee, isn't that strange that this happened or mm -hmm. serendipitous things happen. Things fall into line, yes. right, when you are in alignment. Yes, that they fall into line. That's uh, one way or another. Everybody can experience that. So why not give it a try? Live as if the present moment were more important than past and future. On a practical level, of course, you still use mm -hmm. past and future. But give your attention to this. Spend some, a few days or a few weeks living in that way. Immediately surrendering negativity when it arises and mm -hmm. recognizing it as ego-based or pain body-based. Because all ego, all negativity is ego-based? Well, negativity loves ego. It's a denial of life. The mm -hmm. moment you identify with negativity, that's part of the ego. Mm -hmm. So experiment with, because you've lived in one particular state of consciousness for many years, mm -hmm. try something different and see what happens. And what happens primarily and first of all is an inner shift. And after a little time gap sometimes, it gets reflected in the outer realm also. But that's no longer the main thing because the main thing is already that you enter that state of peaceful, alive presence in yourself when mm -hmm. you're aligned with what is, aligned with the now. And that's what matters. The rest is the icing on the cake. When good things happen to you, 
it doesn't mean you now feel good because something good has happened to you. Something good has happened to you because you've already found the goodness within you. That's right. So you can only manifest that which you already are. Yes. Yes, you already are that. Whatever people are looking for, whatever form, they already are that. <laughs> They're looking for God. And I'm not saying that this form is God. I'm not saying that this person is God. I'm saying the essence, if you go deep enough within, there is a, a realm where you and God merge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's everybody's destiny and purpose to live from that place of connectedness. Yes, because the I am, the I am, is I am that which comes from God. Yes. I am that which comes from God. Yes. Laurie lives in New Brunswick, Canada, and she's Skyping us from her family room in St. John. Hello, Laurie. Hello, Oprah. Hello, Ecker. Hello. Welcome to Hello. our conversation here this evening. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What do you want to say to us? I would like to comment on the dialogue on inner purpose that begins on page 262. Uh, there are parts of that dialogue, the, the parts that were written in italics, that could have been me speaking word for word. In fact, those were the reasons that I think I was drawn to the book in the first place. Um, I turned 38 this summer, and I've had two members of my immediate family uh, die in their mid-30s. So their deaths have left me very keenly aware of the immediacy of my own living and how, how important it is for me to um, align my life, uh, however long it shall be, uh, with my inner purpose and to make sure that the relationships that I have with people, my husband and my children especially, are genuine and that I conduct my life from that place of higher consciousness. So my question is, I'm so aware of how important and precious every moment of this human experience is. I don't want to waste a moment of it on anger or resentment or disappointment. Some days I'm just more conscious than others. So I ask Eckhart, do you believe that two people can actually live in an intimate relationship with one another, either as partners or as parent, uh, parent and child, without wanting from one another? And do two people have to be at the same place in their spiritual awakening for this to happen? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Now, when I say without wanting, what I mean, of course, is without saying, I want you. You are my property. I'm, you, you, you must not leave me. Otherwise, I will get extremely angry. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, it does, I'm not saying that you might not say to your partner, I want you to take out the garbage because I took it out yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On a practical level, there may be some wanting. Uh, so the question is, can two people live together without that deep psychological wanting that wants to cling to the other person, says, fulfill me or make me happy, don't you dare leave me? That, right, that is the, the question. But I would like to... Um, change the question a little bit from can two people because you cannot be responsible for somebody else ask yourself the question can I live with my partner or whoever without bringing in this unconscious energy of wanting which comes from the ego can I live with the person like that because it only requires really one person to go through this shift in consciousness. So only you can really answer the question and it's not an abstract question. It's a question that you can only apply to the present moment to really answer it as an alive question rather than an abstract thing whether can people live in fully conscious together is an abstract question. A more powerful and a more vital question is, can I? And even that, not all my, for the rest of my life, not like that, no. How? Now. So you bring, to, to find the answer, a vital answer that is true for you, you have to remember that question as, as you live, situations arise in your relationship. See, at this moment, can I be free of that egoic 
wanting and needing. And if you cannot be free at this moment of this egoic wanting and needing, and because you cannot be free, negativity arises, because the partner is not responding to the wanting and needing, or isn't even there, hasn't come home yet, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> uh, then this is your chance again to be aware, as I meant to the other uh, questioner a little earlier on, this is your chance to become aware of the ego in you as the wanting. Yeah. So even if the answer, can I be free of wanting, is no, obviously I can't because they're still wanting in me, <laughs> then at least you're able to recognize the ego, and that means, how are you able to recognize the ego? You're becoming aware. And only when you dwell in awareness in your relationship can you be free of those unconscious movements. Yeah, I think the wanting that you're talking about is wanting you to be a certain way to help fill me up. Yes. That's what he's talking about. Not in terms of practical, I need you to pick up the laundry, I want you to pick up the milk, I want you to... That, that. That's very different than I want you to be what I want you to be so that you make me whole. You know that whole, you know, Tom Cruise as a matter of fact, Jerry Maguire line, you complete me. Wanting somebody yes. to complete you is what he's talking about, because nobody can. Yes, I think I misinterpreted that as being wanting, you know, wanting recognition from your spouse or wanting gratitude or wanting, wanting respect or things like that. And I, and I, I couldn't quite figure out how you live in an intimate relationship without wanting those things. And for me, in our, in our, we have a busy household. We have five little boys, all under the age of nine. There's always somebody wanting something around here. Where are you, in a uh, closed-off room somewhere <laughs> with the door locked? I am, and it's also 10 o'clock, so okay. they're all in bed. Okay. <laughs> but for me, um, I think, and you've talked a lot about people having their own um, spiritual, spiritual practice, and I guess for me right now, it's um, it's living amidst the the chaos of the day and not getting mired down in the muck of the daily routine and being able to stay above that, being being unflappable, um, and and keeping that sense of inner peace even though it's a little bit chaotic <laughs> in the immediate surroundings. Yes. Right, with five uh, boys under nine. Yes. Oh my God! Well, a, it's good, a noisy house. Yeah, a good practice here is not wanting to be this moment to be different from the way it is. Mm -hmm. Just this moment. That's where you relinquish the wanting. That is the main relinquishment or letting go of wanting. Not wanting this moment, and it's always this moment, to be different. So if the children are screaming and there's mayhem, that's what is. And then you deal with what is. But not the internal rejection of what is. Mm -hmm. So not wanting really deep down is not wanting this moment. This mo moment may come in the form of a person, mm -hmm. your partner, the children. At this moment, this is what is, and th not wanting this moment to be different from the way it is. Then you are aligned, and then you act. You take action. You can tell them, Sh stop doing that. But internally, you are free. You're not reacting internally. But what about what uh, Lori was saying about wanting recognition, not just from your spouse. A lot of people, you do things and you want people to recognize that you've done, to be, you know, I don't know, admired or, you know, ha receive affection in your relationship. Is that your ego? It often is, but if you believe that the world is withholding from you, I say that somewhere in the yes, book. Yes, you say it. Then. Uh, give what you think people owe you, give it, and then you see a reciprocal movement, not even necessarily from the very same people who you're giving it to. Uh -huh. but the, the universe reciprocates. If you give recognition, gratitude, whatever it is, you give it out, even to strangers. Recognition, yes. a smile, giving, so there's a flow of energy flows Because what you out. give out, what you put out is going to come back always. Always, yes. always, always. That's a universal law. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your moment of calm with the Five boys. <laughs> I'm going to miss this on um, Monday night. Well, thank this you very much. My... Is this your time for yourself? This is. Okay. Yeah, it's great. We, great. we work hard to carve out those moments of stillness around here. Well, 
We're going to continue with something we call the Soul Series on Monday night. There's a great, great interview that I've done with uh, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. Her mind actually, as we mentioned last week, she lost the left hemisphere of her brain yes. through a stroke. Yes. And the right hemisphere was still working. So all of the chatter stopped. And yes. she was in bliss. And she said, even though I was drooling, I was drooling, I was in, she, she was in heaven. She was in bliss. Yeah. Yes, I, I haven't used the terms right and left hemisphere in the book, and I rarely use scientific mm -hmm. terms, but that is how she sees it. I think she's right. That's right. So the, the right hemisphere is to do with uh, unity of knowing, not yes. conceptual. She said she stillness. felt the connection to all things. Yes. Yeah, yes. from the right hemisphere. Yes. So here we are, week nine, only one more class to go, and I bet so many people can relate to this. Many people, you say on page 262, who are going through the early stages of awakening are no longer certain what their outer purpose is. A woman from Milwaukee, Oregon, just wrote, can you still be 52 years old and be in the same place Ivy was at the beginning of this show, not knowing what you want to do? What drives the world, you say, no longer drives them. Seeing the madness of our civilization so clearly, they may feel somewhat alienated from the culture around them. So what do you do in this case? If you're at this point in your life where reading this book has shaken you up and you realize more than ever what you don't want to do, you realize, I have been on the wrong course. You realize yes. that you have an awakening. Yes. Now what do you do? Yes. I'm all awakened. Yes. Now what? Well. The awakening, of course, is the realization of your inner purpose, primarily. Yes. Uh, so d don't come into conflict with where you are now or what you're doing now. If you cannot surrender to what you're doing now and be, be okay with it, at least bring acceptance. We talk about in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. At least bring acceptance to whatever you're doing now so that you are okay with it. That's, that is vital. Then you are in a state of clarity. You, you enter a state of clarity when you are no longer in opposition to your present moment, life, where you live or what you are doing. If you cannot surrender, if whatever you are doing continues to produce unhappiness in you, and no matter how hard you try, then of course it's a clear sign that you need to leave that situation. Right. So either you let go of the resistance and see if you can. And sometimes people say, no, I can't. But what they really mean is, no, I'm not willing to. Not willing to, which <laughs> so is very you, different. You need to see the difference between not being able to and not being willing to. So whatever applies to you, am I not willing to accept this moment or am I truly incapable of accepting this moment? If you find you're truly incapable of accepting this moment where you're doing your job or whatever you're doing, then it is a sign that it's time for change. Got it. Um, many times you will be able to uh, uh, have this energy flow into what you're doing already and transform how you do perhaps what you've been doing for many years in perhaps in a state of resistance. Uh -huh. And suddenly, how you do it changes. You're no longer doing it in a state of inner resistance. And then you bring a completely, ener completely different energy into what you do consciousness flows into what you do and often either this is deeply fulfilling and it affects many people around you or it could also happen that that now that you're no longer resisting what you do change suddenly comes into your life I got that uh, this is a beautiful quote from page 266 you say that the great arises out of small things that are honored and cared for everybody's life really consists of small things Greatness is a mental abstraction and a favorite fantasy of the ego. The paradox is that the foundation for greatness is honoring the small things of the present moment instead of pursuing the idea of greatness. Yes. It's that one step. That's right. So many people have this idea, I want to achieve something great, great. or be somebody great, and they neglect the step that leads to greatness, they don't honor this step at this moment because they have this idea of some future moment where they are going to be great. Right. And then it's surprising when you truly look at people, perhaps, who you would say have achieved great things, mm -hmm. that even in their life, it really is a, a sequence of small steps because every moment is quite small. You, you are wherever you are at this moment. Some people believe 
not to mention you, some people believe I'm doing great work. I mean, I am because the consciousness is moving through this form. I don't feel personally responsible for what I do as mm -hmm. such. But even there, it is small steps. When the writing happens, there's a notepad and a pen, and there's the present moment, and there's the stillness. Very small. There's not some idea, I'm going to create a work that's going to change everybody's consciousness. No, I'm just true to this moment. What is mm -hmm. this moment requires? It's a blank piece of sheet of paper and a pen and the stillness. It's a small thing. Or when I give a talk, talk maybe 2,000 people come. Every, if I had this idea, I'm now going to give an important big talk mm -hmm. that would lead to stress and fear because maybe it's not going to be that great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but if you can be, st with every step being present, it's time to, the car comes to pick me up, a few steps into the car, then I sit in the car, the car moves towards the venue where the talk is going to be, I look out of the window, simple, people walking past, the tree, the sky, just this moment. Step out, st sit in the waiting, the green room to wait for the talk to start, breathing, simple, nothing big, just a little moment, this moment, being true to that. Then step onto the stage, there's an empty chair, I sit in it, still, breathe. I know there's 2,000 people there, and I also know I have no, word, what, no idea what's coming out of the, going to come out of this mouth. Uh -huh. Being happy with not knowing, still, not big, it's all small. It's all a sequence of very small moments. And by being true to the small moment, something great arises. Yeah, and the biggest lesson from tonight is by being true to the small moments, by being true to this moment, it means to bring the sense of presence, the sense of consciousness to every single moment so that everything that you do is fueled from a deeper level than your ego. Everything you do is fueled from a deeper level than your thoughts. That everything you do is fueled from your being. And that is what gives meaning and purpose to whatever you do. Yes. That's the essence. Yes. Right. It's wonderful to see you when the power comes through, you talk. It's beautiful. The words are so true. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. As I said, next week will be our last class on a new earth, the finale. But we don't want the discussion to end there. Please join me on Monday, May 12th, for the start of my soul series, just to continue this conversation for those of you who've been enjoying these uh, uh, webcasts here on Oprah.com. For the first time, we'll be broadcasting the videotape sessions of my um, XM radio show. It's where I get to talk to spiritual teachers. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. I talk to spiritual teachers, thinkers, and scholars about my favorite subject, the evolution of the soul. People like Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor, Wayne Dyer, Elizabeth Lesser, John Kabat-Zinn, Byron Katie, uh, Sarah Bonbronick, uh, Kathy Freston and others. So keep Monday nights at 8 p.m. reserved for Oprah.com. If you can, get away from the five noisy boys, whatever's <laughs> going on in your life. Tonight's class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our classes, you can do that tomorrow also at Oprah.com and iTunes. It's free because of the generous support of Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins. This week, you can update your workbook and get ready for our last class Chapter 10, A New Earth, How to Bring Awareness to Every Moment of Your Life. There really is no higher calling. Uh, we're going to go for two hours next week for, all of, for the benefit of wrapping up all the things we've been talking about these past 10 weeks. This was great. Yes. Thank you. This was a good class. Thank you. Good. We'll see you at number 10 coming up. <laughs> number 10. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks for your message boards. Wasn't this great? Tonight we're coming to you with a special two-hour finale of our New Earth webcast series. For 10 weeks, we've all met every Monday night for a global conversation. It's been really quite special. A global conversation about consciousness from the UK to Hong Kong, 
Russia, to all 50 states here in America, I just again want to say thank you to every one of you for helping us to create this new earth here with Eckhart Tolle and with me. So many of you have written to say that you want this forum to continue. So beginning next Monday, May 12th, I hope you'll join me for the start of my Soul Series webcast here on Oprah.com. For the first time, we'll be broadcasting the videotape sessions of my uh, XM radio show. Many of you didn't know I have a radio show. Yeah, I have a day job, a night job, a middle job, a <laughs> job. Um, it's where I get to talk to spiritual teachers and have been doing so for quite some time. Spiritual teachers and thinkers and scholars about this, my favorite subject, the evolution of our soul. So keep Mondays reserved for Oprah.com. You can begin downloading um, next Monday. Tonight's the last chapter, chapter 10 of A New Earth. And uh, before we get started, let's begin with silence. Yes. Would you like to lead us, sir? A moment of stillness. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, as you know, you need to put your attention somewhere in order to find the stillness. The attention needs to move out of the dimension of thinking. Mm -hmm. So we have practiced in the past with putting our attention into the inner feeling of aliveness in the body. Mm -hmm. We've also, I believe, put our attention on our breath. And we've put our attention on sense perceptions, whatever we can see or hear outside. But this time we go one step further, and I suggest this is a little bit more subtle. As we enter this moment of stillness, we put our attention on the fact that we are conscious. In other words, we become aware that there is a light in us, I'm using light metaphorically, a presence, a space of awareness that is pure attention. So instead of being aware of something, our breath or the inner body or sense perceptions, let's just be aware that we are aware. You feel your own presence and become still. Let's be aware that we are aware and become still. That was good. Yeah. I think even Dean, the stage manager, became aware. Was aware. <laughs> right, Dean? Good. The themes of Chapter 10 are truly um, the culmination, I think, of what all of our work has been about, how to bring consciousness to every moment and to every action of our lives, and in the process, learning that uh, we are far greater than anything that we could have imagined ourselves to be. So. We're going to get started. You talk about the brief history of your life on page 282, the coming into manifestation of the world as its return to the unmanifested, its expansion and contraction. On the previous page, you talked about the earth uh, expanding, the universe really expanding and contracting. Those two movements are reflected throughout the universe in many ways, such as in the incessant expansion and contraction of our heart, as well as the inhaling and exhaling of our breath. They're also reflected in the cycles of sleep and wakefulness. Each night without knowing it, I love this, you return to the unmanifested, capital S, source of all life, when you enter the stage of deep, dreamless sleep, and then reemerge again in the morning, replenished. Uh, those two movements, the outgoing and return, are also reflected in each person's life cycles. Out of nowhere, so to speak, you suddenly appear in this world, Birth is followed by expansion. There's not only physical growth, but also growth of knowledge and activities and possessions. This is a time where you're mainly concerned with finding or pursuing your outer purpose. Each person's life, each life form, in fact, represents a world, a unique way in which the universe experiences itself 
And when your form dissolves, a world comes to an end out of countless worlds. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so beautiful. That's the bottom of page 283, everybody. Each person's life, each life form, in fact, represents a world, a unique way in which the universe experiences itself. So we are manifestations of the universe experiencing itself as each of us. Yes. And that takes you out of this illusion that all you are is this limited little person. This is, uh, on the surface of things, you are this person with a name and a form, but in, your, in the depths of your being, you are the universe experiencing itself in this form. And this, just this thought brings about a little shift in the way, way in which you perceive yourself. And everybody else. Yes, yes. We are the universe, or the source of all life, or the creator, or God, whichever name you choose to use, expressing itself in our particular form. Yes, in and through this form. So there's not, the, people usually perceive themselves as being, this is me, mm -hmm. and there's the universe, right. or the world, and there's the me and the rest of the world. But you are the universe, you are the life. We're the not one separate. Life. Not separate. Yeah. Each person's life, each life form, represents a world, a unique way in which the universe experiences itself. And when your form dissolves, a world comes to an end, one of countless worlds. Wow, that's really powerful. So let's talk about the awakening and the return movement. What is the return movement in a person's life? Uh Usually you start off with the outward movement as you grow up and as you go into adolescence and adulthood. You start building your life, you acquire experiences, you acquire knowledge, you acquire possessions. Uh, your sphere of influence extends, so that's the expansion. You grow uh, and usually that goes up to a certain age. It varies from person to person unless I talk about it also, unless this period of expansion is interrupted by some traumatic event. Mm -hmm. We can come to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So there's the expansion, and then when people reach a certain age, suddenly a different movement starts. Things, the body is no longer as strong, not working so well anymore. People around you begin to die, they reach a certain age. And so there's another movement that at some point comes into people's lives, which we could call the uh, dissolution of form. It's gradually happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our culture, we don't like to talk about that. And this is why most old people are hidden away in homes. You rarely see, you have to go to third world countries to really see the reality of what it's human like to life. Yes. And also we have such a fear of it, and, it is, and not just a fear, a disdain for it. So we do everything to make ourselves look younger. Everything is about looking younger, being younger, younger, yes. younger, younger. Yes. Yeah. Now the return movement is, is, is also when the, where the spiritual dimension can come into your life very strongly, when the form with which perhaps for many years you had been identified, which um, is the physical form and the form of my life, all the things that you had built up and identified with, mm -hmm. your job, your status, your profession, your, your possessions. And that, when that begins to become a little bit shaky, then it is very often at that point that there's the possibility for the spiritual dimension to come into your life. When, when the, the solidity of the outer forms is, uh, becomes diminished. Right. Uh, so traditionally, in, uh, there's still the, um, uh, in India, for example, there's still a tradition when a, a, a man reaches a certain age, he uh, withdraws from society. He, he sometimes even, some people still practice it, but not so many these days. Mm -hmm. He even leaves his family if he knows that his family is being looked after. His, uh, he leaves and becomes a solitary uh, mendicant or monk to in order to go deeply within mm -hmm. so that's but you don't need to do that all we need to be aware is that when the return movement starts when the forms that you had identified with begin to break down that is a wonderful time for going back home 
for the return movement into spirituality so that you would become aware of your own consciousness mm -hmm. rather than what consciousness had identified with that was your life before I mean form form yes and so it's sort of the return back to formlessness yes but consciously it's the consciously. conscious return to, to see where what is the source of my very being mm -hmm. you could say it's you're going to, you, you, you when the world begins to become shaky then you go back to the source out of which it all came which is God ultimately God within mm -hmm. the source within so there's these, these two movements in in a person's life now in our civilization the whole these civilization is the outgoing, the outgoing and, the return home. and the return now our civilization is only interested it seems in the outgoing movement people are interested in accumulating in building up in creating making a life for yourself being successful of course that has its place that's right. fine what our civilization knows very little about is the return movement you say then one day you too disappear your armchair is still there but instead of you sitting in it there's just an empty space you went back to where you came from from just a few years ago each person's life, each life form, in fact, represents a world, a unique way in which the universe experiences itself. And when your form dissolves, a world comes to an end, one of countless worlds, a return movement in a person's life, the weakening or dissolution of form, whether through old age, illness, disability, loss, or some kind of personal tragedy, carries great potential for spiritual awakening. That's why you say some older people become sort of luminescent. Yes. Yeah. Some, uh, and others, uh, have a resistance against uh, the return movement the ego identifies with the weakening body for example mm -hmm. and so negative inner states arise people become uh, angry or bitter or complain all the time or talk about the past all the time then they they resist what's happening yeah because they can't accept yes. they can't they can't accept which we're going to talk about those three modalities acceptance yes. Yes. enjoyment and enthusiasm yes. so here comes this the acceptance of when old age approaches the acceptance that this can be also very beautiful if you're open to that you say because in old age the emphasis the top of 286 everybody because in old age the emphasis shifts from doing to being and our civilization which is lost in doing knows nothing of being it asks being what do you do with that <laughs> yeah. what do you do with it <laughs> yeah but at the older you get the more conscious you become that being is of more value to you than doing doing yes 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 and the whole point of a new earth is for uh, everybody to realize no matter what age you are that being is of more value to us than doing yes and that it's only the being that you bring into your doing that matters yes yeah and you don't have to wait for old age for this to happen mm -hmm. uh, it can you can become conscious of this at any age and then the way, way in which you interact with the world is very different right 287 when the ego is no longer identified with the return movement in a person's life old age or approaching death becomes what it's meant to be an opening into the realm of spirit and many times obviously you don't have to approach death in order to open into the realm of spirit as so many of you have um, told us in your message boards that this whole book is about opening to the realm of spirit okay you say in a new earth on our new earth old age will be universally recognized and highly valued as a time for the flowering of consciousness yes in a way we lost it because that was already there in ancient cultures where old age was greatly honored uh, mm -hmm. for example in the native american culture a mm -hmm. grand grandmother is it is it when somebody is called a grandmother it's a title of great distinction and everybody has great respect for the grandmother because the grandmother embodies that wisdom not only wisdom she also embodies the opening into the realm of spirit the elder the the of, of a tribe for example they embody the opening into the realm of spirit and through those old old people uh, everybody can contact that realm so it's very vital to have that we lost it and now we're, we're going to find that again 
where, we, where old age is honored rather than looked down upon. So there's the grandmother, and I mentioned in the book, you have the grandmother of the Native American. The first in nation. our civilization, you have the granny. <laughs> and I right. say the granny at best is cute. Right. But there's no depth to that, right. to how we perceive it. Because we don't honor. No. That dimension is, has virtually disappeared from our civilization, the dimension of depth, the dimension of spirit, the dimension of the sacred, mm -hmm. which is so vital for human life. And what kind of effect does that have on us, not honoring that the, the age and that which is sacred within the age and the depth of that? What kind of effect does that, does that have on us? Well, it means the whole dimension of spirit, which is there, is lost. So we, all our life becomes completely superficial. Mm -hmm. And when life becomes completely superficial, you identify identified with the surface movement of your life. And be, because of that lack of depth, people become very unhappy. Because there's only these, the surface of their life, possessions, achieving this or that, getting recognition. And role playing. Role playing. And also ego. what you call on page 289, I like this, intelligent stupidity. Yes. <laughs> intelligent stupidity. Yes. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, the, uh, an example I give is, for example, you need great intelligence to split the atom. To do that, you create, but then what do we do with that? We create, a, we make an atom bomb, a destructive weapon out of something that could be a wonderful thing. To, so on the one hand, humans seem very intelligent, and then what they do with that intelligence very often is extremely stupid. Right. It becomes destructive. Because I mean, that's, where, that's where, where intelligent stupidity yes. comes in. Yes, and, and that's because the dimension of spirit is missing. Intelligence that's, that is not connected to the deeper dimension of awareness or spirit, whatever you want to call it. And being. Yes, is very destructive. Right. Sooner or later it becomes destructive. Yes, I love what you say on page 290. This is, as you know, I've read the book now several times. That's why... This should be your new summer read, everybody, because when you go back and read it again, you will find things that you didn't experience the That's first time. Repeated reading is very helpful. Or the second time. Yes. Or the third time. This is what I got the other day. Uh, just yesterday I was reading it once again, this chapter. Struggle or stress is a sign that the ego has returned, as are negative reactions when we encounter obstacles. So whenever you encounter obstacles in your life, it is because your, your ego is forefront at the forefront? Yes. It doesn't mean that you don't encounter challenges in right. your life, but to make them into, if you consider a challenge an obstacle that you need to fight against, that means the ego is there. Right. This is 290. The force behind the ego's wanting creates enemies. That is to say, reaction in the form of an opposing force equal in intensity. That's what an enemy is. The stronger the ego, the stronger the sense of separateness between people. The only actions, this is one of my favorite quotes, I love this. The only, see I've underlined it. Perhaps. The only actions that do not cause opposing reactions are those that are aimed at the good of all. Yes. So you no longer separate yourself and say, this is, this is my, you consider in whatever you do, you consider the totality or the whole, not just my little needs, but how do I fit into the totality? And so then, this is not no longer karmic action which produces suffering. Right. We're also learning that action, although necessary, is only a secondary factor in manifesting our external reality. The primary factor in creation is consciousness. No matter how active we are, I love this, um, how much effort we make, our state of consciousness creates our world. And if there's no change on that inner level, no amount of action will make any difference. Yes. In other words, what you do is always secondary. Who you are is primary. And that means not who you are in the eyes of the world or who you are in the, whatever image you might have yeah. about yourself, but w whether you are connected within yourself with that dimension of being spirit or consciousness. You say it beautifully, 294. It's not what you do, but how you do what you do determines whether or not you are fulfilling your destiny. Yes. It's not what you do, but how you do it. And by that you mean 
the amount of presence or consciousness you bring to whatever you do. Yes, another aspect of that is whether whatever you are doing at any given moment, even the most, what the mind would say, insignificant thing, are you doing it in presence or is it just a means to an end because you want to get to some future moment? Right. Just a simple example you could give, you can go to a restaurant and the way in which the waiter puts the plate on your table can be present and conscious and the, immediately you would be affected by that. When Sometimes it happens that you have a waiter who is conscious That's and right. with, with care and attention he or she puts the table there, the plate in front of you. Right. And you can sense a very different energy from a waiter who is just doing his or her job Absolutely. And he just puts it down. And that's in every aspect. That's yes. going to the toll booth. That's picking up your laundry. Everything. That's standing in line for French fries. That's everything. Yes. People either bring their presence or they don't. Yes. Yeah. And often to, it's a useful thing to remember to check inside yourself to see whether you are making whatever you are doing at this moment, whether it is primarily a means to an end because you want to get somewhere else to what you are doing, or whether you're giving it your fullest attention. I think you're gonna have a generation of children growing up with unconscious parents because I recognize this with myself. I've been guilty of it since the Blackberries. Yes, yes. You, if you're riding in a car with friends yes. or you're any place with friends, everybody, instead of talking now, everybody's on their Blackberries to see who else is calling. Yes, I've it's, been wondering what they're doing when they go like that. Oh, this is where everybody's writing everybody. You're <laughs> right, instead of talking to the people who are there with you, you're writing to the people who are not there <laughs> to see what they have to say. That's what everybody's doing. Oh, yes. And, and many times people are now on the cell, their cell phones or they're on their Blackberries and their kids are coming into the room and nobody ever even looks up. And you're not experiencing reality that is around you. You're not experiencing the fullness of life around you. And what you that are is experiencing correct. is a mental abstraction, which is uh, little letters that you're putting in there. It's just mental right. abstraction. You're not even communicating truly with the person that you're sending the message to. Yeah. Because the communication is two or three times removed. You're just sending little ciphers to them. Okay. Well, we're going to get into the three modalities of awakening where you say that unless you are at any given time feeling, having acceptance, enjoyment, or enthusiasm with whatever you're doing, you should stop doing it. Yes. Because if you're not accepting the moment, enjoying the moment, or having enthusiasm for the moment, then you are in one way or another causing suffering. Yes. It's a dysfunctional, so you're in a dysfunctional state. Mm -hmm. You're not aligned with the present moment. You're not aligned with yourself. You're not aligned with life. Completely dysfunctional, and then you generate psychic disharmony around you. You make yourself unhappy. Already you're unhappy. when right. you're because you can't accept the present moment. And the unhappiness spreads, because when you're unhappy, others around you, you make them unhappy too. It All spreads right. like a disease. Well, I think, you know, as we um, here are already in Chapter 10, one of the biggest issues that I've heard so many people talk about, and... Last week, a friend of mine started emailing me uh, saying that how, you know, that she was following the classes and that it's very easy to, um, to have this resonate with you. But then when you have to go out into the world and actually deal with people, mm -hmm. that it starts to get difficult. Mm -hmm. And that friend is uh, Skyping us today, who is an actress who has uh, played my daughter in the movie Beloved. Oh. Yes. She's my baby girl. Kimberly Elise played my baby girl. Hello, Kimberly. Hi. Hi, who's been reading the book. Kimberly's been reading the book and following the webcast. And uh, we were t I was trying to email back and forth explaining this in email. And as Eckhart says, emails are, you know, not a, not a, uh, a full form of communication yeah. when you're trying to express yeah. these ideas. So go at it, Kimberly. Okay. So yes, as I was telling Oprah, um, it's been really exciting and enlightening to discuss in theory all the different concepts and ideas in the book, and it's, it's, it's been attainable here in this loving cocoon which I live in and, and my book club members live in. But once you go out into the real world and have real life situations, you're presented with a lot of challenges because not everybody's read the book, not everybody's on this journey, not everybody is striving to evolve or have awareness. A simple example, one of um, the book club members works for a very egotistical boss and is very 
sort of um, pushed and uh, has unrealistic demands put upon her, and she's managed to sort of pull herself above it, become witness to the ego she's dealing with and the ego within herself, and um, as a consequence, she's been perceived as sort of lax and dispassionate and disengaged in everything that's going around because everybody else is so in the drama and she feels her job could be at, at stake because she's being viewed this way. That's, a, that's a, an example. So my question is, if we're in the process of evolving our state of consciousness, moving away from our egos and getting closer to our true selves, how do we manage, how, how, how do we manage to maintain this level of, of elevation when you're forced in the real world to live and work with people who come from a strictly egotistical place and don't understand this, this awareness level and really can perceive you as being weak? Good. Good question. Good. Yes. Now let's hear what Eckhart has to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, uh, we are gradually learning to live from a different state of consciousness. Now, you cannot expect to be necessarily to be a master when you meet difficult people and already to be fully in that state of presence. It's a gradual process where you bring presence into your life. And as you invite presence into your life, and at first, don't even, don't even practice with the difficult boss, but leave him alone for a while. First, you invite presence into your life with small things. When you're at home, one little movement, making tea, making, opening the curtains as you get up, looking out of the window without any judgment, just perceiving the light, the clouds. Bring as much as possible presence into your life in simple situations. When you get into your car, you get in, close, close the door. Be, be quiet for 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Feel the inner body. Many opportunities are there whenever you're waiting. I talk about that in both books, I believe. Whenever you're waiting for something or someone, drop the waiting and be present. Be fully there, fully alert, fully accepting of that moment rather than wanting, wanting some other moment. Mm -hmm. So, and gradually you grow in presence power or presence power grows in you. And when, as presence power grows in you, you can begin to apply it to slightly challenging situations, which, which normally would have uh, triggered, for example, some slight irritation. Mm -hmm. And there you can observe, oh, that's, there's the old reaction as you're waiting in line at the supermarket. And you can see the irritation with the cashier or the whoever is there in, in, ahead of you. And you can immediately be aware of that and see, well, what's it? It, can, it has no useful function. It does nothing except make me unhappy. And you can then let go of it and be clear and free and present at that moment. Yeah, I think too, Kim, that one of the things that we all want when you read this and you feel so great, it's like sort of being, uh, you know, when you, you feel so enthusiastic and you want everybody to get it as you get it. Um, it's like developing, a, like developing spiritual muscle. Yes. It's like developing spiritual muscle. You can't go out and lift, you know, the 50-pound weight unless you have also lifted the 25-pound weight and the 10-pound weight. And so you have to start uh, developing the muscle with things that you are more comfortable with. And, the, and once you've developed a, a strong enough muscle, um, the bosses become, the, the, the rule, unruly bosses become easier to handle. In the beginning, you just can't say, I'm going to go out, I'm going to apply this principle and expect it to work, because you have to have the inner strength in which to deal with it. And also, it comes from a greater awareness, I think, having had unruly bosses in my uh, early years. It comes from a greater awareness of what your real um, purpose in life is. I remember being in Baltimore in the early days of my career, Having a boss who was a complete jerk, who was just a complete jerk, 
I'd like to use another word for it, but I'll just leave of it. Of course, it's not his true self, but it's on okay. this heavy overlay. Having a boss whose true self was love and innocence <laughs> and had a wonderful presence, but heavy the overlay. Heavy oh. overlay was oh. the the ego self that he showed oh. daily was a complete jerk. Something inside me knew I wasn't going to be here forever. There forever. Ah. I knew that I could tolerate it, I could deal with it, I could handle it, I could, you know, my place in it was not, I knew he ultimately had no power over me, that I needed to do what was necessary for this particular time in my life. But inside myself I knew, trouble don't last always, and I will not, this, was, this is not going to be the course of my life. This too will pass. This too will pass! <laughs> I knew that this too will pass, and so... I could go into the space every day doing what needed to be done, as perhaps maybe your friend needs to do, doing what needs to be done, and could do the thing that everybody else couldn't understand. I could offer, give that person what they thought they needed. I could give them, I could create the space for them to be an even, um, to show themselves, uh, to be whoever their ego at that particular time, you know, wanted to be. You see what I'm saying? I do. I do. So as you're, as you're at that higher level of awareness, you're able to look at a situation and see it as just a situation, but not your entire life. Not, my entire not, not, your, not your entire life, because that person, ultimately, I knew, I'm going to be here for a time, I need to learn this much here, and then I'm going to be gone. And do you believe that there are just some people in this lifetime who will not um, get to this level of awareness? and that you just really have to focus on yourself. Yeah, but that's what and I said to you. That's what I was saying to you in the email. That's not your job to worry about what other people are going to do. Your only role is to be is to concern yourself with yourself. Isn't yes. that true? Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So uh, in one thing, uh, as we said, and Oprah called it spiritual muscle. Yeah. And I called it yeah. growing in presence power. It's the same thing. So presence builds up gradually. Right. right. Um, in the meantime, you can still practice even in difficult situations. It might sometimes work, even if your, your spiritual muscle is not yet highly developed. Uh, if you can remember just the little, uh, little pointer, the little phrase, uh, am I able to accept this moment as it is? Mm -hmm. And if this mo moment comes in the form of this obnoxious person, Mm -hmm. then, then you, the question is, can I accept this obnoxious person at this moment? Can I accept this obnoxious person at this moment? Because whatever arises in the present moment, can I be the space for this? Yeah, and if you're mm. able to remove your ego from it, if you're able to take your ego out of it, yes. then it becomes just what it is. Yes. What you were saying, Kim, it becomes just another situation. If you can take your ego out of it, or your friend take the ego out of it, so it's not personal. No. It's not personal at all. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I learned okay. how to do. So we can really take these opportunities that are so challenging as little gifts oh. and opportunities to grow ourselves. Not only that, it is the true, that is the spiritual path. You know, we, we had talked at a previous class about how everybody has their cross to, to bear. And the truth is that when you confront uh, an obnoxious boss or in difficult situations, there, therein lies your opportunity to build the spiritual muscle. Yes. To build this, yes. or create uh, or, or allow presence to come through in a way that you get to show who you are instead of being worried about what the other person is doing. Yes. So yeah. difficult people or ego-controlled uh, people have a very important spiritual function in this world. Eventually, they will become so unhappy that they will also go beyond that. But in the meantime, they are there. They are for pra as practice uh, material for others. <laughs> That's right, because if everything was wonderful all the time, you would have no practice, no way to practice. There it. would be no growth. That's a good way to look at it. Hey, I love your house, Kim. I hadn't seen your new house. How nice. Yo, I know you haven't. I know. My you dog? Yo, my gosh, you have a <laughs> dog and a fireplace? <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Very cool, BG. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. 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 Very, very nice. Very interesting about the practicing of the, the spiritual muscle. Yes. Now, you, you notice when I was calling the, my former a boss a jerk, and you said that's not who he is. 
Do you never encounter um, obnoxious people in well, your life? No, you do. I encounter obnoxious people. It's a question of looking... Do you have only love for them? Um, not necessarily. Okay, no. good. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's a question of what, did you say? Uh, of whether one is able to look through this overlay of ego or heavy pain body, which can be very strong, whether you're able to go <coughs> through that uh, and it's very hard to describe this process when you are not judging the person mentally, not calling him or her anything. You still know that this person is obnoxious. Yes. You know that. Yeah. You know, still know that this person is controlled by the ego. You know it even right. without formulating a, a then, concept in your yeah. mind. And so, but you also know that beyond there is, there's a being right. that is pure and innocent and as close to God as anybody. As anybody. Uh, so, okay. is, it, is it possible to look through the ego in others? Yeah, but, but Eckhart, you still don't have to want to deal with that person. No. You may want to remove yourself. And, right. Yeah, and if, you, if that is uh, possible, then that often is the best thing to That's do. That's right, because you can still say, I can bless you in your beingness. Yes. And but what you're showing me now is not what I want to no. deal with. Or you can walk out of a job if it's insane, the right. environment is insane, uh, and the more present you are, the more certain you will be about what, of, to, do. what to do. Absolutely. But the, what, and we talked about that in one of the sessions, the realization, the realization of what you have to do comes from a powerful but peaceful place when yes, you're present. Yes, that's right. So when you're walking out of the office, you're not walking out in anger when it comes through presence. You're walking out, you're being you're peaceful with everyone and say, that's it, I'm walking out of here. That's There's it. power, but no negativity. Right, I got that. I got and that. So that's it's beautiful when that happens. When to say, I have had enough. Yes. I have had enough. And that comes from your inner purpose Yes. As opposed to your outer. Yes. Yeah. Now, there may be other situations when you are forced, for some reason, you are forced into... Now, an extreme example is that you're in an elevator and it gets, the elevator gets stuck. Right. And there you are with an obnoxious person mm -hmm. for one hour in the elevator. Mm -hmm. Or some people are stuck with somebody for some reason. They can't go leave, leave the situation. You're maybe in a prison or cell. Or lots of people learn but they have to keep jobs. Yes. Where they are dealing yes. with... Yes bosses who are obnoxious. That's right. Yeah, as we just heard Kimberly say, yes. you have to keep a job, you have to earn a living for yourself and your family. Yes, and there's a question of accepting that this is where this person is at without getting into reactivity. And resisting it. Resisting it. Right. Yeah. I did it the right, the right way because yes. I was in that situation for quite a long time yes. and literally would ex just accepted it. And I would have friends say, how can you put up with that? How can you tolerate that? Because I know this too shall pass. And so Trouble doesn't last always. Intuitively, I you did intuitively, that. Intuitively, I yes. knew that I wasn't going to be there forever. I remember the same reading. Your friend Maria Shriver wrote a book, and she, she describes her early, some of her early bosses. Dreadful. Yes. yes. But somehow she was able to just say, that's how it is. She also knew she was going to be there for the rest of her be life. There forever. But for the time being, she kind of this is what I need to accept do. it. And yes. That's right. Kippy is an American uh, who teaches gifted students at an elementary school on a U.S. Air Force base outside Tokyo, Japan. And she's Skyping us from her home office with a reading group she started after hearing about our web classes. Ko is it, how do you say hello in Japanese? Is it konnichiwa? Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. <laughs> konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. <laughs> and mushi. the same to you. Mushi, mushi. Mushi, mushi. on the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kippy, let's start with you. What is your question? Okay, um, Eckert, on page 301, you wrote, Enthusiasm means there is a deep enjoyment at what you do, plus the added element of a goal or vision that you work toward. My question is, is how can we have goals or visions if we are to always remain in the present? Good question. Mm-hmm. Good, yes. Good question. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the goal of vision, when it's uh, 
is inside you as if it were already a reality. And in fact, on some level, it is a reality inside you already. So a, go a true, a goal that is uh, powerful, when you're in touch with your own power, is not a goal that you project yourself mentally to and say, I would like to achieve this or that at some future point. I need that, I want that to complete myself. You're reaching out towards that goal. You're losing yourself. You're not present. But if you are, re if you realize that whatever vision you hold is already a reality inside you, I give an example now of the power of now. Before I ever wrote the book, I had this vision of that that book was already, on some level, al already there, had already been written. And so I felt. All I'm doing is I'm externalizing what's already there. I, but I had this strong inner feeling that the book already exists inside me. Oh. I saw that it as a reality already. I didn't try to achieve writing a book. The book was already there. And all then I had to do was be open to this energy movement coming from within to manifest what was already there on a deeper level. And that's why Jesus said, whenever you ask for anything, believe that you already have received it and it will be yours. So if you believe that you already have received it, it means it must be already be a reality inside yourself. So you're not coming from lack or scarcity or neediness because then you're not, there's no power behind your, your vision or your goal. You're already coming from fullness. So the goal is already a reality inside. You already feel as if you had it. Right. It's already a reality, and what you feel about it is the fullness that is already there in the present moment. And then you don't lose yourself. Then you are fully there as you begin to respond to this inner impulse. You manifest it in your life in the present moment. So you're, it's not a future thing, really. A powerful goal, when you visualize, a powerful goal is you're not visualizing in order to achieve something in the future. You're visualizing in order to bring something out that's already inside you. Wow. That's, 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 um, that's powerful, but I can understand why a lot of people would be confused by it, because as then how do you ever achieve anything in the future? Isn't that what you're saying, too, Kippy? Right. Right. How do you ever achieve anything in the future? Say, I want to be an actress. There are a lot of people I know at the Bodhi Tree who <laughs> we're going to, you know, talk to later. A lot of people at the Bodhi Tree who, you know, have day jobs, but what they really want, I want to be an actress. That's a future goal. I want to be an mm -hmm. actor or an actress. Mm -hmm. Or I want to get a job working mm -hmm. for, yes. you know, a major corporation. Yes. How, how do you, you know, how, how can you not hold that as a vision for yourself? You can, but what you're visualizing is not yourself in some future state. The power that, that is there inside you that will manifest externally in time and in the future is already there. Get in touch with the power. What would it feel like if you were an, an actress already successful? What, what does that feel like inside you? And where does the power come from with which you can make a difference in people's lives mm -hmm. when you are when you are doing something like that the where does the power reside yeah because you say it's, instead of saying i want to be a great actress is how do i use this talent to manifest in such a way that causes people to yes feel a certain way yes yeah yes so it's already a reality inside you and then you can take steps towards implementing that but it com comes from fullness rather than neediness the mistake is not finding the place of power that is in the present moment mm. and believing that something else that is not in the present moment is going to bring you to the place of power. Okay. It won't. Okay. I just got it, Kippy. I just got it. What, what, <laughs> I just got it. What he's saying is, is that whatever goal that you have or vision that you have must come from the place of being or consciousness. And if it comes from a place of being or consciousness and not is an external goal that you have for yourself, I think I'm getting mm -hmm. it right, right? Mm -hmm. If it comes from being or consciousness, then it comes through you 
out into the world instead of you reaching out into the world saying, this is what I want for myself. Yes. And so all things, and I can use the example of myself, I have always wanted to do exactly what I'm doing here with all of you tonight. I've always felt that deep inside me, this is what I was meant to do. I was meant to be a teacher. I was meant to use television as a platform for helping people to better know themselves. <clears throat> and when, and knowing that, knowing that deep inside myself is what has helped bring this into fruition this yes. way. Yes. Instead of saying, you know, one day I want to have a webcast and have a million people on the webcast. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you see what I'm saying? Yes. I do, yes. yes. That it yes. comes from the inner part of you. There's a feeling uh, that comes from the consciousness part of yourself, the, the being of yourself that says, this is what I now need to do. And that's why you're saying it doesn't matter what you do. No. It's how you do what you do. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what you do. Everything that you do has to be fueled by consciousness or the spirit of God, which is another way of saying it, mm -hmm. by consciousness or the spirit of God, Otherwise, it has no real meaning in your life. Yes. And the place of power is in the present moment. That's <clears throat> the vital thing is you can only touch that power in the present moment. That's right. So if you're not... Uh, and so okay. you said last week it's about this step. The step today uh, that it takes to get to the next step, then the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Yes. You don't get there by thinking, no. let, me go, let me, you know... No. And, and even if you're doing something at the moment that life has given you that doesn't seem to be part of your vision, your vision. let's say you are working in a restaurant, but your vision is being a great artist, right. or manifesting, you still need to honor whatever it is that you're doing at this moment fully right. and completely because it may, in some way, it may arise out of that, that may also be part of it. That's right. Because every <clears throat> step t leads you to the direction it's the means and not the end that yes. counts. Yes. It's the means and not the end. Yes. You follow that, right, Kip? I do. Thank you. Did anybody else want to say anything there? Hi, ladies. Hi. <laughs> what time is it in Tokyo right now? Is it another day already? It's already, yes. Yeah. We are living on Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday morning. Oh, Tuesday. Well, so in Tokyo, it's tomorrow. It's not the now. So, just <laughs> 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 That card made it funny. <laughs> and you'll have beautiful weather tomorrow. <laughs> uh, okay. Tokyo, it's tomorrow. It's not now. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's interesting because everything always comes back to that same point of whatever sense of presence or being, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, whatever you choose to call it, name, because it doesn't have an ego, mm -hmm. so it doesn't get hung up on yes. what it's being called, yes. that when you bring that into your life, it fuels everything that you do. And as you said last week, the evolutionary impulse of the universe yes. rises up to meet you. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so the question to ask yourself, it's a very simple question, am I okay with the present moment? You need to be deeply okay with the present moment to find the power of the present moment, which is your own power, or the power of the universe, or the mm -hmm. power of God. Mm -hmm. Am I okay? If you're not okay with the present moment, let's say you're working in a restaurant, but while you're working in the restaurant, you would rather be somewhere else, you're not empowered. You're only empowered that even while you're working in the restaurant, and for some people, it's, it's their life purpose to work in a restaurant and, and to spread that presence through whatever they do in people they meet there and that's yes. beautiful and what you're saying in in this book is is that whatever you do wherever you do whatever you do can have deep meaning and purpose to it and for the rest of the world if you bring your your presence yes. to it yeah yes. yes and we all have encountered that the difference between people whether that's a waiter or the toll booth operator yes. or you know yeah yes in every, in every one of our life circumstances. Okay, Elzbita is joining us from Poland. Did I pronounce your name correctly tonight? You, very well, yes, Elzbita. Hello. Elzbita, where she's been Elzbieta. downloading all of the webcasts. Hello? Uh, is it Jean Dubre? Hello? Oh. Uh, Jean Dubre. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I, 
I want to thank you both for this extraordinary webcast, uh, the greatest uh, book club uh, I've ever seen. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And, What's your uh, question? I, I'd like to um, ask Eckhart to comment on a certain um, quote from a philosopher, Alan Watts, if I may. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, later I will also have a question, if possible. Go um, ahead, okay, go ahead. Uh, there is a certain pause, that's why it's a little strange. So, uh, the quote is from the book on the taboo against knowing who you are. Um, the most strongly enforced of all known taboos is the taboo against knowing who or what you really are behind the mask of your apparently separate, independent, and isolated ego. Could you please comment on that? Well, the taboo is not a taboo that's... Uh, it's not called a taboo, but our civilization is ignorant of that dimension. And our civilization, to a large extent, is still run by the ego. And the ego does not want to know about the deeper dimension of spirit. It feels threatened by that. The ego likes perhaps to, to have an ideology and call that spiritual. It has a certain rigid belief system and says that is spiritual and identifies with that and calls other people enemies or evil who don't agree with that belief system. But so the ego feels threatened by the spiritual dimension within the human being. And it will do unconsciously anything to sabotage the arising of the spiritual dimension in our culture, in civilization, or in human beings. And so you see, these are unconscious reactions. Some people say that what we are doing is evil. These are unconscious re reactions, again, by the ego to protect itself. Wow. You mean some people say what we're doing here is evil? Yes. Yeah. But the, oh, I don't know how it is possible because bringing people to greater presence and to peaceful way to live, how that can be evil, I don't know. But somehow they work yeah. it out in their minds. So this is evil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so this is the, it's an unspoken taboo. Uh, there, are no, there are no laws against spirituality, but the taboo is unspoken. It's underneath the surface of things. And the taboo has been created by the egoic civilization that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's very clear to me too, but uh, I think that even though Alan Watts wrote it, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, it still rings true, yes. unfortunately. Um, so my question actually is for those who misinterpret uh, your teachings, uh, could you clarify, do you consider your teachings to be a religion? Uh, certainly not. It's not a religion. It is spiritual, which means this teaching, the truth of it, can be applied within any religion or within no religion. It's, the teaching is, in essence, spiritual. It's not based on belief systems. It's not based on thoughts. It's based on becoming present and still. And whether you are a Muslim or a Christian or a Buddhist, or uh, what atheist, atheist it, it can be applied in your life. The transformation of consciousness does not depend on your belief system. But it is possible, of course, if you have a rigid belief system, it can stop you from the trans the belief system can sabotage the transformation. But it does not depend the transformation does not depend on whatever belief system you have. Certain belief systems are so rigid that they represent a barrier. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people, though? I mean, I think that was one of the questions that somebody has tonight about other people who think that what you have written and what we have done here uh, in communicating with people around the world about what you've written is evil. What do you say to that? Well, probably most of them have never looked at the book. Right. And many of them probably have never listened into the webcast. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, because if they, if they truly read a few pages in the book, they would see that uh, there's absolutely nothing that could be interpreted as, as evil. evil. <laughs>
as evil. <laughs> Thank you, Elzbita. Thank you so much. I agree, absolutely. Uh, Oprah, can I also share one aha moment? Sure, Just the last thing. Show an aha. Share an aha. Yes, please. Uh, that would go back to the first chapter on page 12, where Eckhart writes about fear, greed, or the desire for power are not the dysfunction, but are created by the dysfunction, which is a deep-seated collective delusion that lies within the mind of each human being. End of quote. Uh, I think that this is a, well, there's a lots of great stuff in the book, and there is an aha almost on every page, but this one is very important, I think, because seems to me seeing through the delusion can only when we can see through the delusion can we be really free of fear, greed, and desire for power, which we all share, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you, Elzbita. Thank you for sharing that all the way from Poland tonight. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Beth from Green Bay, Wisconsin, sent in an email that caught my, uh, my attention a few weeks back. I thought it would be great to Skype with her for this last chapter. Hi, Beth. Hi, Oprah. Hi. Why Hi. Don't, why don't you read us your, your email? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I emailed in. I've been working on This Too Shall Pass, and I've noticed it's much easier to accept that this is my own life situation than it is for the world's life situation. For example, I, I can't be cavalier about teenagers beating each other for video content on the Internet. I can't condone 13-year-old girls having spiritual weddings to much older men. And I cannot just accept that human beings will be tortured and killed for having a different religion, nationality, or skin color. Why is it so much easier to say that's no big deal for me than it is um, for the rest of the world? Why can't I let go of this global anger? You have global anger. Well, that's a good word. That's yeah. a good word for it. But Many people have I was that. So say you can be angry for a very long time. <clears throat> You're going to carry that around. But go ahead. <laughs> So have you already dropped anger on a personal level in your own life, being angry at people around you that uh, you experience personally? And very rarely do I get angry at anyone else anymore. Mostly it's my kids, but that's, that's just part of their growing up. I'm, I've, yeah. I've been able to see that okay. why they're doing what they're doing yes. and have some compassion for them. It's just on a larger uh -huh. scale. Yes, compassion, yeah. there's an important word. Mm -hmm. I also noticed in your question you used the word condone, which perhaps uh, uh, may be synonymous in your mind with acceptance. Mm -hmm. Condone means to say it's okay to behave in such a way. Then this is not what acceptance is about. Acceptance right. is to see, to simply see what is and to say this is what is right now. This is how these humans behave. This is what they're doing right now. This is what is. And no matter what you think or what, how you judge that, you cannot argue with the fact that this is what is. And that's all acceptance is. It doesn't mean it's okay, I condone it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's to come to an inner acceptance of the isness of life right now and then you can look and then you can see once you have come to an acceptance of what is you also see that yes it is mad you can see it is mad you can come to a place of compassion when you see that all these people are unconscious they don't know what they are doing mm -hmm. so and then you can see evil I mean, there's vast amounts of evil still happening on the planet, which means suffering that humans inflicting on other humans, on other life forms, on the planet itself, on nature. All that you can see as manifestations of ignorance, spiritual ignorance, uh, unconsciousness, mm -hmm. ego, collective ego. And so once you see that, you can come to a place of compassion for those people who are still still controlled by ego and who are acting unconsciously. And also, doesn't it come to that, th that phrase about accepting the things you cannot change, changing the things you can, and having the wisdom to know the difference? And the truth of 
everything that we've been saying in these past two weeks, Beth, for you and everyone else, is that you begin to change the world by first changing yourself. And so the anger, all of us are putting energy into the world. All of us are putting energy out into the world. And you raise the level of consciousness when you bring consciousness and presence to whatever it is you do. That's how you begin to change the world. In your home, right now, what room are you in right now? Uh, wait, this is the spare bedroom. We call it the home office. Okay, in your home office, with your children, in your actions every day, being less ang angry in your personal life really helps diffuse it in the rest of the world. Yes. And people don't see that as a big deal, but if everybody did that, it would, it would, it would be diminished. Yes. You are connected on an unseen level with all other humans. That's right. And whatever energy you put out con contributes to that particular vibration in the collective energy field of humanity. Correct. So if you're putting out anger, then that connects with all the collective anger that is floating on the, around on the planet, which is vast. Uh-huh. It connects and feeds the collective anger. Yes, and so isn't each of us, isn't it for each of us, we're asked to do that which we can do. I mean, I feel this every time I go to Africa, that it's really easy to get overwhelmed by all of the, the massive problems, mm -hmm. you know, encountered in, in that country. You can get easily overwhelmed, and, and so the thing to do is to focus on that which you can change, that which you can have some impact on, and do that as well as you can. Yes. Yeah. One little thing, perhaps, one thing that might seem insignificant, and you mm -hmm. can make a change there. But everything is significant, depending on what That's presence right. you bring to yes. it. Beth, I hear you've made some big changes since reading A New Earth. Tell us about them. Oh, yes. Um, actually, I picked up A New Earth after my grandmother passed away in January. Um, but some things have been happening along the line that I, I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, I, I left a job that wasn't that good for me in November. Um, I was able to spend more time with my grandmother, and we both prepared ourselves for her passing. I've quit smoking. I started running. I eat healthy foods. It's I'm not even sure who I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. That's, yes. That's a good thing. But I think uh, the key word here is what Eckhart had said earlier. Uh, Accepting what is going on in the world isn't the same thing as condoning it, because there are a lot of terrible things going on in the world. And no, I, I know, and I don't know if it's because I've been a mom for so long. It's just I, I want to put myself maybe as a shield in front of these people to offer them some protection. Mm. Um, yeah. and, and I don't know if that's my own ego, but it, it doesn't feel like it's my ego. It's like, you know, you people don't deserve this. Mm. You you deserve to have a better life. You're 13, 14 years old, it's not time for you to have a baby. Are you talking about the polygamous story on the news? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's none of your business right now. What's it, your business is what's going on in your house right now, Beth. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to hear Eckhart says that grandmothers are, are, are going to be respected because I'm going to be a grandmother in July. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know if they'll be respected by July, but we're working well. on it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thanks for that email. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I think yes. we got some work to do. If uh, we're going to get... Maybe <laughs> just one... <wanted>, uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> we're going to get old age respected by July. We got to get busy. <laughs> we got to sell some more books. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. We have a caller from uh, France on the line. Michelle lives in Paris, has a question. Yes, it, hello, Oprah and it, Eckhart. Hello, is it bonjour, uh, bonsoir? I, I actually have a million questions, but I'm only going to ask one. Okay. <laughs> um, one that's actually troubled me for a long time, and I think I can sum it up with a quote from the Bible. Uh, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And for me, I see the rich man as someone who is full of ego and full of mind, which can never enter into consciousness. And... This relates to me and to my question, is I have a very strong and active mind, and it's uh, my greatest asset perhaps, but it's also my Achilles heel. And when I can reach a place of stillness or awakening, 
my mind wants to participate. It wants to own the experience. And at some point, always succeeds in bringing form to the experience, turning it into a concept, trying to understand it, trying to link it with past experiences. And so you speak about this space between ego and and uh, awareness, and I need I need to develop that space. I need to be able to step further back from from my mind. And it's uh, it's very difficult. The mind's also very cunning, and it deceives me even into believing that I'm actually in that space. But what can I do? How can I work on this, uh, <clears throat> this dilemma? Well, the the mind cannot recognize that space. It doesn't know anything about it. It's completely meaningless to the mind. But from what you are saying, I can see that you already are able to enter that space for how long doesn't matter. But you are already able to ha have that inner space of stillness inside you. And uh, your mind is almost denying that experience, certainly resisting it. Mm. So, first of all, it's the recognition that the most important thing, which is the initial disidentification from the process of thinking, has already happened inside you. That first disidentification from thinking and encountering that dimension of presence or stillness inside yourself, that has already happened. Now, the mind is not happy with it, it's, it doesn't want to go there, or it judges it in some way, or the mind says, oh, I, I want to interpret it in some way. Mm -hmm. All you need to be there is, rather than fighting the mind or your thought processes, to recognize thoughts that arise as thoughts. And it's from the place of stillness or spaciousness inside you that you can recognize when thoughts come and say this or that about stillness or about whatever you should be doing something else or whatever they say. You recognize these as just another thought mm. and another thought. And when you recognize a thought as a thought, it does no longer, it no longer has this power to power. pull your attention in completely. Right. And mm -hmm. so the important thing is not the fact that your mind is highly developed. That can be quite useful at some point when you're not identified with it. You can use your highly developed mind in the service of awareness, mm -hmm. in the service of spirit, and that's fine. But in the meantime, it's not being drawn into every thought that arises or even fighting a thought and saying, go away, I want to be still. That doesn't work either. You recognize... It as a threat. I'm giving it power. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you recognize the mind as mind. You recognize thinking as thinking. So you can then choose to be present when you're walking out in nature, for example, mm -hmm. or when you're sitting alone in your room. You choose to be present, and then you will notice the mind will occasionally try to come in and do or say something about it or something totally different, or says you should be thinking about something else that's more important than this. And then you can recognize these thoughts as just another thought that arises. You can even say to yourself, oh, there's another thought, and then you mm. get still again. And then the thought comes, oh, there comes another. Not to give the, uh, every thought that arises this importance so that it draws you in, because the mind wants to do that. It wants all your attention, because it's had all your attention for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a habit pattern of the mind. It wants to draw in your attention. And all you do is you, you, you take your attention out of the mind. The, so that's the, really is the process. Thoughts is, the mind is not the enemy. You would never win that fight against the mind if you made the mind into an enemy. The mind is like a, a little a restless child, you could say, or a restless puppy. Mm -hmm. It goes about and then you say, oh, it's just, it's nothing, it's not, it's not a big deal. Yeah, and as we all get, you know, build our spiritual muscle here, <clears throat> we become mm -hmm. more and more conscious of our consciousness and recognize when the thoughts are 
just playing in your mind. And I, I'm sure that started to happen to you already, Michelle. You just said, oh, there's a thought. There's another one. There's another thought. Uh, I mean, I would have to say over the 10 weeks that we've been doing this course, I've become really, really more skilled at I will think about that later, sort of like Scarlett O'Hara. Mm -hmm. I won't think about that now. I'll think about that later because this is now I want to be present with whatever is going on in this moment. So I'll deal with that at a later time when I choose to set aside time yes. for thinking about that particular thing mm -hmm. yes. instead of just letting my thoughts rule everything yes. all the time. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I've been putting much too much effort into keeping my thoughts at bay. Right. Yes. Just right. Yeah. Looking just looking at them for what they are. Just then. look at it. Oh, there's another thought. There it is again. And then the effort should be in keeping yourself in the moment. Of what it be, mm -hmm. you know, my mantra is be here, be now. Mm. Be here, be now. Be here, be now. Yes. Whatever's going on. Absolutely. Yes. That's yeah. good. Be yes. here, be now. Yes. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank Michelle. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Bonsoir. Thank you. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> Bonsoir. 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 <laughs> All right. Let's talk about, you say, that the alignment of your outer purpose with your inner purpose mm. is which we talked about last week. The inner purpose must fuel the outer purpose. Otherwise, ultimately, it's not going to work for us. Um, but the alignment of our outer purpose with the inner purpose is called awakened doing. And that awakened doing is the next stage in the evolution of consciousness on our planet. There are three modalities of awakened doing. Acceptance, enjoyment, and enthusiasm. On page 295, you write, each modality represents a certain vibrational frequency of consciousness. That is, um, you need to be vigilant to make sure that one of them operates whenever you are engaged in doing anything at all. This is key, folks. From the most simple task to the most complex, if you are not in a state of either acceptance, enjoyment, or enthusiasm, look closely and you will find that you are creating suffering for yourself and others. So let's explain each one of them. You touched mm -hmm. on it a little bit earlier when you were talking to Kippy, I think, about acceptance does not no that was Beth that acceptance does not mean condonement it means mm -hmm. I accept this moment for what it is yes and so when you're doing something uh, you'll be amazed if you become aware of this and observe people around you how many people are constantly in a state of disharmony because they cannot be in either acceptance, enjoyment, or enthusiasm about what they are doing. You use the you, the example in the book mm. of changing a flat tire. Now you don't have to enjoy changing the flat tire. That you would have reached another level of consciousness yes. where you can enjoy changing yes. it. Yes. Which I'm sure you could. You maybe could change it with enthusiasm. I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But so <clears throat> you don't have to enjoy changing the flat tire, but at least to accept the tire is flat you will have a much better experience rather than cursing the fact that you've had a flat tire, which yes. is what most people do. Yes. The first time you get the flat tire, everybody goes, damn. Yes. Flat tire. Yes. <gasps> I can't believe it. And even more so if it's at night in the pouring rain and That's it's right. cold. That's right. never convenient. No. Yeah. So the question then is um, you have to check inside to see what, what is the inner, your inner state of consciousness that you're bringing to this action, to whatever you are doing. What is this inner state of consciousness? Am I, what, what state am I in? And then often you will uh, realize that you are in a state of denial of the present moment. Okay, so you said acceptance, you just said this to Beth, is just saying what is is. is and if this is what I have to do at this moment, then I might as well do it without resistance. And that is the same as if it's a flat tire, or if it is as my friend Kimberly was saying earlier with the girl and her boss. Yes. My boss is obnoxious. Yes. That is what is. Yes. I'm not going to change that. So let me figure out how to deal with that. Yes. Yeah. And and the acceptance really needs to be applied only to the present moment. If the boss is there, sitting there saying whatever he says right uh, at this moment am i able to accept this am i bringing acceptance to this that's now right. here we are talking more specifically about when you're performing some kind of action right and what is the question is what energy flows into the doing that's right that's it, the question is it the energy of denial or negativity and and once you are you have developed a little bit of sensitivity you can very easily tell by observing other people whether the energy that flows into what they do is was contaminated with negativity 
or whether it's there is presence or consciousness yeah. that flows. And yeah. Totally qualitative difference is enormous. I mentioned the waiter as an example. How does he put the plate on the table? Is he just doing a job because he wants to get out of there as soon yeah. as possible and just, or just yeah. making a living? Or is he honoring this moment? And by honoring this moment, he's honoring you. He's honoring life. And something flows into the simple movement of putting a, a plate on the table, just as one simple example, right. that changes the entire environment around him, too. Yeah. I had this experience this weekend. I had to go somewhere and had to do something. And I was very upset with myself because I hadn't handled my schedule better. So I had to get into, fly into New York. And then I, my schedule started at like 8 o'clock in the morning. I was very upset that I hadn't given more time for myself because I was already exhausted. And I realized that I had to change my attitude, change the frequency. Otherwise, I was going to affect the outcome yes. of everything I was doing that day. If I couldn't have a have a shift yes. in in my own perception about the day, so I really literally went and sat with myself in the closet until I could shift my attitude into well, I must accept the fact that I didn't look out for myself, I didn't prepare better, my schedule is now overcrowded. That's the way it is. How can I move forward and make the best of it? Yes. Yeah. Because I was making myself angrier yes. and, you know, looking for who I could blame. Yes. Yeah. So if, and so if you hadn't done this, the energy of... I realized I was going to ruin my whole day. Yes. And, it would, and everybody I encountered was going to feel that. And, and everybody that you, everything that you would have done would have not truly been successful because success depends on what energy flows into what you do. Okay. And, and you affect everybody else to also with that. And that is why you must change the modality to if you're not accepting, enjoying, or enthusiastic, you need to stop whatever that is and work on changing your mood or don't do it. Yes. Either accept what you do, which is the, the, the primary thing, or don't do it. Remove yourself. Don't do it. But don't contribute negative energy or suffering to this world. I know, but most people are going to say, I'm sure listening, saying, but I had to do it. I had to do it. I have a responsibility. I have to do it. But I don't want to do it. Well, then know that at that moment, it is your choice to create unhappiness for yourself and others. Once you know that that is your choice, it might change. Mm -hmm. Because it's really to, to generate unhappiness for yourself and by implication for others really requires you to be unconscious. Right. But when you make this process conscious and, re and realize at this moment, by resisting what I'm doing, I'm creating suffering for myself. Yes. And probably people around me too. Okay. But and the reason you come into acceptance again is because of the energy that you're bringing into it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And the next mode of modality for awakening is enjoyment. Yes. No. That's, a, that's a notch above acceptance. Yes. D a different... Frequency, vibrational frequency. Because vibrational frequency. everything is about vibrational frequency. Yes. People are bringing energy to everything that they do. Yes. Okay. Now, enjoyment is a, a higher frequency. Right. Uh, some things are easier, of course, to do in the state of enjoyment. One might almost say you do them naturally in a state of enjoyment, things that you like doing. Yeah. Uh, I love this quote, Eckhart. On 297, you say, on the new earth, enjoyment will replace wanting as the motivating power behind people's actions. Yes. When's that going to happen? Well, it has not, to... Not by July either, I don't think. Well, not in the collective, but, yeah. uh, but it can happen in the individual already now. Where we do things because we enjoy them. Yes. And not because you want more and want more and want more. Yes. Because so many people have expressed... Um, through the, throughout this class on the message boards and in other areas and how you get more things and get more things and you want more things and want more things and that leaves you with an empty space. Yes, filling, trying to fill your life up with things. Eventually you come to an empty, an empty space and you feel nothing completely unfulfilled. Right. And so the wanting is the usual thing that comes out, out of the egoic state of scarcity or lack, which right. is always there when the ego... Uh, predominates yeah. there's so I need that in order to fulfill myself in order to find satisfaction I need to achieve this in order to be fully myself this is the underlying assumption right of wanting 
and that is the old energy of wanting. So, and so you go out and it becomes very stressful because you're try, trying to arrive at that point. Yes. Always trying to get away from this moment because the next one promises greater fulfillment. Yes. The next one never comes because when it comes it's the now again, which is a place you want to get away from. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Completely insane. Right. But normal. Okay. So getting to the place where you can have enjoyment from things because enjoyment does what? Enjoyment brings an enormous empowerment to what you do and it flows into what you do and this is the beginning of creativity which comes right. out of that. When the creative power of the universe becomes conscious of itself, it manifests as joy. You don't have to wait for something meaningful to come into your life so that you can finally enjoy what you do. There's more meaning in joy than you will ever need. The waiting to start living syndrome is one of the most common delusions of the unconscious state. That's important because many people are trapped in that delusion. They are waiting for something to come into their lives which will finally give them joy or sense of aliveness. Okay, I love this. 298, everybody. Joy does not come from what you do. It flows into what you do and thus into this world from deep within you. The misperception that joy comes from what you do is normal and is always dangerous because it creates the belief that joy is something that can be derived from something else, such as an activity or thing. Don't people do things that bring them joy? That's what it looks like, but it's the same process that we talked about a little earlier when we talked about manifesting something from within. The joy is there. It comes from the fullness of life that you already sense within you at this moment. Okay, so for example, I have really enjoyed these webcasts. Yes. I really enjoyed doing these webcasts. And the, where does the enjoyment come from? From within you. It doesn't come from this table or these lights or the cameras or, or even... Doesn't it come from the community of people out there? I've really enjoyed having all these people join us. But the joy is within you and then it flows out. It reaches everybody. Even through the cameras it can reach people and trigger joy in others. Can you all feel my joy? Yes, but all, only within them. So it's their own joy. When they feel your joy, they feel their joy because that's all, it's one. Oh, so they're not feeling my joy? No, it's, there's no such thing as my joy, ultimately. Oh, that's it's right. It's only joy. It's only our joy. Yes, you could yes. say that. There's our collective joy. Yes, okay. yes. Right. So you see that? The... Okay, that is exactly what I'm doing. The misperception that joy comes from what you do is normal, also dangerous, creates a belief that joy is something that can be derived from something else. You then look to the world to bring you joy, to bring you happiness, but it cannot do that. That is why people live in constant frustration. You will only, in the, the, because the world's not giving them what they think they need, you will only enjoy any activity in which you are fully present, any activity that is not just a means to an end. It isn't the action you perform that you really enjoy, but the deep sense of aliveness that flows into it. That aliveness is one with who you are. I got that. Yeah. Right. So I'm sure many people touch that place within as they watch this webcast. They watch you talking, they watch me talking, and suddenly they feel that, that intense sense of aliveness within. But is that That's... enjoyment the same as um, pleasure? No. It's Ple not. Pleasure, pleasure, I asked that question of myself yesterday. Pleasure comes from something without outside of you. Okay. So you derive pleasure from something outside of you. And I ask that because you say this means that when you enjoy doing something, you're really experiencing the joy of being in its dynamic aspect. That's why anything you enjoy doing connects you with the power behind all creation. Yes. Now, see, I read that and I thought, uh, what about people who enjoy gambling or yeah. enjoy... These are pleasures. Okay. Yeah. Sex or enjoy being yes. sadis sadistic yes. or enjoy or, harming other people. Uh, yes, or, or enjoy the things power that... Of creation are, isn't behind that. Or, or, no, we, we sometimes call that enjoy, but there is no true joy in it. Okay. It's being addicted to a pleasure, something outside that feeds the ego or the okay. plain body. And pleasure, uh, the, by the definition, means pleasing me, yes. which would be ego. Yes. Got it. Yes. Got it. Okay, let's go to our New Earth uh, study group that has gathered every week for the past 10 weeks at Borders on Michigan. Hi, everybody in Chicago. We got a warm day in Chicago. Aren't we happy? <laughs> I know. 
I know people are out on the beach, 68 degrees. Yes. Put our shorts on at 68 <laughs> degrees here. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm and uh, participation. We talked to Sharon during one of our classes. I think it was around the second web class. And Sharon's standing by now. Here you're going to be making some big changes. Yes, <laughs> I am. What? What happened? Well, just like Eckhart was drawn to California mm -hmm. um, to write uh, oh, The no. Power of Now, I, I, I went on idealist.org and just decided to volunteer, and someone responded back to me. And it's in, it's in The Hague in, in Netherlands. The thing is, is... I have to do it. it. Everything has lined up, and I'm just drawn to do this. I have uh, student loans because I have two graduate degrees, and but yet I have all the money I need to do this. I have the support of my support system here. Um, you know, through conversations I've had with different members of this uh, book club, I realized, gosh, you know what? I really want to do this. I absolutely want to do this. And when I'm not in a space of acceptance, I get scared and I say, this does not make sense. Why am I doing this? I flew to Holland um, last week, no, two weeks ago. I've been back a, a week. And I, I interviewed with the, the gentleman I'm going to be working with. He is an academic. It's, a, it's, an, it's an NGO. <laughs> and... I, I connect with him. I I love what I'm actually doing research now that I'm back. I'm going back. I got an apartment. I'm going to be there for some months, you know, maybe longer. And because I feel drawn to do this and I feel encouraged to do this and things have just unfolded where I can absolutely afford to do this. Then it's all lined up. I was up. downsized. It's all lined Everything's up. Everything's lined up, and I'm shocked by that. I, I absolutely, <sighs> when I think consciously of it, Oprah, I don't know. This is not my life. This is not my, this never has happened to me before. <laughs> but whenever I, I, I go still. By the way, there was a, a, a Nick uh, at the Bodhi tree. Yeah. It, and I, I was sitting in my room in, in uh, Holland crying. Uh, the entire week, I hadn't been able to use my computer because, of course, I used it first day and I ran out of um, my co the, with, my battery died on me. And downstairs, the, I troublesh troubleshooted with the... Uh, so why were you crying owner, over uh, Nick? Why were you crying over Nick? Because, because he was talking about what I was feeling. And, what, worried about you know, the I bills? need to be earning, I, uh. I said. Yeah, I and, that was uh, a powerful thing that Nick said, because I think everybody's touched by that. I mean, any time, ever since that Nick comment two weeks ago, uh, what Eckhart said to Nick about worrying, I haven't had a worry since. I thought, well, I can think about it. I can choose to do something about it, but I don't have to worry about it. I, I thought that well, was absolutely. really powerful for all of us, really powerful. Yes. It so, was so, powerful. So now you're in a situation, Sharon, don't question things lining up because that is what is supposed to be happening. And right. that is, right. I will say to everybody who um, is listening to us today, that is what happens when you become more conscious. You get to you are aware enough to see things line up, because when you move through the world unconsciously, you can't even see it line up. You're not available to, to, to be a witness to the alignment. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as you become more awakened, and the more awakened you become, the more things line up. And you end up moving, with, Oprah, moving with the flow of your to, life. Right. I, but here's what's exciting. Whenever, when I sit and I'm quiet, yeah. and I, I just, you know, so I was crying, and I, I, I was able to watch it, um, because I was able to borrow a plug from somebody else in the hotel. That was and alignment right there. <laughs> so it worked. Yeah. Again, it lined up. So it was great. So I'm, I'm sitting on the bed and I'm crying. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? Then I'm, I'm watching Nick talk. I'm dying of laughter, of course. And I'm, I'm sure they heard me in the next rooms. <laughs> but I said, wow, this is fantastic. What's really neat is I, I, after it was over, I shut down the computer and I sat and I said, okay. Let's be still. 
you feel kind of strange about this. You don't feel you deserve this right now. It's that's really what it was. And I sat for a while and I said, okay, let me just sit with this. If this is what I feel, will it kill me if I don't feel great right now? After that, I stayed up all night and I just smiled. The sun set, you know, the sun came up. I packed slowly. I felt joy. And I have felt joy since coming back, except for driving in to, you know, to this uh, last of our uh, meetings because I'm going to miss everyone. And I realize also I'm letting go of something is over now for me. I'm not going to be going back into finance. I know that. Yeah. Um, and well, I want everybody. Whatever. To, well, thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing. I sharing, Sharon. It. Thank you. And thank everybody you. at the Borders for your commitment to this work and our web series. Borders, give yourselves a round of applause there. All our Borders buddies. Oh, can I say one last thing, Oprah? <laughs> yeah. Can I say one last thing? This, by the way, this group of people, I, I so love them. I'm going around saying that every day. I love you. I love you. This has been the best group. I'm, I'm taking classes. Some people here teach. And I'm taking classes with them. I've spoken to other people and learned so much about not just myself, but about the world. And, and I feel so joined with everyone. This has been just the best experience for me. And thank you so much for it. Great. Thank you. Thank you again. Oh, thank thank you. you, our Borders buddies. Isn't that the whole point of all of this is that when you become more awakened, everybody, things begin to flow in your life in a way that they had not before. Yes. And that's what's supposed to be happening. Yes. These, you know, you talk in the book about, you know, serendipitous encounters. I don't think you use the word, but things just start mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. They line up. Yes, yes. You have to be there for this to happen. If you're not there, you have to be there in the now so that life can work for you. Uh -huh. You can't, if you deny life by denying the now, life can't work. It's like sh shutting, closing the shutters. The sun can't come in. Yeah. Uh, the sun doesn't mind, but the sun, why not open the shutters and let the sun shine in, which is, the strange thing is that the, uh, it's when you no longer deny the present moment, then not only do you see all the things that are lining up there to support you, it also means more things are coming into your life. Absolutely. To be of assistance. Absolutely. And so that's wonderful once you... The evolutionary impulse of the universe. Yes, yes. Rises up to me. Yes. It does. Uh, it, yes. it does not mean that you will never ag again encounter uh, challenges. Right. Or, or if, you have a, if you want to have a certain course of action, you want to go from here to there, always, of course, being conscious that the step you're taking at this moment is the most important step but you might still want to go from here to there but it does reduce the fear oh yes it does reduce the fear yes because you know you can always bring your sense of presence to the whatever the moment is yes and that you'll be all right yes that's right and because as soon as you encounter an, a, a, a challenge not resist it but immediately come to an acceptance of the new situation and then see how that it very often it turns around and becomes actually helpful. Yes. In the same way that a martial arts master always uses the opposing energy. He never, the martial arts master does not fight against. He uses the opponent's energy and gives into it. Mm -hmm. And he wins by not by yielding to the oncoming energy. Knowing how to surrender to, Surre to yes. the oncoming energy. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. A question that we get asked all the time is, how old is Eckhart? How old are you? This body is 60 years old. Wow. <laughs> and why did you say this body? Well, I don't, I don't feel that I am this age. I mean, if you look within, nobody feels that. It's only if you identify with the body that you believe that you are a certain age. Mm -hmm. The consciousness that I am is ageless. The consciousness that you are is ageless. And you, I'm sure you also feel that there's inside you a consciousness which has nothing to do with the age of That's the physical right. body. Mm -hmm. Do you do something for your skin? <laughs> <laughs> no, these are all the questions that we have to ask at the 10th uh, lesson because people write in well, and they say that Eckhart has such glowy skin is there something you do especially for your skin, Eckhart? Well, uh, 
one confession I need to make here is, well, my skin is usually fine. I'm happy with my skin. But here, yes. we have a very good makeup artist who does something to my skin before I come out here. Really? Yeah, You're Stella. Stella does. <laughs> So you were wearing like a little powder or something. No, whatever. But yeah, yeah, whatever. But, but, but it's my, so my smooth. My skin is fine. I mean, it's, uh, I'm happy with it. And uh, <laughs> I, I, if, you don't, okay. if you don't accumulate a lot of past inside, then the aging process slows down quite a bit. Really? Say if that you, again? If you do not accumulate a lot of past inside your psyche by hanging on to past, identifying with thy past, deriving a sense of self from past, talking about the past, thinking about the past, then you carry this burden of past. But if you let go of that past and focus primarily on present moment, then the aging process, I believe that, and I've seen it in some people who are present, the aging process of the body actually slows down considerably. Wow. So 6-0. Six, six oh. Yeah. Your body is 6-0 oh years old. Yeah. Don't look it. You don't do anything like color your hair or anything? No. You don't. No. <laughs> okay. No Botox? Okay. Yeah. Wouldn't we be just a little disappointed to find out Eckhart, Mr. No Ego, is Botox? <laughs> what is that? What is Botox? Yeah. Never mind. It's too hard to explain what it is. <laughs> What is that? Can't even explain it. Now let's go to Denise, who's Skyping us from her home office in Seattle, Washington. Denise has a question that a lot of viewers have also asked. Denise, go ahead. Hi, Oprah. Hi, Eckhart. Hello. Hi. When I, go, when I go to bed and I'm feeling conscious and aware, why then do I still have nightmares? And do I have an ego while I'm, while I'm sleeping? <laughs> Good question. Uh... Well, some dreams are dreams of that process, things that haven't been faced completely during the day. Mm -hmm. So uh, many kinds of dreams are processing dreams. Mm -hmm. And then there are other dreams that bring up different energies. There can be pain body coming into a dream. Uh, ego can come into the dream because uh, normally in a dream you're not conscious that you are dreaming. In exceptional circumstances you may be. I don't know whether you're ever conscious in the dream that you're dreaming, are you? I can't remember. No, probably <laughs> not. Yeah. So, um, it is quite possible sometimes for the pain body to come up in a dream and the character that you represent in the dream is most likely an aspect of your ego. Ego, in a dream, of course, you're completely identified with what's happening in the dream. And th there is usually, and this is why I asked you this question, there's usually an absence of the aware space where you are aware that you are a character in the dream. And usually, so you can have the awareness in your daily life here, this is what this is all about, is to live in a way so that you have a dimension in your life that so in the background of your life, there's always the aware presence. From there, you are conscious of whatever you are doing, whatever your mind is saying. In a dream that's missing, you don't have the level of awareness. Awareness. Unless you're conscious in the dream, which I dream dreams and I'm conscious in the dream. Yes. And I can say, I can be in a dream and then say, oh, I'm dreaming now. Yes. And if it's not a dream I want to be in, I'll say... Got to get out of here. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Or you could say in a dream, okay, I'm dreaming, I can do anything. Yeah, I can do anything. <laughs> I think I'll fly now. But you don't do that in your dreams, right? So the question is whether or not your dreams are your ego. Sometimes they are not. Did you not also say, well, you did say in the book that sometimes when we dream, we go back to source. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, there I talk about dreamless sleep. Because, yes. Because, as you know, when you sleep, you have the dream stage, which right. you go in and out of periodically, and then occasionally you have the deep sleep state of dreamless yeah. sleep. You say that on 282. I read that earlier. Each night without knowing it, you return to the unmanifested source of all life when you enter the stage of deep dreamless sleep yes. and then reemerge again in the morning, replenish. So you've gone back to source energy yes. there. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's, so it does help. What do you do before going to sleep? Is that when you, the last, let's say the last... 20 minutes or so. What You're not you... watching the news, are you? No, I'm reading the New Earth. And so... <laughs> okay. Okay, but even that... Uh, 
that's good, but even that I would put it aside just for some minutes before you actually go to sleep so that there can be a space inside you rather than words. And some of the words may actually help you to get in touch with that space. But then a time comes when you put the book aside and the best, the most powerful, the most helpful way of going into sleep is by lying on your back flat, mm -hmm. arms stretched out and put attention into the inner energy field of your body and feel the aliveness from your toes to the tip of your head. Scan your body with your attention a few times and then feel the entire energy field of the body as a single field of energy. And, yeah. and ho it's, very, it's very beautiful yeah. to... That has helped me a lot. That's actually, since you said that about three classes ago, has helped me do much better sleeping. What Eckhart is also, I think, emphasizing here for you, Denise, is that being more present uh, in every moment of the day with whatever is going on in your life will allow you to not to have to deal with whatever you didn't deal with um, during the day in your dreams. Because dreams are often the manifestation of your, you know, unconscious or subconscious mind trying to work things out that you didn't fully work out in the day, mm -hmm. that you didn't work out. And so, again, the answer is being present with whatever is going on, dealing with whatever needs to be dealt with in the moment so that it doesn't show up later on in your dreams. And I do that particularly if, you know, I, don't, I am not a television watcher because I'm on television like the <laughs> toddler's children has no shoes. But um, if I happen to be in a room and walk into a room and the television's on and it's something, a particularly disturbing image, rather than flip from that image or try to deny that I saw that image, I will literally uh, take it in. I will accept what I have seen and deal with it in my mind so that it doesn't show up later on in a dream and, 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 and frighten me or disturb me, you know? So I try to deal with whatever is going to be disturbing when it is happening so that I don't have to process it later. Yes. You know? It's good. Very good. Yeah. Yes. I hope that helps. Thank you. That makes sense. Thank you. Well, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Because, yeah, the dreams are just unmanifested stuff. Yes. That you didn't deal with. Yes. Yeah. Occasionally it happens that one has a deeper dream, but they tend to be more rare where you ha might have a sudden I insight coming mm -hmm. into a dream that you didn't have before, a sudden realization, or some kind of dream images that come that have a symbolic meaning in your life and are telling you something. That, that can happen occasionally mm -hmm. also, and that's beautiful when it happens. Well, let's go to the third modality, which is we've talked about acceptance. Yes. If you can't bring acceptance... Sure enjoyment or enthusiasm. And enthusiasm, which uh, is what Kippy from Tokyo had brought up earlier, mm -hmm. is the, the, the higher vibration mm -hmm. of, of uh, modality for awakening. That whenever you are enthusiastic, that there's something else that comes into play. Yeah. There's an energy field created that's bigger than you are. Uh, yes. It's particularly, it's an energy that is, a, is of, of a creative kind, an energy that creates something bring something into this world. I wouldn't say it's necessarily of a higher frequency. frequency. It's a more powerful frequency okay. because it, it, it's the outgoing movement that is connected, however, with the source. Yeah. And again, mm. we say that that is the kind of enthusiasm that's just not wild external enthusiasm, but enthusiasm born of the spirit, enthusiasm born of consciousness. Yes. Yeah, we're not just talking about going to a Bears game, standing out there screaming for your team. No, that's, no. that's excitement. Uh, it's a, uh, sometimes the ego sometimes looks for states of excitement like that as substitutes for right. feeling the being. For being. You're out of touch with being, then the ego looks for substitutes. Mm -hmm. And excitement is one of them. Excitement sometimes through the media, through watching a violent film or uh, excitement through whatever. Um, so acceptance, there, there are no clear dividing lines between these three modalities. Sometimes acceptance suddenly shifts into enjoyment. Mm. And sometimes enjoyment shifts into to enthusiasm. enthusiasm. Right. Uh, so if you, let's say you're doing something that before you would have resented, 
and suddenly you are able to realize, okay, there's resentment and denial inside me. Let's see if I can accept that I have to do this right now. And so suddenly you bring acceptance to it. And as you bring acceptance to it, and you're actually beginning to enjoy what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, and that is absolutely true. This thing I had to, was telling you I had to do this weekend, I first was resenting it. I went and sat in the closet with myself so I could change my attitude. I decided I'm going to accept it. And during the process of it, I decided, let me be 100% present and see what happens. If I could just be one, and that was my focus, just to be 100% present. And I started getting a kick out of it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's what We're I... Skyping again with a study group that has gathered at the Bodhi Tree bookstore in West Hollywood. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi. Hi everybody, and Nick. <laughs> Hi, Nick. I see Nick there. Okay, <laughs> who's at the microphone? Is that Tatiana? Tatiana? Hi, Tatiana has a question. Yes. Okay, Hi. go ahead. Hi. Yes, I do. It's about acceptance. And Eckhart says that uh, acceptance looks like a passive state. And I do have a big problem with that because sometimes I can't, I, I, I feel like I accept what is more and more in my life. But at times, I feel like I have to be proactive and I have to do something. And at the same time, I know that I have to step back and, and, and be aware and be in the moment. And that creates even more stress. Like I'm not getting it. Like I'm doing it wrong. Uh, and I feel like a loser <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I'm not getting it. So how do I make it go away? Like this guilt of uh, you should know better. Oh, well, that's an additional question. That's an additional the, question. So yeah. the first one is, yeah. okay, let's deal with the first part. And the okay. first part is? The first part is that you believe that when you're in a state of acceptance, uh, you are no longer very effective, that you cannot act effectively anymore. Is that what you believe? Absolutely. Well, you know, that's not the case. That's a, a wrong view of what acceptance means. and. Uh, this is why we've been talking about bringing acceptance into what you are doing so that acceptance is not separate from doing. Acceptance, for it to be complete, true acceptance, needs to flow into the doing rather than take you away from the doing and say, okay, there's nothing I can do. In some cases, of course, there is nothing you can do in certain situations, in which case you simply accept it at this moment there's nothing I can do. There are other situations where you can do something, where doing actually the situation requires you, if you truly respond to the situation in the present moment, it requires you to take action, to do something. And yeah. then something for you to experiment with now, from now on, is to see if you bring, can bring this energy field of acceptance and act out of that so that the action doesn't come out of inner resistance or a neediness or denial or denial or anger it comes out of a more peaceful state and then you will experience how powerful your action can actually be yeah did you, did you get that tatiana that acceptance yes, flows into the doing i think everybody who uh <clears throat> is misunderstanding, is thinking that acceptance means that I'm saying this moment is okay and so I have to live with it and then do nothing with it or be passive. He's saying you must first, in, in one of the earlier classes, you use the example of the, of, the, of the bus in the mud. The wheels are in the mud. Yes, or you are, I'm stuck in the mud. Let's say I'm walking out somewhere and suddenly I'm stuck in the mud to my knees. You're stuck in the mud to your knees. Yeah. You must first accept that you're stuck in the mud to your knees. You can't curse the fact that you're stuck in the mud to your knees. You can't deny that you're stuck in the mud to your knees. You can't, the energy that you spend wanting not to be stuck in the mud to your knees is all wasted energy. And it gets you stuck more deeply. It gets you stuck more deeply. If you're struggling. You must accept and let the acceptance that you're stuck in the mud on your knees flow into now what do I do mm -hmm. to get myself out yes. of the mud. Yes, and this now what do I do is a state of alert attention. Yes. So you, it, and that's a high frequency. It's a state of, it comes up, okay, you, you almost listen. It's not, not an auditory listening, but I'm using the analogy of listening. It's a state of alert attention. What do I do now? And suddenly, 
okay, there's a moment of space you don't know. And then out of that, you do, the doing arises spontaneously or a thought comes into your head that tells you what to do. And that will be empowered. And that's you practice with little things first, perhaps. Practice with things that usually you don't like doing, so you bring a little bit of resistance to it. Even simple things, you might not like going to the supermarket or you might not like driving to work or whatever Accepting it is. Accepting what is. Accepting what is. That's what, what acceptance is. means. I accept what is in this moment and now we'll decide what do I do to change this moment. Yes. But I won't deny this moment for what it is or wish that it and was I something else. Guilty. Yeah. And you won't feel guilty, Tatiana. Oh. Yeah. No, no, yes, now can we come to the second part or the second question, which is your mind is telling you something that you are not good enough. Yes, like I'm doing it wrong. Yes. So there's nothing wrong. You're, you now know what to do and don't believe your mind when it tells you you can't do it. You are not good enough. These are things that often the mind will throw up, especially when people try to be present, uh, or to become, to be still, the mind will say, Don't, not now because I have too much on my mind. <laughs> I've got too much to think, I can't do it, not now, possibly not now, maybe yeah. tomorrow I'll try again. Yes, yes, <laughs> it happens to me all the time. <laughs> the mind will always tell you why you cannot be present now, because the mind doesn't like presence, because it's the end of the mind. <laughs> Tatiana and everybody at the Bodhi Tree, thank you so much. Nick, see what a powerful influence you've had for your, your worrying about your... Nick's worrying about his yeah. bill. Sharon's in the hotel room crying because Nick's worrying about his bill. <laughs> Unbelievable. Everybody at the Bodhi Tree, thank you so much for, for your thank gathering. You. Thank community. you. Thank you. Bodhi Buddies. Thank you, our Bodhi Buddies. Thank you so much, Tatiana. So do you think that in these 10 weeks we have evolved? I know somebody last week had a problem with the word evolution, <laughs> but do you think in these past weeks, this community, our new tribe of um, New Earth uh, readers, we've evolved to a higher level of consciousness, a new way of being in the world? Yes, I believe. To creating a new Earth? Yes, I believe for many people it's been uh, an opening so that this, suddenly this new dimension has come into their lives. And once it has come into your life, there's no going back. Uh, it can be obscured for a while if you mm -hmm. get identified with the mind again mm -hmm. or with the pain body. Because don't you have to work on it all the time? Uh, that helps. Even if you don't work on it, it's there. And eventually something will then happen in your life that will put you back in touch with it. Mm. It could be a crisis. But do I, my recommendation is not to wait for a crisis in your life that forces you to become present again, mm -hmm. but to choose presence as much as possible in your daily life, to choose the present moment, to always check inside what your relationship is with the present moment, the primordial question. What's my relationship with this moment? Is it friendly or is it dysfunctional? And that tells you everything. If it's dysfunctional, it means your future is going to manifest that. Mm -hmm. If it's friendly, open and accepting, then the so-called future is going to manifest that. It's as simple as that. Do you ever have problems, Eckhart? Do you have problems? No, I don't create problems. Mm -hmm. Challenges happen always. You don't get life will always challenge you in one way or another, mm -hmm. and that is good. Mm -hmm. But there's no need to transform the challenges of life into problems by dwelling on things mentally if you cannot take any action at this moment to turn things around in your mind, which is where worry comes in, mm -hmm. related to pro worry is problem making. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the mental problem making. So I don't have problems, for, not because there are no challenges in my life, because no matter what stage in life you reach, there's always some kind of challenge. Right. Life is designed in that way. Mm -hmm. The world is not here to make you conscious. Sorry, the world is not here to make you happy. Right. It's here to make, make you, you conscious. conscious. Yes. And when you bring consciousness into your life, for all of those who um, have been conflicted over the past weeks about their religious beliefs, when you bring consciousness into your life, what you're really saying is that you're bringing in allowing the spirit of that which is God to flow through you. 
and be the preeminent force in your life. Yes. Isn't that what you're saying? Yes, yes, yes. There's no longer the little me. Not the little me. Yeah. You are connecting yourself to the bigger sort, yes. to the source of all things. Yes, and let it then flow through you. And then this is, for example, where creativity comes into your life. It's all crea true creativity can only come in when you let that dimension into your life. So the source energy manifests through you. And creativity can start with a little thing like even a tiny creative thought or some new way of looking at something is already a sign of creativity. But most important, it's recognizing that when you can be conscious of the consciousness, when you bring the presence of that which is consciousness or the spirit of a higher power or the spirit of God into your life and you allow that to direct your path that then all things come to you as they should. Yes. Yeah. You, that's how you create the flow. Yes, that's yeah. the flow, entering the flow. Yeah. That, and that is how you say um, a new species is arising on the planet. It is arising now and we are it. Yes. Yes. This is such an enormous shift in consciousness that's happening it's almost this is why i use that expression it's almost as if we were transforming into a new species mm. for the first time a conscious species it's almost as if humanity was only now beginning to actually wake up yes but Mick, would you share with the rest of the audience at the end of this um just before we started this class uh, I had said a thank you to all the, the crews who made this possible and Oprah.com, all the Oprah.com staff who's worked so hard the past uh, 10 weeks and our book club staff and producers and everybody. Uh, we had a, a thank you to everybody. And Eckhart, because of my, my book <laughs> and the condition of my book, presented me with um, a leather-bound copy of A New Earth. Would you share with them what you wrote in uh, my book? I wrote a little... Uh the little poem that I also quote in chapter 10 by the Persian poet Hafiz, mm -hmm. um, which starts, um, I am a hole in the flute that the Christ's breath moves through. Listen to this music. That's the poem. I am a hole in the flute. I'm not the flute. I'm a hole in the flute that the Christ's breath, God's breath, moves through. Listen to this music. So I wrote this little poem and I said to Oprah, she was a wonderful hole. That energy is moving through her and the world is listening to this music. Thank you for allowing me to do that Thank uh, you. with this magnificent piece of work that you've given to us through your words. And obviously, you are the whole also yes. for which Christ's breath, the breath of God, the breath of all energy and creation flowed through you in order for you to write this. I mean, as I have read it over and over again now on my fourth reading I, I marvel at how you were able to put these sentences together in such a way that they connect to, have connected to me and to um, all of you all around the world. So yes. thank you for this experience. Thank you. And everybody else, of course, is also that in essence, you are the opening for that dimension to come into this world. That's right. And anything that we do that is creative or is successful or is good comes from that source flowing through us. Yes. It is not of our doing, no. but of the greater doing yes. of consciousness. So I want to thank you all for being a part of this really magnificent journey. It's been um, a part of what I know is my life's calling to be able to be the whole for all of this to flow through. So I especially want to thank you and uh, um, you and Kim for coming to Chicago these past 10 weeks, every single week to share a new earth with all of us. As I said earlier, I uh, really encourage all of you to let this be your summer rereading book. 
Um, and if you've enjoyed it, you should pass it on. There's no greater gift than sharing it. That's why I wanted to share it with you all. There's no greater gift than sharing it with somebody that you care about and having their lives also be awakened and transformed by the words that point you in the direction of the experience of awakening. So you can all begin to rewatch our webcast this summer. Uh, please join me next Monday, May 12th, for the start of my Soul Series webcast, because so many people said, what do we do now? Here on Oprah.com, I'll be talking to Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. She's the brain scientist who had a catastrophic stroke and experienced much of what we've been talking about in our new Earth webcast. Our Soul Series will continue throughout the summer with spiritual thinkers and authors from every walk of life. So I hope you'll keep Mondays reserved for Oprah.com. Tonight's class will be available on demand tomorrow for free here at Oprah.com. And if you want to download or watch any of our other classes, you can do that tomorrow at Oprah.com. And, of course, iTunes. It's free because of the generous support of Nature Made Soft Gel Vitamins. What are we going to do next Monday? <laughs> Another way of being able to continue to connect with the energy would be perhaps one is rereading this book, of course, so mm. not necessarily from the beginning, just opening it some All after the you've places read that it. you've outlined, yeah. Yes. And also, I, there are lots of, uh, I've done retreats and talks, so on my website, people can get talks or retreats, and just listening to a talk, a two or three hour talk, can get, put you back in touch with the, with the presence. That's right. And you can always download the webcast. Yes. Yes. And uh, we'll be back in the fall. There's no telling what we'll do. That's right. There's no telling. This is just the beginning. So thank you all. And again, as Gandhi said, let's all go out in the world and be the change we want to see. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sha yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs>